All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to see everybody. Um, I understand some people are um, going to be making their way home today. So um, just being mindful that there is some weather that is moving in. So there's a little bit of rain. If you're traveling north up on the 400 past Perry Sound, we got some freezing rain up there. So uh, please keep that in mind with your travel plans. You want to make sure everybody travels home to their families, to their homes safely. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, but we have another full agenda today, a lot of amazing presenters. Uh, we had a really awesome day uh, yesterday as well. So um, this is day three. We have day three, everybody, of our language and education forum, uh, hosted by the uh, education sector of the Chiefs of Ontario. So I hope everybody had a good evening last night. Everybody had some good eats, go to some restaurants. Yeah, a lot of people at Jack Astor's last night. Yeah, yeah. I, I went and uh, I typed into Google, Chano's best burger. Yeah, you know, you gotta, I don't know if it was the best burger, but I had a very good burger, yeah. Trip advisor maybe wasn't all the way there, you know. That's what I like to do though, when I come down to Toronto, coming from the res, coming up from up north and you know, you try to eat somewhere you haven't eaten, you know. Come all the way down to Toronto just to eat at Subway, yeah, yeah. And get me a Big Mac, yeah, yeah. Could get Big Macs back home. Yeah, so I like trying new, uh, new food. So it was awesome when I was coming down here as a young man. I, you know, seeing all the new different types of food. I didn't even know where to start, right? So it's nice to have a friend who is in Toronto or a family member uh, able to take me the tour. You know, show me the food, show me the ways. Yeah, yeah. I had a good visit though last night with a family member. I I had my sister, and so we got to go to to dinner and have. Uh, go for burgers so it's really nice when you get to travel and often you know our, our relatives are, are in city centers and um, they're attending education and things like that so it's really nice to to be able to meet up with family members and have that time visiting so all right so uh, we have a really good day today um, we're gonna have uh, uh, some presentations from our education uh, team our technicians through the Chiefs of Ontario uh, we have a keynote um, and then to end the morning, we're going to have breakout sessions. So I'll share a little bit about those breakout sessions later. So we have heard a few of the presenters, um, but uh, we'll have an opportunity to dive more deeper into some of the work that they do with uh, some of the presentations that they have uh, throughout the breakout sessions. Um, and that will bring us to lunch. Um, after lunch, we'll have a, a policy analyst from the Chiefs of Ontario uh, providing updates around post-secondary education. Um, post-secondary education was really important to me. Um, I attended, you know, uh, university and I'm, um, you know, a big advocate for, for education. So, and then, uh, you know, later on this, this afternoon, uh, we'll have more breakout sessions and another keynote. Uh, so we have a, a really great day, full day ahead of everybody. So, um, but what we do before we start formally is uh, we want to invite up our elder, Donna DeBossage, who's going to give us some opening remarks. So I'm um, trying to get everybody's attention. Um, and uh, let's give a good warm welcome. Let's give a good warm welcome to Donna. Show her the love, show her the love. All right. Uh -huh. Look at Donna. Miigwech. Bosho, bebidi kwe nge nindi go nishna be kwe nda o gi gondo de ma we. Shik nge 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 not magna. So my, uh, I've introduced myself in my spirit name, which is Berebdikwedang, which uh, translates to the sound of the little thunders that come before the big thunders. So I'm here to uh, give warnings. That's uh, my, <laughs> my, 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 uh, I guess, uh, you know, when they say uh, your name gives you purpose, well, that's been my purpose. So uh, with that, I also um, come from the Domnesing Rikwem Kong. I'm from a, a satellite community, their farming community, Kaboni. And that's where uh, I grew up with uh, my family. So with that, uh, I'll also, uh, because I'm part of the Nishnabek Nation, I'll do the opening that uh, we always do with the uh, Nishnabe. 
Devoyen, Noden Moin, Bokawin, Quaden this win, quick, quick, what soon, me no shock day win. Devin get the Kimin Gonad, we not doing anything, we know we not doing this thing. Come not in the Nagabish Rebuck, me no longer make a Shrebuck, me no gay ever one is Shrebuck. So for uh, those that uh, don't understand the uh, Nishnabe when uh, the Creator, we, we're giving thanks to the Creator for placing the Nishnabe on the on the earth along with the, the gift of spirituality that was given to all of us uh, here on Mother Earth that we were given the four elements to look after, that's the fire, the water, the, uh, the air, the earth and the wind. The Creator also gave us the seven grandfather teachings to guide us to, um, you know, to show us the way and to, uh, in our daily lives, in our community and, and with our own, uh, within our nation. So those are always there uh, foremost, uh, love, truth, respect, wisdom, humility, honesty, and bravery. The Creator gave us sovereignty to govern ourselves. This is, uh, you know, a God, God given, uh, Creator given um, um, gift that uh, we should always uh, uh, help us to, it's, it's a foundation part of our, of our lives. So we respect and honor the past, the present, and the future. And I'll also do a morning prayer. Uh, so um, she does a lot of really great work for our communities throughout the territory so we're very happy uh, to have Donna to open us up in a very good way um so uh, yeah, once again, um, okay. So uh, what we're gonna be doing is before we get started formally with our agenda, I'm gonna uh, invite up Julia. Um, and we have uh, um, something that we would like to share with everybody. We're gonna have a moment and I'll also invite up uh, Amos, if it, Amos can make his way up um, and I'll pass it over to them. Okay, good morning, everyone. And I'm sure many of you have heard this news already, but I would like to take uh, just a moment this morning to uh, let everyone know that, um, you know, I'm uh, <laughs> sorry, with a heavy heart and great sadness, I, I need to deliver some news to you. Uh, unfortunately, late on Tuesday this week, our dear and respected colleague and friend, Murray Miracle, passed away suddenly at his home. Uh, many of you uh, will have known Mary, Mary, Murray <laughs> over his decades of work with First Nation communities, mainly in education. And I am so proud to have known Murray and, and respected him as a colleague and a member of, and a, a member of our staff and uh, a trustworthy friend since, uh, since I met him in 2010. He was on the hiring committee when I was hired at the Chiefs of Ontario in 2010, um, and I was hired then as a policy analyst. At that time, Murray was the director of education at the Anishinaabek Nation, and he was an active member at the committees within the Chiefs of Ontario. My respect for Murray grew as I came to understand how much he valued his family, his culture, and his work. Murray actually tried to retire from working in education a few times, but his passion for this work caused him to resurface every time. When he retired as the education director for the Anishinaabeg Nation in 2017, to my surprise, he applied for a policy analyst position that we had posted at the Chiefs of Ontario. And of course, he blew all of the other candidates out of the water, and we hired him right away before he could change his mind. It felt kind of weird be having Murray report to me, but Murray made everything seem like it was meant to be, 
and he loved to joke and introduce himself as the junior policy analyst at the Chiefs of Ontario. And it never failed to get a laugh, just like it did now. Every time, even from us at the Chiefs of Ontario, we would always chuckle when he introduced himself as the junior policy analyst. It was truly a, pre a pleasure working with Murray in whatever situation presented itself. I learned a lot from Murray throughout the years, as I suspect many of you have learned a lot from him along the way. I'll treasure memories of Murray's mentorship, advice, kindness, and most of all, his friendship for the rest of my days. I'm sure you all have fond memories of Murray. Please feel free to share them with us throughout the day. And now I'd like to call upon Amos to honor Murray with a special song. Thank you, Julia. Stand up so brave. I hear and hold your hand here. I asked Murray Miracle. I got to work with him as well on a couple of committees on education and language way, way, way back when. will be waiting if he lost any children in his lifetime or any other his siblings or his parents will all be there when he's journeying down this path and they'll be striking up Ostoa Go which is one of our four ceremonies and he'll be dancing that his family will come to get him to go in and dance what a beautiful teaching that is and I'm hoping Murray is enjoying that right now with his people and his families. So I'm going to sing in, in this song from Songoya Diso. This song in its entirety was rendered when in the War of 1812. Our people, as you know, we didn't have an army or a militia, but the crown wanted us to ally with them to push back the Americans on the escarpment. So this is the last time that we sang this, these songs in its entirety. And one portion of it is the smoke dance is the end of that. And I don't know if you've gone to powwows and you've seen our people dance, that's the smoke dance, that's part of this. It's like a trilogy. So now we use it, I use this on these occasions because I, I love the fact that it came from the Creator and we honored our young men who went to fight and push back 
the Americans off the escarpment when we were, uh, when, as we are allies with the Crown to this day. So this song has a lot of meaning and power to us. So I'll just sing the, the part that it would start. So you can imagine all the women and children and the men that couldn't go with the young people who were going to go and join the crown, the British crown, to fight on the escarpment. And this is the songs that they sang for them to lift up their spirits. So in a way, we're going to be lifting up our spirits and giving us power to carry on. Uh, miigwech uh, Julia and Amos for uh, those words in that song. I think it's, uh, you know, really important that we acknowledge, you know, those Naki uh, Jik, those workers, Nigan uh, Jik, those leaders in this space, just like a lot of you are today. And so, Ngima uh, Ja, so as he uh, begins his journey, um, you know, we recognize the work that uh, Murray has done and we honor him. Um, I think that's, that's really important. Um, but also want to acknowledge everybody here, all the workers here, um, and the work that you do in your communities, for, for your communities, the organizations, the people that you work with. I'd um, just like to acknowledge that work and how important it is. And um, I'd like to also put that acknowledgement out to you as well. Uh -huh. Jimmy Gwich. Okay, so um, we are gonna be moving on with our agenda and we have our first keynote speaker of this morning. So it is my privilege to invite up a, a good friend I'm a colleague, someone who I've got to see in, in the space uh, doing really great work, um, a really great role model, uh, such a powerhouse, you know, within the Indigenous communities and uh, really um, on the forefront of a lot of the advocacy for Indigenous issues. 
um, and that is Riley Yesno. So Riley is a queer Anishinaabe scholar, a writer, a public intellectual um, from Ebetong First Nation, also known as Fort Hope, I believe. She is highly sought after for her words and analyst, um, was called a rising powerhouse uh, by the Toronto Star and has been a, a contributor and com commentator for some of the largest um, media outlets in Canada and the world. So some of them include New York Times, um, BBC World News, The Globe and Mail. So really awesome stuff, doing really great work um, throughout uh, in terms of advocacy for our communities. Um, and so Riley's gonna be giving a keynote here for everybody today, and that'll be on revolutionizing Canadian education for Indigenous peoples. So in this talk, um, they'll be talking about education in Ontario, across Canada, um, that has been neglected by government for several years, um, but as leaders too often, um, as they appear more concerned with the profit um, than, than progress. So, um, and what uh, impact has this neg neglect have on Indigenous students and communities? So. Um, what we can all do about it as well. So Riley's going to be sharing a little bit about this. So in this presentation, uh, Riley will uh, highlight some of the struggles and the solutions related to these questions and help guide us towards a revol revolutionized future for education. So everybody, let's give a good warm welcome and a round of applause for uh, Riley Yesno. So hopefully I pronounce your community properly. So Okay, all right. Okay. Okay. It's good to have you. Yeah, Quinn. Yeah. Um, now it's my turn to hype Quinn up. I know he's been your master of ceremonies for the past three or so days, and I have nothing but good things to say. We met at the Yellowhead Institute, um, and I figured out that he was working with Nimki Abshkong, and I was like, "That's my dream to go there and to do these things." I can't believe you live there. Um, so Quinn uh, is a huge inspiration to me, and so miigwech for that lovely, lovely introduction. Um, so today I was told um, when I um, signed on to be here that I was supposed to light a fire under you was my, was my goal at the end of this presentation. Um, and I think at the uh, news that we all just received as well, it's perfect because um, one of the things that I know Murray leaves us with is a job to do. Right, and it's a job that you need fire to be able to accomplish. Um, and so I hope it, it, it has more meaning now than I think it did you know, 10 minutes ago when I walked in the building. Um, and I hope you, you find that. So um, I'll also say that uh, the first time I met Murray, uh, I was working with Ta Tanya Talaga um, on a movie and we were interviewing Murray and um, you know, for all the work that he had done uh, in Thunder Bay uh, with the police boards and uh, investigating the racism in the Thunder Bay police. And I grew up in Thunder Bay. Um, I uh, knew many of the young people that had died in Thunder Bay and were part of what spawned this investigation. Um, and so I consider it an honor to have been able to um, meet with him, listen to his advice, and be able to thank him in person for the work that he did for my community tangibly. Um, and so I uh, am just sending my love out to everyone in the Sinclair family, and there's nowhere I would rather be today than I think in a room full of our people um, if we're going to have to share this together. So. With that said, um, I will get started. And I believe we have a slideshow. I don't know if it's ready to go. No? OK, missing some slides. <laughs> you know what I can do, though? Um, if you all give me one second, I have uh, a laptop. Could I give that to you? <laughs> me and, oh. And I see a USB. We're doing this on the fly, folks. So while this um, presentation is getting queued up, um, also, because I've seen a lot more people here today too, um, there's also a reminder of a bag that was went missing yesterday that was mis misplaced. Um, so someone grabbed someone else's Juice of Ontario swag bag, those real nice black ones that we got. 
So um, someone grab one that's not theirs. So um, if you can have a look inside the bags and if there's a name on there that's not yours, chances are it's not. <laughs> so, I mean, if it is, you know, like I said, you're not going to get in trouble or nothing. But we're just going to ask if you can bring that over to the registration desk. That would be greatly appreciated um, as well. There was um, some questions about things that were left behind last night. So it is the hotel staff that would round everything up. So um, we'll, we'll get in touch with the hotel staff just to make sure that if anything was left behind that, um, you know, hopefully it was found and then we can uh, give it back to you. Okay, so um, just also keeping in mind another reminder about the weather as well. So, um, you know, check the weather network if you're traveling, if you're staying till tomorrow, that's great. Um, but we just wanna make sure you get home safely, uh, back to your home, back to your communities, your families. Um, yeah, so I do understand some people are going to be leaving around lunchtime. Um, so if you do, uh, make sure you, you travel safely. Um, that just means you're not going to be here for the door prizes. I know. I don't know who was all around, stuck around last night to get the door prizes. We were like, one ticket, two ticket, three, four tickets, right? Everybody's like, this is my chance, you know? Yeah. Sometimes when you're waiting and... Uh, you know, my ticket wasn't drawn and you're all bummed out and then your ticket actually gets drawn. Maybe it was your good friend who wasn't there or something like that. Yeah. All right, we're emailed, thank you. We're good to go? So okay, faster. all right, all right. All right, everybody, so we're good to go. So let's uh, have everybody's attention and we'll continue on. Awesome. And uh, I was, so while that's getting queued up, I also want to correct myself and let know that I was under the impression that it was Marie Sinclair and my, like, heart had dropped into my stomach. It's a different Murray, and I'm still feeling so much for um, everybody in this room who I can tell had such beautiful relationships with Murray Miracle. Um, but I wanted to apologize before I, I confused anybody. Um, I'm ha I was like sweating <laughs> in the back, so I apologize for that. Um, but I still believe that there is a job to do. I still believe that there is a fire to be tended to. Um, so the message I think remains the same no matter what and also speaks to the number of champions that we have in our communities and our nations who are taking up this work. So uh, with that said, oh, still waiting. Well, good thing is, is that I have this memorized slightly. <laughs> so I wished I could have some visuals for you to, to go along. We'll have to skip a couple slits ahead. But the first thing that I wanted to do in any case um, in the presentation was to introduce myself um, and talk a little bit about my journey with education. Um, so uh, as Quinn mentioned off the top here, I um, was really young when I lived in Abmatung First Nation also known as Fort Hope. And so the first school that I ever attended was an on-reserve school. Um, and I don't know if anyone here can remember their years in kindergarten, but I, I, don't, I certainly can. And I don't know if that's an abnormal thing or <laughs> if everybody else can remember it too, but I think the reason why I do, and when I think about what exactly I remember about those young years, um, I remember all of us sitting in a circle, learning the days in the week Anishinaabe Moen, um, learning how to introduce ourselves. And so uh, it was this knowledge, not only of like, you know, learning uh, very basic skills, but also connecting to language, um, being with people in the community, my friends. Um, and soon after that time, my mom and my siblings and I moved to Thunder Bay and I was put in the public education system, the Ontario public education system. and. I noticed all of that vanished, right? And so um, I went through the system. I uh, tried really, really hard to get good grades. My mom's also a teacher. Um, and so education was something that was really uh, of the utmost importance in our school. There was no skipping class for me. <laughs> she was also actually a teacher at the high school that I went to. So there was extra no skipping class for me. <laughs> and so while um, I was there, I worked really hard. I um, graduated as the valedictorian of my class. I got a president scholarship to U of T where I graduated in indigenous studies and political science. Um, and then I actually recently was able to skip my master's and go right into my PhD in political science. Um, and so, oh, thank you. 
<laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, and where I'm studying um, indigenous social movements and the role of especially young people. Oh, and look, there it is. Um, the role of young people in social movements. And so um, this is all to say that I've been in an educational institution my entire life. <laughs> On paper, it looks like I know um, quite a success story. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that has happened the more I spend time in education is the more critical I become of it. And so at this point, my philosophy is such that I think that education is supposed to prepare us to do two things. One is yes, very practically, it's supposed to prepare us for the world that we live in, for entering the workforce, for all of those types of things. But more than that, I think it's also supposed to empower students to see that they can make different types of worlds. Um, and I will talk a little bit about today how I don't think we're doing very well on either of those fronts. I think that we know that Indigenous people have some of the most dire statistics in the province and indeed the country when it comes to educational attainment, though they are slowly increasing or improving. And I also realized in about um, my last years of high school that I hadn't felt empowered um, to make a different world, to do something other than what I thought I was supposed to do. I thought I was supposed to get high grades, go to university and do all these things um, since I was in kindergarten and speaking the language and, and doing things in my community. Um, and so that is uh, where I want to bring us to. I'm going to talk a little bit, yes, about the failures, yes, what we're already doing well, but more than that, I want to envision us to go further. You know that saying that's like, um, if you uh, shoot, for the, uh, shoot for the moon, even if you fail, you'll end up amongst the stars. <laughs> kind of cheesy, but also I think is, is what we're trying to do here, right? So often, I think we're forced to, to fight for and have long had to fight for the very bare minimum of what we deserve and what we are entitled to. And so the further we demand, the farther that each step will take us, I believe. So, this is kind of the plan I already laid out for you today. If we have no objections, I introduce myself, introducing the space. I wanna look at the state of education. What does the TRC say? Um, talk a little bit about decolonization and how we can each, no matter if you are in a direct leadership position in your community, whether you are a parent of a child in the education system or whether you are just a member of a community who is deeply concerned about education in this province and in this country, um, what you need to be, what you should be doing. So where are we? So the state of education, like I mentioned off the top, is a bit of a dire one. And I think that this has made especially uh, clear since the onset of the pandemic, where governments uh, had to transition learning to remote, where um, they were scrambling to get money together, and huge, huge cuts were made to education during this time. We saw, perhaps folks will remember the um, a student aid strike that happened just a few months ago because of the way that staff were improperly paid. Um, and also folks might remember that at the onset of the Ford government's first term, uh, one of the very first things that they did when they got into office was to scrap the Indigenous education curriculum. The Indigenous education curriculum, which had already been created and drafted, they had to spend no money to make it, um, and yet they still wouldn't implement it. And so we see this direct hostility to, to our nations, to our students, to our children, and we see the impacts of that. We are still the furthest behind. Indigenous students still have the highest dropout rates and failure rates are unacceptably high. Um, this is true both on reserve and off reserve. At all levels, Indigenous people have uh, the lowest level of graduation rates from universities as well. PhDs uh, make up Indigenous PhDs make up less than 1% of all people achieving that level of higher education in this country. Um, so there is so, so much to do, right? And in saying this, though, I don't want to um, discredit the continuous work that, that people have been doing, right? So here are just three headlines I could find that are recent about 
incredible things happening in education. So for example, in the Yukon, they created this year their first ever First Nations only school board. Um, and so they, with that, created their own curriculum. They brought in indigenous educators. They were able to do their own evaluations and they're revolutionizing what education can look like in the territory. Just recently, this is from you know four days ago, Toronto school boards, um, the TDSB and the York school board um, adopted a mandatory indigenous education in grade 11. So instead of reading Shakespeare, uh, they will be reading Tanya Talaga, they will be reading Alicia Elliott. Um, and that was the actually the work speaking of, and I have to highlight this because of my work with, the, with indigenous youth, that was the uh, student trustee um, who put that motion forward and made it past the school board. One young person who did the work of making sure that all of the students in the school board, the biggest in Canada, will get that education. Um, also, indigenous leaders are um, Indigenous leaders are hopeful that this uh, new anti-racism training in BC is going to help combat students' experiences in the classroom. These are all really good things. One of the things to note, though, about this, right, is that the Yukon School Board, for example, that was spearheaded by members of the community who, um, you know, put, petitioned for this, put in the infrastructure and the work. The Toronto District School Board, again, like I said, that was one student who did that. Um, this was also pushed for by Indigenous leaders and Black coalitions in BC to get the anti-racism training. Notice that none of, in none of those cases did the government say, oh, we see the need for this and we're going to just do it, you know? It took incredible, incredible advocacy and effort from people on the ground to be able to make that happen. And so this is incredible work. This is incredible co-conspiring of those non-Indigenous people who also helped to make that happen. But why is it such an uphill battle, right? Why is our government not asking us what we need and then with the resources and the capacity that they have doing it? So let's talk a little bit about the TRC. We know that the TRC was meant to respond to the legacy of residential schools, and with it, it created recommendations, 94 calls to action, I should say, for all sectors of society, including education. So there are 12 calls to action related to reconciliation, number 6 to 12 and number 62 to 66. Zero of these have been completed. Also, of all of the calls to action, only 13 to date have been completed. At this rate, it's looking to be completed around 2070 some, 2080 some, at which time we can expect that, you know, all of the survivors of the school will likely have left us. Um, and they will not see the legacy that they pushed for in the TRC come to fruition. But I wanna ask, you know, what future exactly, what, what's the substance behind those 12 calls to action and all of the 94? What was the TRC trying to lead us to and why? So this is, these quotes are direct language from the calls to action. The TRC sought to eliminate gaps within one generation, certainly not to 2070 or 2080. They wanted to eradicate funding discrepancies and improve educational attainment. What do you notice about that, right? That's not very radical. <laughs> That's the bare minimum that we get equal funding, equal educational outcomes. We're not asking um, even for a revolution <laughs> in education here. We're just asking for um, the same thing other people are. Um, so we're, again, we're, we're not even shooting for the moon here. We're not even really leaving the atmosphere. And yet, it's still being overarchingly failed, and we're not being delivered these things. So long as we have to fight to even get here, how can we possibly focus our energy and fully devote it to transforming, radically transforming education? This thing achieves, getting to the TRC's future is good. I, I want to make that clear, that we need to be doing that. But again, that that is not the end goal, but only the very first step that we are trudging towards. And so I, I think that getting there achieves the first thing, right? It prepares us for this world. If we were to have equal educational outcomes, um, and also Canada isn't even in the top of the world in terms of educational outcomes, so getting to the equivalent of, of non-Indigenous Canadians doesn't even set us up for the greatest success we could think of in this world. But 
Um, getting there might make us more equivalent when it comes to, yeah, levels of attainment, going into the job market, being equipped for those future things. It doesn't, it doesn't radically transform education, though. And that's where we'll need a different approach. So I'm arguing to you that we can and we must go further than even the TRC claimed. We are also, I'm going to say, the best equipped to do it. And again, uh, I think it is the obligation of all of us to see the benchmark, the TRC, let for us fight for that as our elders, our survivors did. And then especially, I think this is as a young person, is that this part is especially my job, you know? <laughs> and it's the job of my cohort to get us there with, of course, the help and the allyship of older generations. It's not about negating the work that they did, but building on it. So do we recognize these things? Um, one, uh, one of the things that is really trendy right now in the most progressive schools you can find is this, um, is this outdoor education push. And indigenous people are like, yeah, <laughs> land-based learning. <laughs> We've been saying that, you know, forever. Um, another thing that, you know, there's more and more educational studies coming out and saying is like, we have to stop standardized testing young people and instead see what their individual gifts are and honing those and supporting them in those instead of trying to make them all fit into this benchmark of, of standardization, um, looking at different students' needs. This is something we also know, is that we know in our communities people have different roles, that from a young age we recognize those roles and we try and empower them and encourage them to, to dig deeper into them. That is not something that the education system largely is equipped to do. The next thing is community education. More than one single teacher in a room full of 30 students expected to teach like, you know, 10 different subjects to people, that we have, Elders come in and aunties come in and people with different expertise and they meet people in the community who aren't even necessarily there to specifically talk to them and educate them, but to tell stories and to do, um, to just make relationships and that there's incredible learning that can come from that as well. It's community education. So again, this is like, you know, Ontario and the rest of Canada are coming to the realization that they're like, oh wow, these are the best things for our students. And I can't help but just like want to throw a bit of a, a fit, you know, like what? <laughs> you never listened until until now, right? And so they, the thing that gets me the most is when I read these studies about um, the, the best things we could be doing in education, it's not credited to us. It's credited to Dewey and Rousseau and Montessori and all of these, you know, white male intellectuals um, from Europe. And so how is it that we originate the most progressive forms of education available to students and we are excluded from the access to it? Decolonization, I will argue here, you know, does not come from inside a colonial system. It's not about trying to morph the education system uh, to fit our needs. It's taking the knowledge we already have and we already know, implementing it where it can be implemented, and then also creating a whole separate table if we need to. It's not asking for a seat at the table. I put this quote here, I love it. Um, it's not asking for a seat at the table. It comes from getting rid of the table and building something altogether new. Education doesn't have to mean education as we know it. Um, I also saw somebody on Twitter say, and I thought that this was good, is that not only do we get rid of the table, we chop it up and we turn it into kindling for the community fire. And <laughs> that is more of the goal. <laughs> so just to keep in mind, so what could those futures look like that I'm talking about here? So do folks know, um, indigenous futurism. It's kind of like this burgeoning, uh, it's been mostly confined, I think, to like academic and artist spaces, but I think it's slowly going out. So if you, it started from Afrofuturism. So if you know like Black Panther Wakanda, um, that's Afrofuturism, right? And so indigenous people are now um, putting together indigenous futurism. So if you've read The Marrow Thieves, for example, that's often an example of indigenous futurism. And Erica Violet Lee has this beautiful quote where she says, indigenous futurism is the practice, and I've highlighted practice here, 
of imagining all that could have been if it were not for the interruption of colonialism. And so I really love this quote because, first of all, the word interruption tells us that there, we recognize that yes, there was a way of life before colonization, but there is also our life after colonization. It demands of us to vision the end of colonization, right? Um, and building something new on top of it. And also saying that that's a practice, that it's not just a hope or a dream or something that, you know, one day maybe we'll get there, but it's something we actively build. And so uh, also this photo here, um, I'll point your attention to, uh, because this is from uh, an exhibit that was done at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. You might recognize that is Toronto City Hall there. And it's looking kind of, um, you know, some might say decrepit or overrun or all these things, but it was an indigenous artist who created um, this like virtual reality, put in on the goggles sort of exhibit where you'd go and you would um, look at this and you know people in the community were like freaking out they were like this is horrible like there's there's you know it, nothing is clean <laughs> these types of things and the lesson for people here is supposed to be is that you just aren't equipped to see all of the life that is here in this picture look at the way nature has taken back the land look at all of the ecosystems that are here in this place just because you don't have the capacity to see it right now doesn't mean that this different future is a bad one, is one that we should try and avoid, is any of those things. And so I just, I really love this, this piece of art installation and think it's really inspiring when talking about indigenous futurism. So, and there's the cover of Sherry Demoline's Different Worlds. So, and this is one thing I, I want to counter when we're also envisioning um, radical futures for be it education, be it justice, be it health, um, is that there's this stereotype that we are often pegged into, which is that like we are a people stuck in the past, that we're desperately trying to get back to a pre-colonial time and um, that that's impossible and so that's why we shouldn't be taken seriously. I can't tell you how many times I've heard some version of that at you know a conference from you know some white guy who doesn't like what I'm saying, right? Um, but what this fails to appreciate is that indigenous people are the most adaptable people out there, that we have faced apocalypse time and time again and still persevered, that we have taken every new world thrown at us and we still manage to find ways to maintain, to hold on to our knowledge systems, to hold on to our languages. We can adapt like nobody's business. And so, we also have the ability not just to adapt and hope that one day we'll go back, but we take everything that is given to us and we make it more. And so, for example, um, I don't know if folks know the artist uh, Jeremy Dutcher. Um, so beautiful, beautiful opera singer. And uh, he talked about this um, as the practice of making more in the way indigenous people do this all the time and we don't even sometimes notice it, but is that opera, he felt very conflicted about for some time, right? Because like that is the one of the most, I think colonial forms of music you can think of, right? <laughs> it comes from like deep in Europe and a long time ago. But what he, he did is he took that medium that, that was given to him by colonization, given to all of us by colonization. He sings in Wolostoke, which is an endangered language and so he infuses it with his indigenous practices his indigenous worldview and he makes opera sing singing something that you know opera singers of the 17th century never thought it could be it's something about language revitalization now it's something that um, is heard by millions of people all over the world brought opera to whole new audiences brought well to whole new audiences and ears um, and so we're making it more than you know colonials even thought their own things could be, right? Um, brilliance is the birthright. That brilliance is the birthright of every indigenous young person in this province and in this country. And adaptability as well as tradition is our strength. This is not me saying either that we should be looking for ways to like take whatever they give us and just do something with it. That we can also lean into our tradition and into practices. That we have everything we need. We know it is rarely given willingly or at scales necessary. Once again, it took you know so much years of fighting to get the TRC, to get that Yukon School Board, to get uh, indigenous education back into the classrooms. 
But all that progress and labor is because we demanded it and we didn't stop demanding it. So how do we keep doing this and how do we do it maybe even, even more? So we have to remind ourselves sometimes that it is our right to proper education on our terms. It is our ex it should, it's our expectation. Um, one story I always tell because it was really, um, you know, eye-opening for me in my journey was that uh, it was a couple years back, I was in Ottawa, and uh, they had asked me to come and speak about what my dream was for Indigenous youth to all of the federal ministers. And so I was like very nervous <laughs> and I was trying to create a list of all these things, you know, I was like, okay, well, we need, we need proper infrastructure and uh, there's still like boil water advisories and this many communities and we need this and this and this and this. And then I took a step back and I looked and I realized that I had made a list as if the federal government was Santa Claus. And, you know, if I just asked nice enough, maybe I would get the things that were already every other student's expectations. And so I thought about it and I was like, is that really my dream for Indigenous youth? Clean water? Basic education? That's not my dream. My dream is something much, much more. And I had to remind myself that one of the most sinister things colonialism, uh, colonization does is that it puts a box around our expectations of what is possible um, and it's a constant battle to remind ourselves that we can and will step outside that box um, even the best of us so it's it's a it's a reminder the other thing to remind ourselves is that we are not fighting alone that there is work being done in every classroom in every corner of the country and it's our job to organize together um, it's not our job to make sure that everybody gets up and does something. I promise you, people are doing it already. It's just a matter of finding your, your coalitions. And the other thing, and as a political scientist, this is like my least favorite move that Canadian governments do, is that, you know, a new government will come into power, maybe they will invest bare minimum money that, uh, you know, there is like not enough to do anything to revolutionize education, but they're like, uh, it's more than the last guys did. <laughs> like, how many times is that their thing, right? And I'm like, I am not here to, uh, to celebrate the bottom of the barrel, to celebrate you being worse than the other guys. I celebrate true victories for students and for children. And so until you deliver that, I don't have to award you, you know, for that work. And I think that that's something uh, to remember as well, because it's like in the playbook of every politician that comes in. So actionably, what can we do with these reminders? If you have students um, from your communities, from your families and provincial schools, we show up to those board meetings and we advocate the way that you can expect at every, for example, Toronto District School Board meeting in that auditorium, it is filled with parents of students, with uh, advocacy groups and lobbyist groups and we show up too and we need to show up more and hard every single time. We organize with other communities and education advocates to build our collective strength. Remembering we're not doing this alone. That thinking that we are is also part of the thing that colonization likes to do is pretend that we're so separate um, and that uh, the government is the insurmountable power. Um, but we have people power, again, like nobody's business. Another thing to think about is when governments are seeking re-election, we let them and we let other voters know that inaction on education will not be tolerated. When Doug Ford again first came into power and took out the Ontario education curriculum, Indigenous education curriculum, I, I, I tweeted that, you know, how can you say now that a vote for Doug Ford wasn't a vote against reconciliation, wasn't a vote against um, education for Indigenous students? And uh, there were a, a surprising amount of people who said, well, I never really thought about that. You know, I thought that it was uh, for business and for, you know, whatever, I hated Kathleen Wynne, <laughs> whatever the rationale was. And I'm like, the fact that you don't even consider our, our needs and our rights is a privilege unto itself. And that allyship is an active practice, which sometimes means that you put aside what your own preconceived notions of what's best for you for the best of others. 
And that's what also we have to do and encourage people to do. Um, and the last thing I want to emphasize is that we teach every coming generation to believe that radical transformative change is truly possible, that they don't have to settle for those bare minimum scraps. Um, when I uh, was going to school in Thunder Bay, um, one of the things that I always look back on as one of my biggest regrets in education is that um, unlike many schools uh, in Thunder Bay, we had Anishinaabe Moen as uh, a course I could take for my language credit. And you know, I went to my guidance counselor and said I was thinking of enrolling in this. It's a language my grandparents speak. I'd love to be able to speak to them in it. Um, and they said, that's good, Riley. But you have to think about French will probably get you further in this world than Nishinaabe Moen will, um, was one of the things they said to me. And as much as that stings, I can see how also we have to remember that it, education doesn't exist in a silo because in a way that she's right, you know, that because I will go and try and apply for a jobs that don't recognize Nishinaabe Moen as a credential in the way that they do French. So it's not just about transforming the education sector. In order to, to do that, we have to make, for example, indigenous languages national languages so they can be funded and valorized in the same way that French has for all these years. That we can go and make workplaces recognize indigenous knowledge as equal, legitimate, and more legitimate knowledge. Um, it's, it's one project to do this specifically in education, but it's a broader project as a whole. It's a broader decolonization. And so those are my suggestions to you, and I hope that I succeeded in being able to light a little bit of that fire that I told you I was sent here to do in the beginning. <laughs> so um, if there's any questions or if anybody wanted to talk more about this, I, I totally welcome any uh, stuff for q and A. I'm not sure how much time we have left. About 10 minutes? Okay, so we have about 10 minutes also for question and answer, but once again, miigwech for being here with me this morning. Um, I always cherish an opportunity to be in a room full of other Native folks. <laughs> I find it doesn't happen as much in Toronto as it did when I was living up in Thunder Bay, so um, I really, really, truly value it. Um, and thank you for listening to me. All right, so we do have some time for some questions, some Q&A, so we have a mic for, so we're going to ask everybody to please line up questions at uh, one of the four mics. Oh. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, good morning. Yeah, my name is Ernie Sandy, and I was wondering, um, I know the uh, uh, Brown versus Brown in the States back in 1954, that's exactly what uh, happened, what we're struggling with now separate but uh, separate but equal education which actually it's not i just wonder if you can give us a reader digest of the plessy versus plessy in terms of 18 1896 i think it was uh, and just to give us a overview of the parallel in the struggle that we have of the uh trying to acquire uh, quality education you know where there's uh, roadblocks all the way through and that um, they say separate uh, but, but you know equal education but it's it's not okay I want to give us a reader's digest of that case, Brown versus Brown. Oh, were you offering to give a, a reader's digest? <laughs> I don't know. That I, know the yeah. I invite you to. It's it's an open invitation. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, I so let me. I'm sorry. I also don't think I heard a hundred percent of what you were asking. But oh. um, was it? It's to give a parallel of um, a a, a different time. Yeah, to the now. struggle. Yeah of a struggle from then to now. Um, so I think you might have mentioned a specific case that I'm not as familiar with, but like one of the things that I often think about, again, drawing on my experience of, of, of living in Thunder Bay, right, and this is something that people probably know about, yeah. um, is that like uh, a lot of people will say, and I think rightly so, that the situation happening in Thunder Bay is, is the continuation of the residential school system, right? And that being, you know, if residential schools were about taking children out of their communities and out of their homes so that they could access an education, if we want to call it that, um, that that's exactly what's happening to young people in Thunder Bay today, right? That um, if you're from any of the northern Treaty 9, Treaty 3 communities, you have to leave your home at 13 years old to go to Thunder Bay so that you can get a high school education because they're largely not available on reserve. 
And we see the impact of that in the deaths of, I think it's up to 13 youth in Thunder Bay now from these communities. And so um, how can we say that that is not just a transformed version of what residential schools were, right? Um, and so uh, although on paper they might say these struggles have ended, I guess maybe to your point, um, is that we look at the actual conditions that indigenous people are living with and students are going through and we see that they can say that it's ended all it wants, but that's not the case. Um, and so, uh, again, I'm not sure if that's to the specific case you were talking about, but I think uh, yeah, it's at the, the heart. The, yeah, the case I was talking about is that Brown versus Brown in okay. 1954. I'm not familiar, but you're oh, welcome I, yeah, to. I'll, 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 I'll come and show you at your. At your at yeah, the yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, how? So we have uh, mic number two and then mic number three. Oh, my much. Um, thank you very much for, for what you said today. Uh, my name is Andrew McConnell, and I'm the coordinator for uh, First Nation Métis New Education for the York Region District School Board. Um, and I'm going to go back to what you brought up about what Toronto has just done, mm. uh, which is finally vote for that. Um, and it's interesting, right, because we started this work in 2019, um, and we started converting all of our grade 11 courses over to what we all affectionately call the NBE credit uh, because it's a ministry course and they have to put three letters in front that mean absolutely nothing <laughs> with what you're learning. Um, but the one thing I have to say is that, and this is going to go back to what Jesse brought up yesterday, mm. that just because you get in a door or a door opens, it doesn't mean you're done. Mm. Um, because as much as we started the work in 2019 and we're finally getting to a final point of having all credits, all grade 11 credits by next year will be sorry, grade 11 English credits will be this credit. Um, there's still mountains of work. Um, I have staff that have spent the last two years trying to train English teachers mm -hmm. who all went to the same school systems as us and know virtually nothing about us. Um, and even go to the lengths in some cases of referring to our works, if they teach from our works as being less rigorous. Mm -hmm. We even had a family complain and say that we should be teaching a proper English dialect, which again I find interesting is because they were all written here, they're all published in English and therefore it's our dialect. Um, but it is that point of what you bring up is that as much as it feels like we've gotten somewhere, there are mountains and mountains and mountains and mountains of work to do. So again, I would say to folks, exactly as you said, your advocacy from the outside coming into those trustee meetings it helps us, for those of us who are in the system, because I'll tell you, it's not governments who make change, it's us. And so anybody who comes in anywhere along the way with an email, a phone call, um, even a nice conversation to a principal in a hallway or supporting a teacher who took on work because they really don't know how to deal with the racism, they've never experienced it, and when they actually get caught between those people who don't like us, and us, they don't know how to react and they shut down. Um, so when you come forward and you speak up in those spaces, it will make change. Because like I said, it's not government, it's going to be us. So how miigwech for what you brought today and um, I just wanted to add those pieces in. Oh. Yeah, miigwech. That's really apt advice and I hear you. I, um, I think one of the things that I find is so, you know, funny is about this supposed age of, of reconciliation has like, have you ever asked, you know, an average Canadian if they've actually read the TRC, even the 94 calls to action? The answer is largely no, right? And because of that, like the problem that comes from that is that they don't realize that, for example, one of the calls to action for education is that um, all teachers Indigenous and non-Indigenous are supposed to have all of the supports they need in place if they don't know how to respond to racism, if they don't know how to teach the curriculum, that they are supposed to have access to those services and those resources. And so there's a call to action in the TRC specifically also for non-Indigenous educators. And they have no idea. And they think that the TRC is this Indigenous document for us only, it's our issues that they can choose to care about or not, when in fact, like, it was for everyone, and it was in, specifically, explicitly for them. Um, and so, uh, 
implicating, I find also people in that advocacy and saying, you know, you, as long as this is denied, you are also being denied um, what is supposed to be your right as well, um, has been very activating for people. But you're totally right that it, it takes, like, it's not something they come into uh, uh, naturally or um, I think inherently. It's something that we always do the work to, to make them, to bring them to that place. So miigwech for that reminder. How mic number three? Uh -huh. I was going to get a few things here. You know, assimilation has taught us only one phase and one vision of a life where our people have always carried a lot of things that are out there that we're trying to be taught of just in a different manner. Like we, we believed in a balanced system Nobody was superior or inferior to another person. And as far as degrees go, we have four more, we have qualified psychiatrists, psychologists in our groups. They just don't have that degree that's required. And it's the same thing with the language. I've advocated for, for our native people here in Toronto for, for the last 10 years. I grew up here from 75 to 95, and I, what I seen was unacceptable, like the racism, discrimination, prejudice everywhere in the Justice Department. Every phase of life, there was discrimination. And it was until I moved home in 95, and I worked for the man for 18 years, and I came back here 10 years ago in Toronto. I just moved back home again um, in July. And uh, I thought, I'm going to take action this time. So I visited every school there was in Toronto area, at least the ones that I, I tried to visit everyone. I now sit on the TDSP when it comes to Native issues, and uh, I hired the First Nations uh, language instructors at our First Nations school on Donalands and Lower. And uh, I continually advocate for our people all the time. There's a school up on uh, Parkdale that I renamed under, uh, I named it Kina Nagok, which means all are growing well. It's a metaphor that I use to explain like, as if it was a garden. If you, if you put love into your garden, if you work on it really hard, you will yield good crop. And it's the same thing in the school. If you treat your children good, if you teach them from your heart, they are going to pick up and they are going to learn. So that name was changed there and I was honored for it. And, uh, and I do the same thing with the city of Toronto. I sit on the city advisory committee under native issues now. And uh, I'm the one that brought that clean burning to High Park for the first time ever. And uh, I'm just trying to get these people to see our, our version of the world. It's often looked at in one way and it's it's not right. We and all this work that we're doing here, it's not for us. It's our it's our children, our grandchildren that we have to think about. I now have a newborn granddaughter, three months old, and my God it terrifies me to see the future of my granddaughter. I I'm already looking into you know making her extremely fluent this is going to be a project i'm going to take on teach this daughter to be the next extremely fluent speaker so there's a lot of many things a lot of little things that we can do to help each other collaborate do not think we're all the same people all the international like across north north america we're natives of north america we're not just Canadians here. That border never existed among our people. I use that to the full extent all the time. Under the J Treaty, we're not even supposed to be harassed or asked questions at the border. So, you know, I, I have a good time trying to enforce these when, when I'm caught in a situation. And the police around here in Toronto, I never trust because I've seen so much prejudice. I've seen friends going to jail for things they didn't commit. Donald Marshall was a good example of that, a Mi'kmaq back in the day. 
that spent 12 years in, in, in prison for a murder he never committed. They found out 12 years later that he never committed the murder. murder. Somebody turned himself in. And he was awarded 1.8 million. They already ruined his life. He went back on the streets and he drank that money and he gave it to the homeless. And he died from that 1.8 million. They totally ruined his life in that prison. These are the kind of things we have to think of. And these are the kind of things that make me strong to fight even harder. I edu educated myself really well because I've been so badly traumatized all my life through so many different phases. And I've educated myself to challenge these people. Arrogance doesn't mean anything to me. I, I now have many uh, professors as friends due to the fact I don't look at myself as inferior when I meet them. So walk with pride when you're in Ashnabek. Yeah. <laughs> yes, miigwech. Thank you so much. You also give me a good reminder um, about being careful about the um, the language that we set and the goals that we set for young people of this idea that degrees or like positions are like the thing that we could achieve. Um, and when you bring up that, you know, there are psychiatrists and experts in our communities that just aren't recognized with a piece of paper, but that doesn't take away their expertise. It, it really hits home. I don't know how many times in like my young life people would say, oh, you're going to be the prime minister one day, as if like that was the biggest thing I could ever, you know, hope to achieve and not I you will be um, you will be important in your community or you'll be somebody who will do um, uh, who will learn your language. Those are not set goals to the same extent. And I think that's an internalization of like a colonial vision of what success is. Right. Um, and so that's a, a, an important reminder for me, especially. So thank you. Miigwech. Um, no. How much time are we working with MC? We, yeah. So we have one more question on the floor. Then I have one question from online. Okay, sounds right, good. So, so this will be the last question we'll take from the floor and then we'll have one question. So mic number two. I just wanted to acknowledge that you said that the, um, the residential school system is still going. I grew up in Sulacout as well as Thunder Bay and I'm from Obish Kokang in Treaty 3, Lac Sul. Um, I had a lot of family members that still work at the school, uh, Pelican Falls First Nation High School. Mm -hmm. The residential school system is still alive. They're still there. They use the old residential school building to house these students. And I grew up with them and I spent a lot of time in my high school years. I went to Sioux North High School in Queen Elizabeth District High School. And I spent most of my evenings out at Pelican Falls First Nations High School because, you know, they, if you ask any of their students, they would say it's like a jail. It's it's a prison. They're stuck there. They're isolated from Sulakout. They're isolated from the communities. They have to fly home. They have, they have to fly down. They're stuck in these houses with 12 other students in the house and uh, like a counselor. And it's so heartbreaking that these students have to live in that school, in that old school. And I've been in that building in the basement. There's still those old hooks from when the, the coat hangers were there. My cookum went to that school. My family went to that school. And up until last year, the steps to the old school were still there. And they were just in the field because they, told, they tore down the big school. But the other little part of the school, they kept up for housing. That needs to stop. We need to bring these students home. We need education in our communities. We can't just bring, force them out. They're so disconnected from their land and people and culture, and they're stuck there. I'm sorry. I didn't have much else to say other than thank you for the work that you're doing. Miigwech. Miigwech. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Uh how -huh. uh, Chimigwech, um, Kieran, for, for those words, uh, very important words and uh, important reminders as well.
Um, so we do have one question from online, so, um, and that is Indigenous First Nations post-secondary students are currently studying in underfunded Indigenous institutes in Ontario. Mm. So what is your suggestion on how to mobilize those students to assist in seeking equity for Indigenous institutions? Mm. Great question. So I believe that there are six, perhaps, Indigenous institutes um, in Ontario, post-secondary institutes that, yes, um, I was just reading a report in preparation for this about like how egregiously underfunded um, they are. And um, one of the things that I'll say is that uh, in my studies of, of social movements, I've found that there's no uh, revolutionary action that didn't begin in some very early, very fundamental way with student organizing, um, with student protests. Um, and we've seen in Canada the different ways that, um, say, students in Montreal were able to organize and take to the streets and uh, demand um, uh, pay, uh, equal education and and won many, many times. Um, and so this is just to, to say um, beyond, you know, what I'm sure leadership and student leadership is already doing in terms of advocating for more funding, of I'm sure fundraising, of doing all those things that I don't want to echo to them, that also people power, uh, organized people power is a skill and it really works. Um, and so, and that there are not only that, but uh, templates all across the country and recently that they can draw on to be able to take inspiration from, to take lessons from. Um, like I said, I think a lot of people think that protests are like these like unorganized, like people just go out and march and like whatever, but it takes a great level of coordination, um, of getting your messages compiled, um, of getting people um, activated to a point where that they can go out there and do that. Um, and it starts with individual and oftentimes, yes, young people taking the initiative uh, to do that unpaid uh, labor that no, they should not have to do, but I have all the faith um, can yield something for them. So uh, that would be maybe my, my initial recommendation other than, you know, jabbering policy back at them. <laughs> all right, so Chimmy and thank you for that uh, question from our online participants. Mm -hmm. So is there any final words? Um, just me, Gwetch, thank you for sticking with me. Rocky start, got my slideshow up, got everything going. But I, I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. All right, everybody. So let's uh, have another round of applause for our keynote, Riley Yesno. Riley, I just want to let you know we're proud of you. You know, you do really great work for our community and we're really happy to have your expertise and continue the great work as well. So, Chimmy Gwetch. Um, so, uh, next up, we're going to have a presentation. Um, and so, that will be from our Chiefs of Ontario Education Program Lead, Patrick Lowen. So, um, Patrick has worked as an Education Program Lead for the Chiefs of Ontario. I'm like standing with a mic in front of mics. So I'm just realizing this now. I'm going to put this down. All right, okay, cool. So sometimes it's just handy to hold it in your hand, eh? <laughs> so, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so Patrick, um, this work, so uh, involves K-12 to uh, education and uh, provincial education matters. So Patrick has close collaboration with the First Nations uh, Lifelong Learning Table. So that's the table, the overview that he'll be presenting on today. Um, so Patrick has over 16 years of experience in working in First Nations education as both a teacher, special education lead, student success leader, a guidance counselor, and as well as a principal. So Patrick education bound, uh, background includes the Bachelor of Education and a specialization in special education and a career uh, and guidance as well as a Master of Arts in Counseling uh, Psychology. So everybody, let's uh, give a warm welcome to everybody's attention for uh, our next uh, presentation, Patrick. We got mic issues, thank you so much. Um, I always feel like it's really weird when somebody introduces yourself and you're standing next to it, but uh, miigwech for that. And thank you, Riley, for showing up. I was uh, 
kind of scared I had to do a keynote for an hour and a half there for a while. And <laughs> it would not have been as wonderful as yours, that's for sure. Um, so just be um, before I get going here, I just want to, again, give my condolences to the Miracle uh, family. Um, Murray, I worked with Murray for, for seven years, um, and he was such a wonderful man. And sometimes when you, and you know this, when you work in education, it's tough going, right? Uh, but Murray would always say, you know what, speak your mind, especially when you talk to ISK and uh, Ministry of Education. And he just said, you know, keep going, Patrick, keep going. So that's what we'll do, keep going. Um, and I'm going to sit down because I'm six foot eight and this podium does not do me any good. <laughs> so I apologize. It's going to be my first time presenting sitting down. So, um, so yeah. And I'm not nervous to speak here, but I'm nervous because my mother-in-law is in the room. Ah, she's over there, Hannah Baron. She's kind of scary. <laughs> so it's a first. <clears throat> so hopefully I'll be, you know, on my best behavior here. Um, okay. Hello? Okay, so, yeah, so I have the privilege to talk about uh, the First Nation Lifelong Learning Table. Uh, we have quite a few coordinators from the table here, and I will introduce you soon, so be ready. Um, so the FNLT is a short for that. You know, we love our acronyms. Um, dates back to about 2015, uh, when there was conversations between the Chiefs of Ontario, uh, the Chiefs and Technical Committee on Language and Learning, the CTCLL, that you heard so much about the last few days, uh, formerly known as the FNECU, uh, and the Indigenous Education Office, which from the Ministry of Education, back then they were referred to something else too. Um, but these talks uh, resulted in a bilateral process uh, and the establishment of the First Nation Lifelong Learning Table. Um, resolution 45 uh, slash 16 uh, from the Chiefs of Assembly um, approved the establishment of the First Nation Lifelong Learning Table, uh, giving the FNLT its um, mandate to work towards priorities that I will cover here soon. Um, the FNLT has its own terms of reference. We also have an evergreen relationship uh, partnership protocol with, with the ministry that we work from. Um, yeah. So the vision of the FNLT is to increase success and well-being for First Nation learners in both the provincial and federally funded education system through a balanced, respectful, and collaborative relationship, whereby collab collaborative work is planned, designed, implemented, regularly, and evaluated. So a lot of fancy words there, right? So we'll see what that means here in a bit. Um, controlling lots of gadgets here. So uh, when I created this, I tried, okay, I'm going to create something that's simple, uh, that people can understand. And then I looked at this, I'm like, yeah, that's not very simple. So bear with me. Um, as you can see by the diagram on the screen, uh, there's a lot of people and organizations, communities involved in the FNLT, right? Uh, but the center of it is First Nation students. That's who we are mandated to work for. Right. Um, I, outside of the First Nation students in the center there, we have the FNLT, right? And the FNLT right now compromises of, of uh, FNLT coordinators from each of the four provincial um, po political territorial organizations, the PTOs in Ontario, right? And the independent First Nation. So we have AIAI, right? Um, and our coordinator there is Ashley Timothy. Do you want to stand up and wave? Yeah? Okay. Oh, she gets a applause too. Awesome. <laughs> um, so now you know AIA who your coordinator is, right? Uh, we have Anishinaabek Nation, and that's wonderful Natasha George. I, I saw her yesterday. Are you here, Natasha? There you go. Awesome. Uh, Grand Council Treaty 3, Tracy Councillor, are you here? No? Hiding, maybe? Okay. Um, and then from the Independent First Nation, we have Mia Francis. I know you're here. Yeah, Mia is awesome and kind, so go see her if you're from IFN. Uh, Debbie Terrence, who couldn't make it, she also helps and supports me and her work. 
And then from Nation I'll be asking Nation, we have Nicole McKay. I know I saw Nicole here yesterday. Okay, she's also shy and hiding, but Nicole is here. And then uh, Koo also has a coordinator, and that's Carly Palmer. Um, Carly is also somewhere, but maybe not in the room. Okay. Uh, technically, the Indi uh, Indigenous Education Office also sits on the, um, I, we refer to IEO, sits on the, and participate in the FNLT. Um, I hope they're not here, but their presence is a little bit, um, you know, deteriorating at the moment. And that uh, has to do with uh, change in gov government in Ontario. Um, you know, COVID happened, so we are building to reestablish uh, re that relationship. Uh, but we work closely with them too. Um, so the work from, from KU and the, the PTOs and Independent First Nations is a little bit different, right? So the, um, the PTOs and the Independent First Nations have their own three-year work plan and, and their TPA with, with uh, the Ministry of Education. So they work on their regional priorities as they should, you know, working for their communities. The Chiefs of Ontario also have our, our work plan and TPA with the Ministry of Education, uh, and we work more broadly. So we try to you know, have that systematic change uh, across Ontario. Uh, our work plan is presented uh, to the FNLT for their approval and also the CTCLL. Uh, so so uh, we are you know, advised by them um, and, and kind of given our marching orders, if that makes sense. Uh, our awesome director, Julia, here uh, also informs the leadership council that you can see in the top uh, right corner there. And sometimes our work is also uh, elevated to the chiefs and assembly, right? And Julia gives uh, updates to, um, to them uh, in, in, in education, but also that covers the FNLT, the work of the FNLT. Uh, so you can see around the circle there that we have, you know, obviously the First Nation communities, we have task teams and working groups. So right now, for example, we have a curriculum task team that's going on. I'll speak a little bit more on that. External partners that could be, for example, uh, OCT, Ontario College of Teachers that we work with. Uh, we have school boards. So you know there's 72 school boards. That's a lot of school boards to work with and have relationship with. Uh, so that's a roller coaster in itself. Um, and then we have our friends at uh, Indigenous Services Canada, and I send friends because Shelley's in the room here, right, Shelley? Um, we also work closely with the Ministry of Education, especially the Indigenous Education Office, as you can see. Um, that is a real challenge because EDU has, as you can see on the screen, then 10 divisions and 42 branches. So we are working not with all the 42 branches per se, but on and off we sort of do. Right, and there's a lot of uh, turnover and movement within EDU, so it's a continuous, you know, cycle of establishing relationship, maintaining them, and then starting over, etc. Right, so um, our work is quite challenging in, in that regard. Okay, um, so. I'm waiting for them to change. Okay, the roles and responsibilities, right? So um, the FLT, as you've seen before, um, previous slideshows, is it is not a decision-making forum. It's an advisory body, right? Um, so our roles and responsibilities are um, draft and implement work plans and address identify FNLT priority areas, coordinate and identify participants uh, for task teams, working groups, identify and implement activities to be undertaken. Uh, consult, consolidate and share information and provide updates at uh, CTCLL meetings. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, so the main uh, five uh, priority areas as supported by the Chiefs of Assembly are curriculum, uh, relationships, community and student well-being, languages and culture, information, access, and accountability. And I'm gonna dive a little deeper into that, but we are gonna bring out our dear friend Slido. So get your phones and tablets out if you want. Um, so we want to hear from you uh, in regards to those five priority areas, you know, how would you rank them in, in, in terms of importance? So we have curriculum, 
relationships, community, student, and well-being, languages and culture, and information access and accountability. So if you, yeah, there we go. Good job, thank you. I'm gonna give this a little bit of time. Thank you so much for this input, it's important. And I see it's really fitting that language and culture is the top uh, priority because um, we're here for language and culture and education, right? This forum, so that's wonderful to see. Okay. So you can continue to put that in and we are uh, capturing that as we go. Um, all right, so the next question is, please share other priority areas that you think are important for the FNLT to consider, right? So are we missing the mark on something that you say, hey, okay, you got curriculum, you have relationships, you have community and student well-being, language and culture, information access, accountability. However, you don't have this. So, okay, mental health, perfect, thank you. Anti-racism, outdoor education, awesome. Life skills, no, I can't keep up anymore. <laughs> Long-term planning. This is fantastic because this actually will help guide our work, right? Uh, input from communities uh, and, and people as yourself in, in the leading roles in education is, is really valuable to us. Trauma and for practices, community engagement, funding equity, generational trauma. Wow, this is fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Thank you so much. Uh, we will definitely take a look at this and bring this back to the FNLT table for discussions. And I've got lots of, I think we have a three year work plan here, maybe more. <laughs> um, okay, so I am going to get into the key pr activities of each priority area, right? So this is some of the work that we've been doing. And um, Right here, I'm speaking to the to sort of the, the work uh, that we do at the Chiefs of Ontario, but it also includes the FNLT table, of course. Uh, everything we do, we meet and we talk and discuss and get guidance from the FNLT, right? Um, so there's been a lot of work around this year around curriculum, uh, especially, and you probably read in, in the media, the science and technology curriculum that went uh, very sideways and wrong. Uh, so we did a lot of research and analysis on that, uh, you know, informed leadership, um, wrote briefing notes, press releases, asked for response from the Ministry of Education, which took forever. <laughs> asked Julia, she's asked for that update many, many times. I think it takes four months or so to get a response. That was not so, so great either. Um, and then we worked on modernization of curriculum. So. This is the new thing that the Ministry of Education want to do. They want to modernize the, the curriculum to make sure that students are ready for the workforce. So we took a look at that and drafted some recommendations that we uh, presented to the FNLT and then uh, uh, gave those recommendations to, to the Ministry of Education. Uh, the big thing we're working on right now is curriculum and the curriculum writing and review process. Uh, so the Ministry of Education informed us about two months ago uh, that they were review reviewing that process. So we obviously put our hands up and said, hey, stop, we want to be part of that so we can feed in uh, uh, First Nations knowledge and content and situate First Nations, you know, from the beginning to the end of that process. It's quite a complicated process. So the FLT then, um, we came up with a curriculum task team uh, which have each of the coordinators on that task team, but also curriculum advisors or uh, experts or whatever you want to call them, knowledge keepers from their PTO or the independent First Nations. So we've got quite the, the large team and we're meeting with the, with the curriculum branch bi-weekly and we're really dissecting that process and giving them heck. <laughs> so at the end of this, we will 
uh, have some formal recommendations um, uh, from that table to the Ministry of Education. We're very curious to see which of those uh, recommendations they will adapt, if any, right? But we will have that on record, and if things go sideways, we will say, hey, listen, we told you we wanted this at this stage, etc." right? So that is some really important work that we're undertaking right now. Um, sorry. Oops. Hit the wrong button. Relationship. So this is continuous. So we need to establish, build, or rebuild relationship with school boards. There's 72 of them, and the, the, the coordinators do that individually also. Uh, the Ministry of Education, uh, and, and then also First Nation relationships. So this is ongoing, and um, it's a real challenge, to be honest, because of the turnover and, and so many balls in the air. But we definitely do our best in that regard. Uh, Jordan's principle. So we're right now drafting a Jordan's principle roll-up report. So uh, we've done some research and some outreach to First Nation communities, school boards, uh, and, and see how is Jordan's principle implemented at the school board level you know are there policies in place are the students supported when for example they have uh jordan's principal support on reserve and then they transition into the school board system right does that support follow them right uh so we have lots of different uh draft recommendations that we will um put forward and there's a breakout session after this with my colleague carly and she will share some of that initial findings right um Community and student well-being. So here we've fed into the Board Improvement and Equity Plan, uh, BEEP, they call it for. Uh, also, and the board, also we've done a lot of work around the Board Action Plan on Indigenous Education. So again, the ministry said, okay, we're revamping this a little bit, and especially the reporting uh, tool that the, the school boards have to, to, to hand in to the Ministry of Education. So again, we said, stop, we want to be part of that. Uh, so we had many meetings with the Chiefs of Ontario, the FNLT tables, and we, you know, advised them, like, okay, okay, I think, or I think, we think <laughs> there should be more accountability here. You need to have sign-off from communities, for example. You need to have sign-off from the Indigenous leads, et cetera, in the school boards, right? So they did adapt some of those recommendations, so we, we hope that, you know, uh, First Nations students in the school boards will have uh, more support and accountability that way. Uh, we also work uh, with the human rights and complaint procedures in Ontario for school boards. That works, um, we've been advised that that's on hold by the Ministry of Education, uh, but we fed into and made some recommendations with that too. Uh, although that Ministry of Education has put that on hold, that does not prevent individual school boards to have their own policies in place around human rights, right? Uh, complaints. Um, and then we are working on student well uh, student well-being framework. So here we're looking at you know um, how how do we um, identify what is student well-being, right? Because it means a lot. And the, the school boards and Ministry of Education maybe have a definition that does not fit what 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 uh, First Nations thinks uh, uh, well-being is. So you know we're doing a lot of work around that. Um, how am I doing for time here? Okay. And speed it up a little bit. <laughs> Languages and culture, okay? So we had a framework for Indigenous language in, uh, in Ontario schools report. It's, it is accessible on our um, website, so look that up. There are some uh, key recommendations um, put forward in that report related to uh, language instruction and, 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 and language in the uh, curriculum in the Ontario school boards. Uh, we did an environmental scan on language instructor cert certification in Canada to see like, hey, what are other provinces and territories doing in terms of getting, you know, more uh, instructors into um, the school system, right? We are in continuous talk with Ontario College of Teachers, you know, it, to see, if, you know, is, well, something has to be done about the certifi certification recognition of language teachers, we all know that. Uh, and then we sit on the Leadership uh, Committee on Languages, the L LCOL, that you heard about the other day. Um, information, access, and accountability. So we did uh, sign a data sharing agreement with the Ministry of Education. Um, so we are now re receiving uh, some important data and see how are 
um, First Nation students doing in the public school boards. That data we can then analyze and dissect and, and then share with communities, right? This is uh, quite new and we haven't received uh, all the data that we requested, so therefore we haven't really rolled out uh, any findings yet, but it, it, it will come. Um, we also sit on the reciprocal education approach, um, the REA uh, working group, uh, which is meeting next week, I believe, uh, and we advise and make, re make, re make recommendations around that and keep the ministry on their toes, that's for sure. Um, we also have done some uh, work around school classification, as in the Education Act. We know that First Nation schools on reserve are lumped into that private um, school label, sort of. Uh, but we also, we're looking mostly at the high schools and how their certification process and, and uh, how they're inspected and all that. And it's not really um, a consistent process. Uh, so we're looking to see, you know, it, can, can there be some other ways that that is done, right? Uh, we have, so we've talked to a lot of high schools and principals and, and done our due, own uh, due diligence on that and legal review. Uh, and then we have our education service agreement. And this is, I'm really getting excited about this. So we've done a lot of work around that because the reciprocal education approach came out, which uh, really changed the messaging around uh, education service agreements uh, whatever you want to call them, the agreements that the First Nations have with the school boards, right? So the ministry kind of pushed that to the side and say, hey, Ray us the way to go. And we said, hold on a second, that's not how it should be. You know, that's, you know, each nation should make decision which way they want to go, right? So there's lots of positive, positives with the Raya, but uh, the message that you can have an education service agreement again uh, is, is, is uh, not what uh, should be. Be happening so i'm excited we're going to share this video here uh, that we um did a lot of work around and i think it's re actually really helpful for school boards to watch this so if you want to share them when that video when you do your negotiation i highly recommend it so key the video please chiefs of ontario presents an introduction to education agreements Wache, this is Sage. Sage is one of the thousands of First Nations students that go to public schools in Ontario. Her community has an education agreement with the local school board to make sure that their students have the support they need, like transportation, language classes, and accommodations for those with special needs. First Nations have negotiated education agreements with school boards for decades. They can be a wonderful relationship building tool. The Reciprocal Education Approach, or REA, is a base tuition fee paid by school boards and First Nations. It ensures that a First Nations student can be admitted to a school board, and conversely, that a First Nations school has the authority to admit or refute a student. But it does not always cover all the services and support First Nations students need. Education agreements allow for well-negotiated solutions that incorporate the REA. It's a win-win-win for students, First Nations, and school boards. Ani, this is Dakota. He lives in a small city but goes to school in his First Nation community. Dakota's community school is cool because they have many classes and activities that make him feel at home. The school has daily Anishinaabemowin classes, awesome land-based activities like fishing, trapping, and snowshoeing. Dakota's school also has elders, language teachers, cultural coordinators, and education assistants that make Dakota feel safe, valued, and proud to be First Nations. Like Dakota, some students who live off reserve decide to attend school in First Nation communities. Negotiating education agreements for these students is important, as the REA only covers the base tuition fee. So what's not covered under the base tuition fee? Well, a lot actually. Important things like education service standards, First Nations language and culture courses, additional special education services and equipment, access to student data, and having a say in who school boards hire to promote First Nations students' success, well-being, and achievement. Sego, as a First Nations education manager, Sarah understands the value of having an education agreement in place for their students and community. 
Their community has negotiated for better diversity practices, including hiring more First Nations teachers at the school board. They have also included student transition supports, aggregate student data, and curriculum reflecting First Nations culture, values, and history. Their education agreement gives them a tool to advocate for their students' well-being and success. Segoli. This is Nimki, and they attend grade 12 at a public school 20 minutes outside of their home community. At first, Nimki was nervous about attending school outside of their community, but they soon learned that their community has an education agreement with the school board that makes sure they have the access to support services that are designed specifically for students from their First Nation. The school's First Nations culture and student well-being support worker has been a great support to them. This year, Nimki is on track to graduate with honors. Well done, Nimki. Students like Sage, Dakota, and Nimki are just a few of the many First Nations students who benefit from an education agreement. Chiefs of Ontario has generated an education agreement template to make negotiating your EA easy. For more information, please visit education.chiefsofontario.org. I know that's really cheesy, but it gets everybody every time. <laughs> uh, I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give Carly the credit for that, wherever she is. She, she was so on that, pushed hard for that. <laughs> okay, final slide. Um, so I, yeah, please use that video if you, if you feel that that's appropriate with the school boards. I think they have a lot to learn when watching that video. Um, so some of our challenges and opportunities that, uh, for the First Nation lifelong learning table is obviously communication. And this is not just, uh, just a challenge for the FNLT, it's a challenge for, for all of us, I would assume, right? So how do we communicate with all these partners that I showed uh, earlier, and especially with the ministries and, 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 and Indigenous Service Canada? So, you know, at the table, we talk about communi communication strategies, which, which goes hand in hand with relationships. and um, we kind of focused on like, okay, we need to own our, our own self. And I'm sure there are people in the room here and, and that's going to be transparent and honest. You're probably like, what is the FNLT? I don't never heard about that, right? Like I saw some people yesterday say, well, Tifa, what's that, right? So that's, that's on us, so, you know, what we can do and raise the FNLT profile, right? I know that our indigenous leads and some school boards don't know who we are and what we do. That's a problem and that's something that we obviously have to own and work on. So we'll do that moving forward. Um, another thing is the FNLT and its title is lifelong learning, right? Right now our mandate is K to 12 education. Okay, so we need to obviously, we talked about adult education yesterday, we need to expand on that, right? Uh, so we have had some initial very early talks with the Ministry of College and University, the MCU. So hopefully in the future, um, you know, uh, we will expand our work at the FNLT to include uh, adult learners and, and post-secondary education. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that is really it. And thank you for your time. And I'm sure you want to have some refreshments and, and stretch your legs and all that. But my contact information is there. Uh, my partners and also our, our link to our website. So thank you so much. So uh, that was a good presentation about some of the work that's happening at the lifelong learning table. Um, and um, Patrick did put his information up on the slide. So if you'd like more information, I'm sure uh, Patrick will be around. You can approach Patrick. Uh, oh, also, I'm loving the Moosehide campaign pin you got going on there. So good stuff. So, okay, there's a question. Okay, there is a question. Sigoli. <clears throat> I am. I'm Marsha, if you don't know yet already. Um, I just, I feel the need to, to speak to this. Um, we've talked a lot about education um, and ensuring that our needs are met, um, but we have not thought about those who are deaf or disabled and may not have the same ability to access all of what we're fighting for. 
you know, and when we're looking at on First Nation or not on First Nation schools, you know, has there been a, I, I'm not sure if you've um, talked to provincial school boards that um, have schools for the deaf and school for the de deaf blind and, and so on, um, if there's been relationships with them, as well as looking at um, providing services uh, for those people who are disabled or deaf or whatever it may be. And so I just, I, I really want to ensure that we're also, at, we're advocating for all of us and making sure that everybody has what they need, whether that's um, in regards to providing interpreters or whatever that may be. I know that I have been at the table um, for the provincial school board uh, and, um, and have been a strong advocate for our indigenous deaf who are in, in those um, systems. And so those and those students are really suffering from mental health because they, you know, if you if you think about it, you know, we all suffer from oppression. We all are um, are experiencing racism on different levels. But when you have a disability or you are deaf, it becomes even more layered and complicated. And so I really want to highlight that we really need to make space for, for people, Indigenous people who are deaf or, he, or, deaf or disabled in, in any manner to be at the table to say what it is that their needs are so that we can advocate for that and ensure that those, the resources and whatever it is that's needed so that they can also be successful with their education. You know, I can speak for a deaf, a, a deaf, a deaf person like myself, you know, it's an interpreter that I need. But, <clears throat> You know, for other other groups, we also need to make sure that there's space here. And I just want to make sure that we are lifting them out along with ourselves and we're not forgetting anybody along the way. You know, like there's, there's you know, we, we've got st students uh, who have autism or what, you know, the list goes on and on. So we just really need to make sure that when we're at these tables, when we're fighting these fights, we need to, we need to say, you know, that it, think about all of us that are here. And so I just, um, this is just kind of something percolating over the last few days. And so I really wanted to be sure that I highlighted it and brought it forward. And I, again, appreciate that you've created this space for me to share with you. No call. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, we do have a special education um, um, unit within our education unit. And we do have a working group with the provincial demonstration schools. Um, that has been in work for about the past two years. Yeah, and I think you came and presented many years ago, or yeah, to that group. So we do have conversations uh, with them there. And I used to sit on that working table, uh, working group also. Uh, but that being said, yeah, I, I hear your message and we will definitely take that back to the First Nation lifelong learning table and Thank you for, for those words. Thank um, So, uh, Chimmy Gwetsha, once again, Patrick, and there will be uh, more opportunity to learn uh, from Pat Patrick and to hear about the work that he's doing and the breakout sessions which are coming up after our break. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to invite uh, Marsha up uh, one last time so to come to share with us some uh, Oneida Sign Language. Um, this will be the last time that Marsha will be sharing with us uh, today. So, the, uh, Marsha and uh, her husband Max will be making their travels back home this afternoon. Um, so, uh, we want to give some time, some extra time uh, for Marsha um, to be able to share with everybody. So, once again, that is Teyohum uh, Dagwegum Daya. Um, Marsha Ireland, everybody. I would like to introduce my husband, Max Ireland. Shiguli. Uh, Nani. I just like to let you know, let let get you to know Marsha a little better and her accomplishments that. She has had over this long time that we've uh, 
been, put, been putting forth the effort to get people to understand the challenges that go along with, I don't like the word disability. My dad said, take those three first letters off and then what do you have? You have ability. And Marcia has proven that in spades. Some of the things she did was she attended Fanshawe College in London. She's had five beautiful children that have grown up and we're very proud of. We've, uh, she went to Parliament Hill. She presented to the standing committee there about having indigenous sign language on par with uh, American Sign Language and uh, Quebec Sign Language. And uh, the latest effort was uh, she was the lead interpreter in Edmonton when the Pope was there. Didn't agree with everything he said, but <laughs> he finally got the gist of it at the third meeting, I think, where he had finally admitted that was genocide that was created. And one, uh, so she's been promoting this when she really found the need that was because of her experiences within the education. And she's seen the, the holes regarding the indigenous population within that system. So as was, our children got older and went into that system. She was always there for them. She'd advocate on their behalf. She'd go in and tell stories. She'd go in and do presentations and take uh, corn husk dolls in and explain about that. And then, then the creation of uh, Oneida Sign Language came about from her and one of our counselors on Oneida saying that this, what, this, this need wasn't being met and what can we do to meet that need? So then in, in the process that's what started Oneida Sign Language. Our languages are there for everyone, regardless. So we have to provide those opportunities when we can. Like we use this for Seguli. But you can use that in your language too. I think what we wanted to create was a, a symbol and symbols for a universal language, regardless of your background, your tribe, your nation. Something that can be shared from that border to that border to that border. And we encourage you if you have, even if you don't have deaf children in your community or deaf uh, uh, adults, they want to be heard, they want to be known. And then if you guys can create signs with your own, within your own community and say, look it, I recognize you. You're not unseen to me anymore. There are people out there that sadly are in those positions. And we as educators have to provide those opportunities for them to become seen and heard and understood. A lot of times there's no communication with them in our communities. And that's, that's not right. We're people. We always get up here and say we're people. Are we? Are we serving everybody equally? Are we doing as much as we can for everybody? Early in our children's education, we were passed around back and forth. Oh, that's a health issue. No, that's an education issue. To the point where nothing got done for anybody. But now through Marsha's advocacy, her fierceness, her stubbornness. <laughs> things have changed, things have gotten done. One of the things that we have gotten and accomplished is Debbie here. She works with us on a regular basis, which is something that was greatly needed in our community. We have over 20 deaf people in our community. 
So she's accessible to all of them, whatever that need may be. And then we went to uh, try out for uh, the C program on Apple TV. Most of you women know Jason Momoa. <laughs> That's his program. So we were, they hired us. We were merchants, we were in the background. And then we just got started in two weeks and then COVID hit, so we've, we retired. <laughs> but these are things that, challenges, things that she has taken on, or we have taken on together, to say there's no limitations. The only limitations that you have are the ones that you put on yourself. Other people say you can't do it, do it. Not just to show them or prove it, but prove it to yourself. I'm never going to be put in that position where people can say I can't or the only reason I can't is because I won't. So we have to encourage each and every one of our children that, that we raise. I was a classroom assistant. I, and, uh, I got that from being a hockey coach. They said, you're good. You can teach the young boys. So that transpired over into the education. My son was on that team. So I had to learn sign language and use sign language with him. And then the other boys seen that as well. I said, how does, it, you know, how does he do this? How did he do So we talk, we watch hockey all the time. We met Walter Gretzky in uh, little NHL in Brantford. And he says, you know, he, first he, they introduced each other and got pictures and everything. Then he said, what's his number? I'm going to stick around for this game because it's coming up next. I said, I told him the number. And then we met after the game and he just shook my hand. And he said, uh, you know, I couldn't even tell he was deaf out there. That was one of the best compliments I've had as a father about my son. Like a gentleman was saying, it's hard work. Yes, it is. We benefit, but they benefit the most. We can encourage them to keep on the right path and continue on, whatever that education may be. Like what Marcia, what Marcia takes to young people. She educates them in different ways that that school never was, never did. Probably never will until she steps forward and does it for them. Those doors were closed. And they didn't want them open. But she busted in there anyway. <laughs> to present everything she does and say, this is ours. This is what we do. This is how we do it. And this is why we do it. So I want, to, I want you to take that good message home to your situations and your people. It's, we all wear in these shirts, wear shirts. Every child matters. They cert most certainly do. So we'll remember that those people that yeah, can't go to a regular school. Whether it be one of the major pushes that we're doing, Marcia and I are doing now in our community is autism. They're in a world within a world. So we're bringing that to the caregivers, the parents, the grandparents. And we're gonna uh, spread that knowledge throughout our community you have these options available to you, which they never probably knew that were there. The parents have such a hard time, but they continue out of love. But they need breaks too, whether it be a weekend or a week, 
on holidays. Because their, their job is 24 seven. Where can they go? We have no institution set up specifically for these people. And they learn, they can learn. One guy in our, our neighboring First Nations, he's, he's a brilliant photographer. So we have to provide those opportunities for the people that need this special, specialized treatment. And uh, Marsha has proven that in spades. There's nothing you can't do. Our, uh, our sign language is eventually what we want to do is create a school right across in Oneida, but for individuals right across Canada, where they can come and learn sign language, American sign language. And we'd like to have situations where our children, the coded, the coded kids can come, children of adult, deaf adults, so that we can provide an opportunity for them to communicate with their parents or grandparents or whoever. Then we want to have people coming from our nations. Whether you have deaf people there or not, it's a form of communication. So if you, if you come and learn and you see Marcia, and then you can have a conversation, you can sit down, have a coffee, whatever. So we have this opportunity within us as educators to share. And that's exactly, that's what we're doing. We're sharing. But we have to include all of us, not just part of us. They won't go. Just to add to what um, Max was saying, in 2016, we went to Standing Rock. My family um, went there. <clears throat> And it was incredibly emotional, emotional. And when you looked up, you could see, you could see them standing there. But all of us were together. We would smudge together, we prayed together, we sang together, and it was so powerful. And yet you had these people standing over top of you, trying to threaten you. It was so powerful. And it reminded me of when I was a little girl, I wanted to go to, to the Grand Canyon. So after we had done Standing Rock, a couple of years later, we went back to the Grand Canyon. And so when we finally made it to the top, and I was looking down. It was so powerful because no longer was anybody looking down on me. That I was being recognized, recognized. I had that power. It's the gift I've been given to me. I, you could see all of our spirits and all of their love. And so this is, what, this is what helps me continue to do what I do, right? It's all about good heart, good mind, connecting to spirit. Participating in our, in our traditions like sweat. You know, years ago, I was not able to do that. They thought, oh, no, there's no way Marsha could participate in that. It's pitch black in there. She won't be able to know what's going on. She won't know the songs. But I have done it, and I am able to connect with the drum and the songs and the spirit. So grateful to Creator. Tionko. <laughs> OK, so I will teach you a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. 
sorry, just give the interpreter a moment to get her notes here. Okay, so bear, bear, Oguali, Oguali, turtle. So you think the turtle's back? Your thumb is on the uh, the turtle's back is the tail, and your other thumb is the turtle's head. Adnawali, or Adnawal, sorry, turtle. Right to the back, the shell is your knuckles. You see? Wolf, Tahuni, yeah, we always see them howling, right, protecting, right, pushing back, protecting the wolf. Beaver. Do you need to? <laughs> yeah, look at. Lots of people say the teeth, uh, the teeth. I feel like that's insulting. That's in the ASL that what they do for the beaver. Brass, it's the tail. Yes. Yes. the sign for clan. So I am turtle clan. Who, who's bear clan? Put your, let's put your arms up or stand up. Stand up, stand up. Let's stretch a little bit. We've been sitting a long time. All right, bear. Okwali. Clan. So I, me, bear, clan. Okay. Uncle, you can sit down. Tahuni, wolf. Those of you who are wolf, do we have any? Ah, okay. Yeah. Got a couple. Okay. So let's do it. Wolf. Tahuni. So me, point to yourself, I am Wolf Clan. I am Wolf Clan. You got it. Yanko. I know, an, <clears throat> I know all. Turtle, turtle, yeah, all right. So there you go, okay. So I'm Turtle Clan. Beaver? You got any beavers? No? Oh, I didn't see you there. <laughs> so I'm, I, beaver. Clan. Excellent. Well done, everyone. Yonko. Deer? Are there any deer? No? Deer? No? No? Fish? Fish? Ah! -ha! So I'm fish clan. Yonko. So let's do a little bit of a review. Maybe I should pick somebody out of, yes, you. <laughs> Would you mind? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, stand up if you wouldn't mind. To meet. To meet. 
Bianca? Miss you over there. Would you mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember by? Nagit. Nagitwa. There you go. Nagitwa. <clears throat> the man at the back there. Do you remember the sign for man? Ah, yes, well done. <laughs> yep. All right, see you there. Yeah, yeah, yes. Grandmother. <laughs> A goose suit. Yes, grandmother. Yes, on the t yes, yeah, there you go. Yes, on the rest. Excellent. All right. Yes. Um boy. Ah, excellent. Excellent, excellent. So again, these are, you know, when you're, when you're signing, did anybody feel like, oh, I don't know how to do this, right? And it's really, sorry, just give me the interpreter a moment. Usually when I, um, I usually teach and then give people time to practice. I love teaching and I love playing games. Um, with people, we play cards with signs. So you could use uh, your language with the sign too. You know, as, as we spoke to the other day. It's a lot of fun. And it's really, you know, when you're doing things, learning while doing activity, right? Being in the kitchen and, and using our languages. You know, it just helps. It really makes it concrete for everyone. And so as we've spoke to, you know, we really want all of our nations and all of our languages to work in tandem with, with sign languages. You know, it's really about our healing and, you know, healing from those traumas and letting them go and coming together with a good mind and a good heart. Yes. Ah, see, I was just asked if I have a book. Yes. <laughs> um, and there's there's um, some things online. Um, so it's www dot www dot Oneida. O n e i d a. Sign, S-I-G-N, language. So you can just Google it. You'll see lots of videos of me and lots of pictures of me uh, teaching sign uh, Oneida Sign Language. So I'm always excited to work with people when doing, you know, doing workshops and things. And this is, you know, it's funny how everybody stands behind this podium. Uh, you know, and so when you, you know, when you're doing your workshops, you know, if you were to see me somewhere, you could see, see me say, I'm Oneida and I am Turtle Clan. And you can do that yourselves. And it's just really about, you know, how when we put the language and the science together, it really supports that self-esteem and really about that 
good hearts and good mind and just sharing together. The last few days have left me feeling wonderful and I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful to, uh, to Chiefs of Ontario who, who um, saw me doing something similar at um, AFN. And I know that several people have come up to me and said, yeah, I remember that my grandparents used to use a sign language. They spoke and spoke, but also used signs. Right? So it's there. We have, we have that memory. It's there. So you can look online. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Or um, So Yonko, for the last few days, ha everyone have a very safe travels home. Back to your communities. Yonko. All right, um, thank you um, for uh, sharing with us and, and spending time with us as well. So also, also to Max uh, for sharing as well. I really appreciate it. I must say, um, your skirt. He's getting, our <laughs> He's getting the luggage. Eh? Um, but yeah, your skirt, everything looks really nice and beautiful today. You know, a nice matching and you got your earrings going. It's really good. So <laughs> I was like, holy, he just really knows how to color code and looks real nice, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Gretchen, and it's really important because I got um, a cousin back home um, who is deaf, and he has to travel a fair distance in order to um, to be able to go to school. And so, when, often when he's away, he misses a lot of community events. He doesn't get to participate, and it just really highlights the need for um, you know to make uh, sign language sign language accessible in, in the community as well. So, um, so that he can participate, so that he's not left out. You know, so I really appreciate those reminders. Uh, thank you once again, Jimmy Glitch. Okay, so um, now that brings us out to our wellness break. So um, I'm just um, checking on the time, everybody. So uh, we are going to have a break till about 11.30. So that doesn't give us too much time of a break before we move into our breakout sessions. So we do have breakout sessions. Um, if you look on the program by looking on the... Uh, on the back of your name tag. Um, I'll just let everybody know where the breakout sessions are because um, these breakout sessions will bring us right to lunch. So um, starting with the journey of uh, KTCEA, um, which is going to be about a consistent curriculum, will be with uh, Dr. Um, Daphne um, Maystonia and as well as Emma uh, Enzo. And that will be in Mount Baton Room. So that's going to be right here. Um, the other breakout session that we have with Education Agreements, Patrick Lowen, as well as uh, Nikina Bear Lowen, that will be in the Wren Room. Um, Jordan's Principal in the Provincial School System um, by Carly Palmer and Zachariah General, that will be in the Carlisle Room. Um, the relationships with Provincial School Boards will be uh, hosted by Debbie. Uh, Terrence, as well as Mia Francis from IFN, that will be happening in the Scott breakout room. So uh, there's four different breakout sessions that everybody is welcome and encouraged to participate and join. Um, and once again, um, that will start in about 11.15. Uh, so we have a shorter of a wellness break. Um, and then we will have our lunch at a quarter after 12. And so after our lunch, we will be coming back here. Uh, for 1 p.m. Uh, where we will continue the rest of our agenda, everybody. So uh, enjoy your breakout sessions and we'll see everybody back for lunch. Enjoy your introduction. Yep. So I'd like to introduce our next uh, breakout session and our presenters. Um, our presentation is the journey of the KTCEA Common Consistent Curriculum. This presentation will cover the pathways of the KTCEA curriculum, including how it continues to be guided by the KTCEA land-based learning advisory, which is comprised of elders and representatives from each of our member nations. Grounded in four pillars, leadership, storytelling, land-based learning, and healing lessons, curricular activities are developed for each season of the school year, fall, winter, and spring. The curriculum enhances provincial programs to ensure students know and take pride in who they are as First Nations people. Our presenters are 
Dr. Daphne Maestonia is the Superintendent of Education for Kitas Key Now Tribal Council Education Authority and has been in education system for 30 years, serving in various capacities, such as a special education teacher, vice principal, acting principal, and assistant superintendent, superintendent, and province-wide special education director. She's originally from the Siksika Nation and has strong cultural ties with Siksika traditions. Daphne has a master's degree in educational leadership administration from the University of San Diego and a doctorate of education from the University of Calgary. Woo. She has served on various regional, provincial, and national education bodies representing First Nations over the years. Daphne has presented at local, provincial, national, and international conferences on topics that include special education, Indian control of Indian education, and inequities in First Nations education. She has received numerous awards and recognitions for achievements, including the Dr. Olive Dickinson Award. She has been blessed with three beautiful children and seven grandchildren that make her life complete. Also presenting with Dr. Daphne is Emma Ansel the university, from the University of Guelph and Canterbury University in New Zealand. She has taught in New Zealand, Ontario, and Nunavut, and is currently the literacy specialist for KTCEA in Northern Alberta. She was a classroom teacher, literacy coordinator, and inclusive education teacher. She is a single mother to a six-year-old and has a passion for literacy and Indigenous education. She enjoys working with teachers on engaging students in effective and stimulating learning opportunities through land-based learning and tying into the classroom through literacy. So we're pleased today to have um, the journey of the KTCA Common Consistent Curriculum. Hanin Bozo Tansek Rakiawa. Okay, get can Matimapua. Thank you, first of all, to the uh, the beautiful song that was sung today. Miigwech, I really appreciate uh, the sharing of that song. Um, it just uh, makes your you know, heart feel good um, that we still have our traditions with us. Um, and for those that are in here, you're actually really lucky because you're, you're going to get a gift from all of us. <laughs> so Carmen's just over here. She will be handing out some gifts later. <laughs> Not now. You have to stay for the whole thing. <laughs> but um, uh, in essence of time, we have a lot to share. And so I won't take too much. Um, I'm going to be having Emma step up here in a few minutes, in a minute or so. But I just wanted to quickly share a little bit about um, KTC and then how we came to the um, common consistent curriculum. Um, back in um, the um, 2012, uh, around there, there was um, a director, his name was um, Billy Joe Labokan, and he was a director of education at that time, uh, and he's from the Lubicon Band, First Nation, one of the first, one of the bands that we serve, and uh, he and along with um, uh, the KTC uh, CEO, Al Rollins, um, they together had um, uh, noted that there wasn't services for the First Nations and the Métis Settlement, so they formed a, um, a partnership with the federal government and the province. It was very unique. It was, I think, one of the first in Canada to do a, a partnership. And so they both put monies in and they, they did a partnership agreement um, providing um, essential services to to uh, uh, six First Nation schools and four Métis Settlement schools in Northern Alberta. And, um, and so they hired specialists, they hired five specialists, and actually Emma was one of those specialists that was hired. Uh, another specialist that was hired at that time, his, uh, his title was outdoor ed um, uh, specialist. And so they provided services, they went out into the schools, they did numeracy, literacy, um, they did outdoor ed activities. Uh, and then from that, from from there, when they started to work on the authority, um, we kind of um, uh, 
those specialists became part of the authority. And uh, we continue to work closely with the uh, um, Northland School Division. We do have a, we do have a, a, a very close ties with that, with that uh, division, and um, we do still collaborate on certain certain um, activities. Um, so, um, what they what they noted was that um, the kids really thrived when they were brought out onto the land. They really thrived. Um, there was no behavioral issues. There was a, um, a lot of uh, excitement when they went out on the land. And um, the, the um, stories they would bring back to their parents, the parents were curious about what they were doing out on the land. So um, we knew that this was one way to reach the students. You know, we have, we do, like many First Nations have a, um, uh, issues with uh, low attendance, especially when you get into junior, senior high school. We also have, uh, you know, the grad graduation rate wasn't that great um, to begin with. So we knew that we had to reach those students. And so through that, we, we had to look at um, how, what are we teaching and how are we teaching? Um, and the, the at the time when we formed the authority, we had first looked at finance. Okay, we got to take over the teacher contracts. We have to take over all of the um, essential services that are needed. Um, what could be standardized? What could? What did we need to do? Of course, our goal was always to pay at the top rate. So we we were actually one of the highest paid, uh, highest paying teacher salaries um, in Alberta. Um, and so we looked at all everything. Um, for finance on the financial side, teacher contracts, um, um, and also um, <clears throat> in the office, uh, standardizing contracts, you know, for photocopiers and all those kind of things. So we brought those together, all the all the service providers, we, we reviewed them and we went with who we thought would best serve the communities. Um, and then we also looked at facilities and the maintenance and operation and so on. So we did an administrative agreement with each First Nation and, and we said we would run them. The schools will always belong to you. Anything on your nation will belong to you, but we will administer them. So that was put together in that first year. Um, so all of this was happening, but on the back burner was our student services and our curriculum and instruction. And so uh, in that year, once we stabilized everything um, uh, on our operational side, then we, we said we need to focus on what we're doing in, in the school, what are we teaching. That's the prime purpose they came together was because they wanted to look at um, how to improve the education and close that education gap. Uh, so that's um, uh, where curriculum and instruction came in. We formed a branch. We have five branches in our authority. One of the branches is curriculum and instruction. And so under curriculum and instruction, um, we have uh, uh, literacy, numeracy. We have a, a CTS, a curriculum and technology studies person. And we have, a, um, um, you have to remind me now, Emma. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and land-based learning, and then we also have um, educational technology. So we, we formed uh, that branch, and so their work, they started to look at it, and we hired a director to oversee that, and the director's task was, okay, we need to, we need to address curriculum. The chiefs, especially Chief Billy Joe, who has a master's degree in education, he was, he's now the chief of, of their First Nation. And he really um, uh, was a strong believer in land-based learning and Cree ways of knowing and bringing that back into the into this into um, part of the learning of the students. Um, the communities we serve had a really strong Christian base, and so we really had to be um, cognizant of that and move. Um, but at the same time, they were very much tied to the land. Like I said earlier, they do have. They do still make um, um, uh, go out onto the land to provide for their families. They still do a lot of hunting, fishing, and um, their freezers are full of their. You know, they they stock up their fridge, and and that's that's what they live off. Um, so we knew that was important, an important way of life that they did not want to lose. So with that, we came up with the land-based learning, and we have the camps um, that happen now. Um, and but we had to tie what was happening in the camps to curriculum because the teachers that we hired weren't getting it 
They would come, come and they'd say, okay, well, they're gonna do this, uh, this activity, but it wasn't tying into math. It wasn't tying into grade three reading or it, not, nothing was tying. So we had to look at it and say, okay, what is it that we're doing and how can we, we're not gonna change what we do on the land. That's, that's not non-negotiable, but what we need to do is change how we're meeting that we need to do pre and post um, lessons. And, um, and how is that, what kind of curriculum are we providing? Alberta curriculum um, is, is um, used to be like one of the highest standards in Canada. And um, it, uh, the um, very, um, the, the outcomes were, there's quite a number of outcomes in, in that curriculum. And so we said, we have to look at what is feasible for us and, and what, what is, what, is it that they need to get to the next grade and so that's the work that that we did um, and then we came up with our own curriculum so i'm going to turn it over to emma and then she'll start to walk us through that thank you So the first thing we ask our community members and elders and stakeholders is what do you think curriculum is? Um, and we came up, they came up with a variety of different responses. So we have the big binder, government enforced, everything you have to know. We had classrooms and we also had the land-based learning and on the land. Uh, so from that, um, we then walked through with our first group was what is the mandated curriculum and that originates with the what the ministry guides it is part of our funding it's the legal document it travels to the classroom and is taught by the teacher so it came back to one of those uh, a lot of things that have come up in presentations is getting outdoors but our curriculum i mean as teachers we're taught in the classroom we go to a university that gives us a degree it becomes um, something that we don't do. So, and the curriculum does lay out what our learners have to have for years um, to come. The lived curriculum is what is a unique, diverse for student and teachers. And this is what puts our students out on the land. So it encapsulates the hopes, dreams, motivations, and curiosities of our students and our elders and our community members for what they want their students to, to learn and have. Um, and it also allows student directed learning. And so with our common consistent curriculum, or as we call it, the CCC, this was encapsulated. So in the curriculum, it, it, each document outlines what's offered for all students, what's expected to learn, and the basic principles. As Daphne pointed out, the Alberta curriculum, um, it has recently gone under a new change and there's a lot of outcomes. We also had the problem with the curriculum and our, as Daphne had mentioned yesterday and Carmen, we have five nations and they are very spread out in Northern Alberta. Um, so, you know, um, some communities are 300 kilometers away from each other. So teachers in grade one in all different schools were teaching the curriculum, but they were teaching different subjects at different times and we have the familial connections between our communities so our kids and families would be moving and there'd be gaps in their learning because they might have been learning in social studies um, rocks and minerals for spring but in the new school that they're going through to in grade three they were learning solids liquids and gases so they had gaps in their learning and they didn't have all the language and the academic vocabulary that went along with it so we had holes um, so, and textbooks are not the curriculum. So this was the other thing, teachers would get their textbooks so they feel very safe with, I teach grade one or I teach grade 12, this is my math. I'm just gonna go put page one to 200. And so we had to move away from that. Do you want me to click So that's a little bit about how we, we started to look at what we needed to do in, uh, in re, uh, under the Alberta curriculum, you know, we as as many of you, in order to graduate, they have to you ha we have to do the pro, um, the school program declaration, which says you're going to abide by having certified teachers and um, 
and uh, teach the curriculum because they do have to do their uh, departmentals in um, in the in their uh, senior high years. Um, so uh, just going back a little bit to um, KTC, we had a um, uh, a session with 50 chief and council elders participants and we brought them together in the summer and in that time um, they went and said okay what is it that, what's important for us for education what are we going what are we striving for um, and there was a lot of discussion a lot of it was in the language it was in Cree um, the, the, the Cree is spoken a lot especially at our leadership meetings a lot of meetings are, are in full Cree so um, the, it was all in Cree what they were talking about and as a result they came up with um, with uh, uh, excellence in indigenous education um, and I, I first want to apologize I'm Blackfoot I'm not Cree and so they do teach me and I am learning conversational Cree but um, rather than uh, try to attempt to say all these without uh, uh, making a mistake um, I'm just going to read them in English, but what we do have is that they they really um, wanted to emphasize the language first. So they, everything was was their thoughts and what they wanted to see was in Cree, and then we interpreted into syllabics, and then we inter and then from there into English. So what it came out to was excellence in Indigenous education, and then they put. Um, they had five priorities in this. They had uh, governance. They had um, uh, partnerships, um, staff retention, and assets, like building up on the facilities that were aging out. We, they really wanted to build up and have a good quality environment for the students. And then, of course, student success. Um, so through that, they were um, the student success. The goal was to students are prepared for the future and have pride in their identity through the highest quality of instruction. And so the mission statement they came up with again. This was this was all in the language Nihiawiwin. Uh, we honor the vision of the, our elders and leaders by coming together as one single authority responsible for the education of our children. Education is the legacy we collectively leave. We, coll we collectively leave for the present and future generations. Our strength is in the richness of the land and uniqueness of our language, history, identity, and ways of being. Working closely with the members of the community, we are committed to ensuring traditional teachings are nurtured so that students know who and have pride in who they are. Our actions and decisions are centered on what is best for students. We value holistic learning environments that promote respect, discipline, belonging, goodness, love, and encouragement. Our schools foster student success, well-being, and lifelong learning. So that is, that is uh, the mission that they had come up with and it's it, it's so stated so beautifully in in the language um, but we translated that in into um, English and so that's where we the mission and how curriculum instruction they use this as a basis of what they're doing that was our board priority just so you can see it so when the mission statement was come up, we came up with, and this comes from what, just one of our nations, and we use this as a draft for all of um, KTCEA now. So the com it should be noted that the common consistent curriculum is continuously in draft format, meaning we do bring everyone back to the table in the spring and the summer, the elders, um, teachers in the different grades. We've got uh, PLC groups. I'm going to go into that to go over this, but this is what they said, our elders had said, was very important for our students to walk away from and walk away with, and this is the learning. So we've got the elders in the center, the land-based learning, healing, leadership, and storytelling. Those are pillars in our curriculum. Uh, then the students, and then all their, um, what the elders and community members want. To do this, 
and get everyone on the same page, we had to develop a project charter. And this was my boss, Terry Lynn Cook, who was actually supposed to be here, but she had emergency surgery, so I got thrown in. Um, so if I can't answer anything, I can, and you have questions about this, I can give you Terry Lynn's uh, email. So for the project charter, we had to have transparency throughout KTCA, and everyone had to be on the same page on what we were building and our goals. So we had to have sustainability and relevance for our students using what our elders were giving us. It had to be common and consistent for all students and teachers. Um, and this kept our mission and vision in sight and it created the transparency. So it just gives you an idea of what our purpose was um, for doing, making sure everyone was on the same page. So if someone leaves, um, we do in the North have turnovers so that we when someone came in we all had the same goals visions and we all understood what we were doing um, so and this covered our purpose the project overview the objectives the deliverables the what the organization and the responsibilities for each section was the critical success factor and the risks so we constantly go back to this and with the teachers to make sure that we're on the same page and that this is a living document that will keep going. So our plan to date has been, we've done, so we have developed a common language and identified essential learning outcomes. So we did use the Alberta curriculum and we had teachers come through and we did, we divided up into groups. We had grade one all the way to grade the first year we had to grade six. The second year we had until grade nine and we are just working on our high school um, side. And so these teachers all got to come together for a week with elders and look at the curriculum and say, what is essential that the government says that we have to do and, and why? From there, the elders worked with our teachers and said, okay, this is the Nihiawan way of knowing and being and these are ways that you can teach this or embed this in the students learning so they make connections um, and they all teachers also get the support along with um, anyone new on how to implement in the classroom so oh i should also say there is also a calendar now um, our curriculum is div uh, divided into three seasons we got fall winter and spring and the curriculum is divided from there and the teachers and elders got to decide when certain topics from the curriculum would best fit in with the knowledge upholding the standard the pillars which was uh, leadership storytelling healing and i'm forgetting the last one right now land-based learning thank you <laughs> From there, we also realized that teachers are going to need time to work together to start thinking of the Nihao way of knowing and being and prioritizing that and then infusing our curriculum into it. So in our project charter, we do have the first Monday of every month, all schools meet together. We, there's an early dismissal and via grades, we work together as groups and come up with lesson plans. Uh, we have land-based learning videos translated into syllabic, so it's actually printed on it um, for the different seasons and land-based learning that we can do. This happened because of COVID. We had to go uh, digital, uh, which actually ended up being very good. And now, right now, in our group, my group, because I work with the grade one to threes, we're working on holistic assessment. So how do you assess land-based learning um, and honor what students are bringing to the table, which has been a really neat, uh, and I'm gonna show you examples of that as well. So this is, this is just the grade one, but all this curriculum looks like this from grade one to grade nine right now. So this is the ELA. Um, because that's my wheelhouse, so I use that one. So as you can see, it's grade one. So in the orange means that's the fall. Blue means winter. Green means spring. So in our whole, and if it's red, which is on the side, you'll see there's a whole, it says Nihia way, ways of knowing. Those are what our elders share. 
And this constantly gets adjusted. We go in depth more based on our end of the year and saying, teachers coming in and saying, you know what, we're here, we're here, no, we didn't do this. And then the season, because it is important, especially with storytelling, there's certain stories that you cannot tell in other seasons and there's, well, trapping and hunting as well. So you can see on the left, so this is our new curriculum. Alberta's new, so they've changed, there's no, uh, AO, achievement outcome anymore. They've got the knowledge is organized idea, guiding question, learning outcome. Uh, it's been very interesting on a side note for uh, report cards this year. So there's the understanding skills and procedures and seasons. So teachers all got together this summer and they said the most important learning outcome is in bold. So these are the things that we are explicitly teaching. We're using the Nihao ways of knowing and being to teach that way. And then if it's in italics, it's a need to know you're teaching it through the explicit teaching. So it, it actually helps teachers now with um, prioritizing what they are teaching. And the nice thing about English language arts is it's everything. So it infuses through, you'll see grade one, you'll see at the top, science and social studies are the only two things that are in the fall. Math has, math is as well. There's certain how they go along and then Science for the winter is building things. Social studies, my world, home, and school. And we have times that the seasons end and new ones begin. So now all of our students um, in each grade up to grade nine are learning the exact same thing or the exact same topic at the exact same time. How it's being taught depends on how the teacher does it. We're infusing that we're using the Nihia ways of knowing and being to do these teachings with the end. You'll see land based learning. This is, I'm going to, because I don't have control and I can't just pull up the website, which was embedded in this. You guys can go to the ktcea.ca, right? And in it, you'll see um, along the top there is its curriculum and you can actually pull up can, grade one to grade nine, all of this. So the benefits, and I've kind of gone through this throughout, include... Um, it provides teachers and administrators with a guide for what student, students need to learn in order to be successful. And this is, it took in our communities and our stakeholders and our elders. They were the ones who drove this. Uh, it prevents the redundancies in instruction. It guards against gaps in students' learning. Um, and it assures what, te what is going to be most important. And our teachers get a say in that, which is really important because they are the ones that are in the classroom um, having to teach our children. It's easy to connect, to see the connections between the programs of studies. Um, it allows for a lot of collaboration. As mentioned before, because we are, so, we are so remote and so spread out, we can get into silos as teachers and teachers feel alone. So this does help against that. Um, so, and the understandings are there for our teachers our community members, um, our elders. Um, so when we take what the government says and we make it into a real language and create relevant for our students. So they are create, they're making connections. Um, and it, again, as mentioned, it's an evolving process. So we're constantly every year going back and adjusting this, which is a lot of teachers at first kind of rolled their eyes, um, but they are loving it and the elders are loving. We had uh, last June when things opened up again in Alberta, we actually had a bunch of teachers, administrators and our elders together for the first time in two years and everybody walked away and said, I gained so much from this and now I know this side and you know, I'm so glad we changed this topic to another, to this another season. So. How do we all know that this is happening in the classroom? Because this is the other thing. As mentioned, we are very remote. So our principals also have PLCs when all the teachers and grades have PLCs so that they are on the same page and they understand what they are looking for. So this is uh, just a copy of the principal walkthrough and it's a checklist. So it becomes part of the teacher's evaluations as well as um, honoring what it is that we are doing. This was exciting because with COVID, in, we were open and closed for a lot. Our, um, so we actually had to do a lot of stuff online. And this I took from my grade one to three group. We worked on a bird, 
animal bird challenge and how are we going to do this and how is it going to be assessed so our kids even though they were at home they could do things and this came from our common consistent curriculum this was our this is the beginning of our holistic assessment um, and how do we know that things are going to be taught so looking at the Nihao ways of knowing and being what are our teachers doing how and it's nice because all of our teachers are now working quite collaboratively together. Here's another one. This is the newest one that we're just working on right now, and this has to do with uh, setting snares to catch squirrels. Um, and so these are just some ideas that went, there was quite a few different ideas that teachers wanted to use from grade one to grade six. And how do we know what it was? and where would we do it so we had oral language tasks that were going to be uh, just looked at um, picture graphs i took out the writing one there we go so we also have so we our land-based learning camp um, we have this going on and we have one central location for all ktcea schools and most schools have their own land-based learning camps within their community. So students are exposed to experiential learning activities. Uh, there's the, the outdoor, the natural outdoor environment. It addresses the growing concern for conservation and sustainability of nature and cultural resources, especially when it comes to hunting um, and gathering. And um, we also get to get honor our different nations' uh, cultural ways which is very neat and our kids get to all come together. Right now, we have three camps that happen a year for all schools to come together. And we are working on um, making a fourth one. Is there anything you wanna add? So we had challenges. We started the CCC, the development of the CCC, after, so we had 2018 and 19, we worked with elders, we had lots of meetings finding out what they wanted, them going back to their communities and meetings, and then we had COVID. So anyone who worked in a school can understand the challenges. So we started the CCC, the implementation, and then we went all online. And it turned out when we went online, we needed to adjust our direction and work a lot more on training teachers on technology and the implementation of Google Classroom, Seesaw and all that stuff. Plus we also had a, uh, the turnover of teachers being so remote. There you go. We do have a video of our land-based learning at work. that we have here uh, is a culmination of a lot of hard work and vision of our leaders, our chief and council that sit on our board want uh, uh, KTCA board, the education to ensure that we're focusing on the heritage and the traditions of the, the Cree people from all the five nations. And so through that, we're offering uh, courses and uh, experiences for students so that they are aware of and, and to be proud and carry on those traditions in the future. I think this is a great experience for students because there is no other school division 
anywhere in Canada that does this with kids, bring them out on the land for this long and experience so many different different career options or, or experience so many different presentations? The protection, conservation, and sustainable management of the forest. And that is it in a nutshell. That's the main things that you need to know. That forestry is done in a sustainable, managed manner, not just random. You don't just randomly go out there and cut trees. You have to go and cut the trees in an area that has been managed, planned, and approved. So aircraft engines um, and car engines, they're a little bit different. The car engines, you don't see these fins. Um, this, these fins would be all closed in and it would be filled with water and coolant. And the coolant is designed there to keep the engine cool as the car is driving. But in an airplane, there's so much air traveling and they want to save weight on an airplane. So they remove all the cooling system except for these fins. Now the air goes through so fast that it keeps the engine cool as you're flying. Thanks. He makes a uh, guy need all of that. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, is it chest? From the chest? Mm -hmm. What's he need to read? <laughs> So it's called a plantain plant. They're edible, very nutritious, but they actually have the better flavor when they're small. Like the, when you get the bigger ones, they start to get a, a different taste to them, a, more like a potato starchy taste. My name is Peyton Thunder. I'm from a Tikmake school. White First Lake, First Nation, 4.59. Oh, what program did you sign up for? I signed up for the butcher slash chef program. How, how do you like it so far? Uh, it's pretty good, except uh, the fact that I had to wear a garbage bag on my head. Uh, I guess I love it so far. It's pretty far, though, our cabins. It's like quite a long walk from here. What's your favorite thing, like, about the whole place? Uh, my favorite thing? What excited you the most? Uh, mostly just Phil and his camera work and all the people he has to do his program and everything. And yeah, that's about it. Um, well, thank you for your time. Look forward to talk to you again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we're going to yeah. All right, and then, and then, okay, so give it a start. Yeah. <laughs> that's like the only thing that's easy to remember. We're going to skin just up to the back of the ears on it, right around, and then we're going to leave the head on with, with the fur. Because again, there, if you try and skin it out, you're going to have one angry taxidermist because they have special ways of uh, skinning out the skull and everything without damaging it and preserving as much as they can. So you actually have to leave the head on there for the taxidermist. Do you see the tents on the opposite side of where we are? 
Yes, we are. How is this similar? Huh? Okay. All right, so that's probably been about four minutes, so I think we better uh, kind of bring her back. Now, bring back slowly. Don't, don't go down too much. So it's going to automatically land. It's going to come back to the home spot. So that's um, uh, a video that was actually um, produced by the students. So the whole video was, was done by the students. Uh, we were in a partnership with SAIT. Uh, when we talk about those five, um, five uh, priorities of board set, one was partnership. So we look for partnerships all the time. So we partnered up with SAIT and they provided um, the instructors uh, and they all came out uh, to uh, and SAID is in uh, Calgary, and they they traveled quite a ways to come up to to our area and uh, stayed with us for the, all that whole time, and they loved it. I went out there. Um, they had prepared a, a traditional meal when I was out there, um, and the kids really enjoyed it. We had uh, I think 42 students. They earned uh, maybe uh, close to 160 credits, I believe. Um, there was a, a lot of learning that was happening there and forming of friendships and uh, it was it was really well um, well received by everyone and so SAIT has now made a commitment to continue to support us so we have the I think we had the butchering program and uh, we had uh, oh we also partnered up with Forestry Alberta so they came in and they had a, a person there um, and then our specialist you saw some of our specialists there Paul is a CTS Guru, he actually is from Ontario. Paul and Emma are both from Ontario, so they came out and they they they're working with us, and uh, um, you know we really appreciate the the work that they do. So we try to incorporate the land based learning in everything we do as part of the learning. And Cree, uh, the Cree language is is one where uh, is is so important. We put it. We have five branches in KTC and then the, at the top is the superintendent office and in there is how is the Cree language because Cree has to has to be part of everything that we do uh, it doesn't matter if you're working at central office or in the schools on the buses custodians everybody has to be speaking the language and so we try to incorporate that as much as we can um, and our band minutes are in, um, I mean, our board minutes, you know, we have uh, board minutes published. So now we do our board minutes in Cree and in English. So they're both recorded. Um, and so they, the board members can either listen to it in Cree or, or in English. Anyway, thank you for being with us. Really appreciate the, the warm reception we've had in the past couple of days here. And uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, we're more than happy to answer them. I do know we're, 12.18, I think we're supposed to be eating pretty soon here, but where's uh, our moderator? <laughs>
and it's part of what they're uh, developing as well and how to incorporate it and uh, it is being infused in there. You may not have heard it there, but it is part of a, a lot of the activities that happen at the camp. Yes, yeah. I was wondering about that because if I did that in my community, that's the first thing I think of yeah. is I got to develop the language component of what we're going to be teaching. For sure. Right, and that's a lot of work. So, and we're working on right now because the five nations, they are diff they're not different dialects, but there is what are we going because we're going to go with one common consistent and adjust it from there. So the uh, like Lorraine and Connie are working with um, all the elders and community members to decide um, what is our one dialect right. that we're going with. So you're just kind of beginning at this stage? We're I would say we're not at the beginning. No. We're we're not at the end. So the first the first thing we did prior to the curriculum was the language. So we had a lot of uh, we did the language app. I don't know if I, you were in yesterday. We'd have an elders speak app, um, and and language is still spoken quite a bit in the in the community, and the elders um, uh, and many of the staff that work there are fluent. So there is there is still a lot of language there, but we we wanted to try to work on that. So that was actually the first thing we worked at, and then we we had started on the work on the curriculum uh, soon after that. No, miigwech. We'll take one more question before lunch, and can we go to microphone three? Yeah, Leo Matatwaban, um, uh, Saint Anne's Indian Resident School survivor, Fort Albany, First First Nation. Northeastern Ontario. And uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, I acknowledge the traditional territory and the leadership of this area and uh, what you do everybody. And uh, I lost my language <laughs> at eight, eight years old and I was able to recover 50% of it. I speak it, but I don't write it. And uh, I lost my spirit as well, to the brainwash, electric chair, so forth. And uh, so we managed to pursue our uh, traditional belief and, uh, and recover that as well, with the help of my uh, parents, late parents, and uh, the, the elders that went away continued their uh, journey. I acknowledge that. And um, and um, I'm on the Board of Education, LEA, in the, in the area. And uh, with the corporate structure, I found it that the legislation suppress our uh, natural law. Because the facilitators are non-natives. They went to get their legal certification with the law society and so forth. But with their training, education, they never learned natural law. And I acknowledge the elders that were praying and sharing their, uh, their wisdom in natural law. So I request to that. And um, and uh, and I work with my First Nation. I've been in uh, community development in different capacities, but this is not consultation. This is engaging to engage. I have a couple of red flags, not to your presentation, but maybe, <laughs> and. Um, because I believe that our people, our grassroots people, are should be part of that decision, decision making process. And that's, so with that, the challenge, I didn't see the mental health, the second last page. And uh, as well as you stated that uh, 
you would guard against gaps. And also to consider the local content of mental health. So in our area and probably across Canada, with the mental health, we have the suicide. We address the suicide, some of it, and, uh, and uh, our people are, are able now to identify themselves uh, two-spirited. So that, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. But there's the other part as well, but there's so many issues, but it's the sexual abuse that we've yet to address. So, so with that, the language education conference, the literacy, language is a literacy, math, finance, whatever. What about the sexuality literacy? Uh, there was no mention of sexuality literacy because our young people, <clears throat> especially our young girls are being raped. Mm -hmm. Our young men don't show respect. So we, we do have to uh, uh, address the roles and responsibility, yes. But still, we need that sexuality literacy. And uh, it's not mentioned yet. So that's my concern. Thank you. Watch it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your good words and your observations. And um, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of healing that has to happen. And if you notice that one of the priorities that the elders had picked when they were saying what's what is their priorities with this or, or organization one was healing they know that there had to be a lot of healing because because there were there was a lot of uh, uh trauma that our or uh, uh families endured over the years um there was a lot of uh, racism and uh um and there was also abuse, you know, some some went to residential schools and some of the communities uh, hear stories that they they went deep into the bush and they stayed in a bush. Uh, and so some of them were able to avoid um, being put into residential schools. Uh, so there was uh, a lot of uh, stories around that. And I think I think uh, we know that trauma informed schools is very important. And that is something that we've been looking at as well. Um, we do provide a lot of um, supports. One of the things we, we focused on uh, was under student supports or student services. Um, and um, we do utilize a lot of the JP and the funding that we get. Um, but we have, uh, uh, we have uh, wellness workers we hired. We actually, um, it's very hard to get therapy out in, in the in the north remote so we what we are working is developing local capacity so we hired individuals from the community where we provided we went we went through a lot of training with them and now they're placed in the schools and they're working with the students um so uh, we're i think we're looking at how we can also address um we, well we had to deal with this right in the beginning there was a lot of suicide in one nation and so we had to really network with other um, organizations with health um, and with the uh, local communities to address the suicide and, and make sure that we were providing appropriate services. So that is is ongoing. And as you know, when there's one one um, suicide in, in the youth, it's quickly followed by another one. And so how do you prevent that? You have to have a plan in place. So we've been working on a plan. Uh, we started drafting uh, one um, and we still have a bit of work to go. Um, but the best thing is to work at each individual community because each community has different services and different um, uh, direction or not, uh, people that they utilize. And so it's more by community by community. But uh, uh, I thank you for your good words. And I know that that is uh, uh, all of these things. We just actually, we were operating, um, we, we, we were only in as a fool with everyone under us at uh, for a year and 
seven months when COVID hit. So it was like all our good plans, you know, kind of had to be halted for a while and then we restarted. And actually this year was the first year where we're actually back in full operation. So, um, but we did, we did continue to address the needs, um, you know, the best way we could virtually and, uh, and um, providing support some, um, uh, you know, in various different ways. We, we would deliver food packages to the homes because we couldn't feed them. So then we would put food packages. Uh, we would deliver the, the learning packages. We had Google Classrooms. Uh, so we tried to reach them as much as we could, but I think COVID really did, did a number on everybody. And uh, we, you know, everybody just, uh, I think had to adjust. Anyway, thank you. I know we're kind of running out of time here. <laughs> no, no problem. On behalf of the Chiefs of Ontario, Dr. Daphne and Emma can, uh, can thank you enough for all you shared um, and just, being a former administrator, appreciating all the coordination and planning that it took even to just to make this happen. So, uh, miigwech. Nahal, um, great presentations. Hope everybody really enjoyed your breakout sessions. Um, like I said, it's really hard because uh, there's so many great breakout sessions happening over here. It's like you want to go visit that one and you want to go visit this one. And then, you know, like they can all use their own hour and a half, you know, for everybody to be able to hear that good information. But that does bring us to lunchtime, everybody. So we encourage everybody, uh, make sure that uh, our elders, people with accessibility needs uh, uh, have an access to uh, to the food first and then we invite everybody else to come back uh, to get some food so we are going to extend our lunch a little bit so we're going to be a little bit flexible with the agenda so we will be back here uh, to start our afternoon session um, that will be at 1 p uh, no quarter after 1 1 15. so once again everybody 1 15 p.m we're going to come back and resume with our agenda so i hope everybody has a great meal um, if you need to check out, now is a good time to do that. If you are leaving, uh, we really uh, just got to say miigwech gibijayak. Thank you for coming. Om gomzik. Uh, so when you're going home to your travels, make sure you travel safely. Uh, keep an, uh, an eye on the weather. Uh, make sure that you travel safely and according to the uh, weather conditions. So everybody enjoy your lunch and we'll see everybody back at uh, quarter after one. Miigwech. All right, everybody. So I'm going to be calling everybody back. It is currently quarter after one. Um, and we're going to get started with the uh, latter part of our agenda, the afternoon session that we have for day three at our Language and Education Forum, hosted by the education sector from the Chiefs of Ontario. So um, everybody is, looks well fed. It looks like, you know, everybody enjoyed the meal. Um, I've seen some people putting some of those pops into their purses. So. That's good, take some home with you. Um, but yeah, so once again, um, just uh, really want to put a shout out to all the presenters, all the speakers today, um, yesterday, the day before as well. A lot of really good information. I see a lot of amazing conversations that people are having. I'm um, talking about how they can implement, you know, some of these strategies, some of these um, opportunities back uh, in their home communities and for the organizations that they work for. So really great. Um, but now we're going to get started. So I'm gonna, if I can ask everybody's attention, we still have an afternoon uh, that we, we are going to be getting through. Um, this afternoon, I'll just give a rundown of what it looks like. So uh, we're going to have an overview of post-secondary education. So uh, a presentation from one of our uh, policy analysts from the Chiefs of Ontario. Um, right after we do um, have this presentation, we're going to have more breakout sessions. And I will line out uh, where these sessions are and what the topics are of these presentations. Um, and then after our breakout sessions this afternoon, we're going to get into our final keynote speaker, uh, which will bring us to the end of the day. So we have three more blocks of, of pre presentations of, um, you know, breakout sessions and another keynote. And then that will wrap us up for the day. So I appreciate everybody who is um, sticking around and to all of our, um, our um, participants online, just acknowledging you and 
Um, you know, and if you have any more questions at any point, um, if you can direct them online, and we will uh, have our, our Chiefs of Ontario staff to answer those questions and to post them online as well. So uh, we're going to be getting started, and I will introduce our next uh, presenter, and that is um, Joanna Musso Cron. So she is the Chiefs of Ontario Policy Analyst, and will be doing an overview of post secondary education. So um, Joanna is Anishinaabe of Fort William First Nation. Um, Joe's combined live experience and education and training provide her with a strong knowledge of First Nation traditions, cultures, and values. Joe is a qualified teacher and has a Master of Arts uh, and English degree. Joe recently joined the Chiefs of Ontario Education Sector in November and is currently focusing her efforts on post-secondary education and education transformation files. So everybody, let's give a warm welcome uh, to Joanna Amuso Kran. Uh, we'll welcome you up and look forward to your presentation. Um. Is this thing on? Nice. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the last half of the last day. You have made it, you're amazing. <laughs> I thank you for being here and learning alongside of us. Um, I am new to the scene as was just announced and a little brief bio was given of me. Um, so yeah, my name is Johanna Musokram, but I do usually go by Joe. I just find it's easier for spelling and pronunciation purposes, but call me whatever you want. I am originally from the North. Uh, my traditional territory is Fort William First Nation. That's near Thunder Bay, Ontario. But I have lived and worked all over Northwestern Ontario, including Thunder Bay, Sulacau, Ignace, and even Pekanjikum First Nation. And today I will be providing you with an overview of the post-secondary education final report. So, oh, do I have a clicker? Uh, can you get it? Yeah. Okay, that's looking good so far. So we have a post-secondary engagement final report and I will just tell you quickly how it started. In 2017, the federal government indicated that it would be construct conducting a review of post-secondary programs that support Indigenous post-secondary students. In response, the AFN passed a resolution calling on the federal government to commit to a First Nation-specific review of post-secondary programs. The federal government and the AFN reached an agreement and the AFN began a six-month post-secondary review process. The AFN post-secondary review committee recommended that new regional models to support First Nations post-secondary education be developed and directed by First Nations and or regional and treaty organizations. Sorry, my throat's a little scratchy. In 2019, the federal government committed 7.5 million nationally over three years for First Nations to conduct a post-secondary engagement process. The engagement funding was meant to support First Nations within each designated AFN region across the country to develop comprehensive and integrated First Nations post-secondary education models that will be accessible to all First Nations. The post-secondary engagement process began in April of 2019. However, the Ontario region did not receive funding to support the engagement process until March of 2020. This delay in funding along with the engagement, oh, pardon me, along with the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic significantly pushed back the intended timeline of the engagement process. Um, the Chiefs and Technical Table on Languages and Learning formerly called the First Nations Education Coordination Unit agreed that engagement would be conducted by provincial territorial organizations, independent and unaffiliated First Nations, and that coup would support the activities of these groups. 
Here's a little visual of our post-secondary engagement committee. We had members and representative, representatives from each of these beautiful affiliations. The, pur <clears throat> the purpose of the post-secondary engagement is to develop new post-secondary education models that provide sufficient resources, support First Nations post-secondary learners, communities, and institutions, and allow for flexibility to accommodate the diversity of needs among learners, communities, and institutions. They need to be culturally appropriate. And finally, they need to align with First Nation treaty rights to education. The first task of the engagement process was to organize a post-secondary engagement committee. The vision of the committee was that it would be organized by coup and the members would guide the direction and identi identify what is needed from coup to support their engagement. The PSC committee consisted of representatives from Six, Na Six Nations, the Anishinaabeg Nation, Mississaugas of the Credit, Sagamak, Anishinaabe Aski Nations, Anishinaabeg Nation is in there twice in my notes, the Indigenous Institutes Consortium, and Independent First Nations and Ga Grand Council Treaty 3. Um, I thought this would just be a good a little visual for you guys to understand Ku's role and Ku's lines of authority. You may have already seen this slide when Julia presented it, but you can see there at the bottom is circled the PSC Engagement Committee, and this is how things are moved through everything we do. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ku's role in all of this has been to support the committee and their representatives in the engagement work. The committee met on a bi-weekly basis. In the meetings, Ku was tasked with inviting stakeholders to provide information on post-secondary, which included figures from Onika, OSAP, Indigenous Services Canada, and several Indigenous student services from institutions across the province. Part of our role included developing research instruments. For example, we created a student survey we also assisted some organizations with their research initiatives. For example, we hosted focus groups. We also developed several initiatives to support the work being done in the community. We coordinated a session at the request of the committee to discuss other regions' engagements. Uh, the session included Alberta, Quebec, and the Maritimes. Ku was tasked with the development of supplemental reports, which I will discuss later in this presentation. Lastly, Ku has been responsible for compiling the final report. Here we have identified uh, several stakeholders who all have a vested interest in uh, our, our initiatives. Here's an example of our stakeholder map. It includes current and former students, administration, education counselors, community members, indigenous institutes, parents and guardians, post-secondary institutions, provincial territorial organizations, and ch children in care. Each of these stakeholders had and have a vested interest in Indigenous post-secondary post education, and each has directly or indirectly contributed to the final report. This is just a quick visual of our various methods and engagement initiatives. So we used focus groups, we used policy analysis, information sessions, document analysis, surveys, and interviews. This is the outline of the sections of the final report, and this is just a little visual to give you a sense of what makes up the final report. The final report outline was developed by the post-secondary engagement committee based on their engagement in their own communities and with their own um, groups. Early in the background section of the report, we identify the purpose of the engagement, background information on Assembly of First Nations post-secondary engagement, the regional approach used within the province, and the broad themes that stood out throughout the engagement process, which includes the following ideas. First, Nation, First Nations education is a lifelong endeavor. Education is an investment, not a cost. First Nations learners have an inherent and treaty right to education. And finally, the Government of Canada is responsible for remedying the failures of discriminatory federal education policies and programs. The recommendations were developed by the committee based on their engagement. Ku hosted two sessions with the committee to discuss broad recommendations. Next, the report identifies methodologies of the research conducted, including features of the research, multiple methodological approaches, the framework guiding the research, 
and the use of figures and logic models. The background literature section of the report includes the following, federal program review, provincial program review, literature review, relation to Bill S3, and input from children in care. Finally, in the report, we have included executive summaries from the committee members, as well as a summary of the Indigenous Student Services Survey, summaries of the committee meeting partners, a socioeconomic report, and a data governance report. These are all the supplemental reports. I've mentioned some of them. This is just a visual to help cement your learning. Ku developed and contracted several su supplemental reports to complement the final report. The socioeconomic report was written by two economists, Dr. Christine Neal and Dr. Melanie O'Gorman. The report forecasts the economic benefits of aligning First Nations educational attainment to the same level of First Nations. Spoiler alert, if we get First Nations learners to the same level of educational attainment as non-First Nations learners, it actually saves the government money. Finally, we also gained input from children in care. We hosted focus groups with former children in care. The outcomes were not surprising based on the current literature. The group spoke to disconnection, the disconnection of being removed from their communities, and the subsequent disruption to learning about the post-secondary student support program and other information about financial assistance programs for First Nations youth. So children, when removed in, from their home communities and from their resources and placed into care, they also then have a disconnection between learning about post-secondary funding. An extensive literature review was conducted, not only of Canadian academic and grey literature, but also that of the USA and Australia, other comparable nations. In terms of data sovereignty, I will identify here one major challenge to start this project, which was even determining how many First Nations students were enrolled in post-secondary education. We don't have any one resource or body that confirms an exact figure. We have piecemeal evidence from First Nations themselves and from institutions, but the government does not track this and uh, we think that's a problem. We also don't know a complete figure for the graduation rate of First Nation students. What we found was multiple sources of data not accessible or owned by the people for whom the data is meant to represent. We thusly wrote a short report on the importance of data that is First Nations owned, controlled, accessible, and possessed. The principles of vocab for anyone who did that training. Lastly, the policy review report was conducted to understand how the post-secondary student support program has been functioning. The decision to analyze these policies stems from a disconnect between community level policies and national guidelines. While the national guidelines appear to be open and accessible, limitations in the federal program, i.e. funding levels, force communities to develop internal policies for the distribution of already limited and insufficient funding. The remaining slides focus on the recommendations set forth by the committee. There were five broad categories for the recommendations and those are post-secondary cost funding, transitional programming, administration, informational, and relationships related recommendations. At the beginning of the recommendations, the report enforces the condition that all recommendations brought forward in this report must be implemented in a manner that is consistent with the following. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, First Nations Inherent Treaty and Aboriginal Rights, First Nations control of First Nations education, the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission's final report, and finally, First Nations principles of lifelong learning, including holistic, whole student approaches to well being and any pre existing and future education agreements that are to come. So, as I mentioned, the first uh, broad recommendations. I can't provide you all of the recommendations from the report because we'd be here all day. So I'm gonna give you a little, a little sample. 
First Nations post-secondary systems must provide fair and equitable funding to First Nations learners that is based on student post-secondary need. Student need is defined as the cost associated with post-secondary institution attendance. So this is also things like travel and connectivity and resources that maybe are not traditionally included in tuition costs, but are living, ex ex um, living expenses. Uh, transitional programming. First Nations post-secondary support systems must focus on supporting transitions. There's a heavy emphasis on the various transitions that we see um, for First Nations learners, and these transitions include from secondary to post-secondary, the transition from post-secondary into the workforce and future careers, uh, the transitions involved with non-traditional paths to post-secondary, including transition programs for mature students, students with families, and for students continuing with education and lifelong learning, such as professional degrees and graduate degrees. First Nations post-secondary support systems must be developed from the First Nation up through nation-based principles and expertise at the discretion of each individual First Nation. First Nations must have authority and control to determine and implement their own post-secondary support system. The government's role must be limited to financial administrator only. First Nations post-secondary support programs must include funding to develop, implement, and maintain a First Nations developed and controlled app or database for First Nations students to access easy to understand information on post-secondary programs. In our imaginings, this app also has other little resources like mental health resources. It might have success stories from other First Nations students who have attended post-secondary. It would just be a database run by us, controlled by us, that First Nations learners would have access to to support them in their post-secondary endeavors. Now we're gonna look at the recommendations that relate to relationships. And the first relationship we examine is from First Nation to First Nation. First Nations post-secondary support programs must include funding to develop, implement, and maintain capacity for communities to develop, maintain, and enhance relationships with other communities, including to build mentorship opportunities for students, access or promote professional development and training, share resources and strategize, create forums for discussion and support for post-secondary personnel, promote community well-being, and ensure support programs reflect diverse First Nations perspectives and needs. The next relationship recommendations relate to Indigenous institutes. The capacity of Indigenous institutes must be leveraged at every opportunity to promote First Nations education. All levels of government must increase access to Indigenous institutes. Funding to develop, imp implement, and maintain the Indigenous Institutes Consortium model, focusing on core operating grants for institutions, providing, for, providing stability for Indigenous Institutes. The next relationship we want to look at is the Government of Canada. The Government of Canada must provide predictable and consistent needs-based funding for First Nations post-secondary systems. The federal government must work with provincial counterparts to provide adequate connectivity to all First Nations in Ontario. The Government of Canada must adjust the Canada Student Loans Program to a grants-only based system for First Nations students and include a full debt forgiveness program for past First Nations students. First Nations stu students should never need or be required to take a loan from the Government of Canada. And we're not just uh, singling out Canada. You're up next, Ontario. You got some responsibilities here too. The government of Ontario must take responsibility for its role in First Nations education and commit to upholding its treaty and con constitutional responsibilities to First Nations. It must work collaborative, collaboratively with the federal government to provide ad adequate connectivity to all First Nations in Ontario. It must adjust the OSAP program, the Ontario Student Assistant Program, to a grants-only based system for First Nations students and include a full debt forgiveness program for past First Nations students. 
First Nations students should never need or be required to take a loan from the government of Ontario. And then finally, we want to um, look at our recommendations to post-secondary institutions. Post-secondary institutions in Ontario must take responsibility for their role in reconciliation with First Nations and commit to shifting power and benefits to First Nations, including but not limited to investment in First Nations students and institutions through free tuition as an acknowledgement of the significant benefits institutions have and continue to receive when they have First Nations learners, to build institutional capacity through diversity and efforts of reconciliation. Requiring all professors, students, and staff to complete a mandatory learning component on First Nations and reconciliation, including the residential school system. Increasing remote learning opportunities that would allow students to remain in their home communities. And these are just a sample of some of our recommendations that we have so far. There will be more in the final report when it is re released. Um, at this point, I want to get some of your feedback. I want to also check for learning. As you guys know, we we're, we're education guys. We got to make sure that everyone's marinating on this information. So I invite you please to visit slido.com and you can join with the code 1110439. And I also have an actual slide that has that information and the QR code. So please, if you have a device now, please join in on the slido. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quiz you. Everybody in, most people in. Seeing some phones still up, so I'll let you grab those QR codes and we can slowly get started. The question that I hope is coming up on your phones also and that you can answer if everything is going right, um, that I want you to consider and to rank um, what you consider to be the three most important recommendations to implement from the presentation. And I'm gonna go back in these slides just to give you a little reminder of even the topics, but just think of which ones stood out to you. Was it how we restructure or how we hope to restructure OSAP? Was it how we hope to restructure that First Nations students should never have to take a loan from the government of Canada? What stood out to you as being very important and maybe rank a couple of them, two, three, more than one, that's the baseline. And like I said, I will go back just to remind you of the topics of the recommendations. So the first recommendation was just that um, all of the recommendations will go forward by adhering to all of our other um, reports that are already exist and all the ones yet to come. So that's just covering our bases, making sure that nothing's done without the recognition of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, any inherent treaty and Aboriginal rights, and calls to action, uh, and general First Nations principles of lifelong learning. That was the first one. Maybe that was important to you guys. Let me know. Uh, Post-secondary cost funding was meant to just acknowledge that we want fair and equitable funding to First Nations learners that is based on student post-secondary need and that includes uh, the cost of living. We also have a heavy emphasis on the need for transitional programming so if you thought that was a good recommendation put it in your top three. Uh, the transitional programming is meant to support all types of transitions that First Nations learners would have including that from secondary to post-secondary uh, post-secondary to the workforce, non-traditional paths, and nerds like me who go on to get graduate degrees because we just love learning. There's some administration um, recommendations, and there's an emphasis that all of these recommendations should be developed from the First Nation up 
and through First Nations-based principles and expertise at the discretion of each First Nation. So it's really about sovereignty in administration. There was some recommendations relating to the informational element. Um, this was the one relating to an app or database. If you think that's a really helpful recommendation that might be helpful to First Nations learners, put it in there. You can even just say the app one. Just give me a little identifier. And then finally, all of the relationships ones. If you remember any of the re recommendations that related to um, the different relationships First Nations learners have with First Nation to First Nation, Indigenous Institutes, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and post-secondary institutions. So I I'm hoping that some good answers are coming in. And if you can't remember like a full sentence of the recommendation, just try to identify it. Like, oh, the OSAP one, I thought was a good recommendation. The app one. I think you need to mute. Uh, oh, they can't. And, now you, and now I can't let you do it? Sorry. There. There. So here's your ranking tool. Got loan for goveness. It's it's perfect. We know what you mean. We love it. Equitable funding, relationships with indigenous institutes. Man, you guys were really listening. You must have been doing really well up here. I was very nervous. Definitely seeing a, some trends here, some themes. These are, in general, um, very broad recommendations, but the hope is that each First Nation will come up with their own even more specific recommendations as they forge their own um, funding agreements with the various levels of government. Maybe one or two more minutes, just I see there's still a couple people still typing, but I think we get the general idea. Thank you so much for your feedback and input. This will help us as we continue to finalize the report. We can see what everyone's really, what's everyone, what everyone has on their radars. And that brings us to the next steps and let's wrap this bad boy up. So finally, we do want to finalize the report. Uh, that is the hope. It is nearly done, but we are waiting on two executive summaries from uh, two people from our post-secondary engagement committee. I will not name them here, but you know who you are. <laughs> Get them into us. We want to finalize this thing. We're ready. The, oh, we got some music going on. 
we're not partying yet. I have two more things to say. Then we want to review the final report. Um, we want to push it up to the leadership council, but that will also be dependent on um, when we are able to get those last executive summaries. So uh, depending on when the outstanding executive summaries are submitted, the final report will either pass through the leadership council for review and tentative approval to allow communities to move forward forward with funding negotiations, or it will go straight through to the chiefs in assembly if we don't get it in as timely a manner as we hope, because we want to get it to the chiefs in assembly so they can pass any resolutions and any other things that are needed. Um, that will be at the next all chiefs assembly sometime this year. I don't even remember when that is. Maybe Julia knows. That'll be in June. Yeah, so we can get those executive summaries by then. Come on, guys. And then once it has gone through all of us and our bodies and the leadership council, chiefs and assembly, it, only then do we submit the report to Indigenous Services Canada. Finally, once that is all complete, uh, we'll just be focusing on implementation. So we'll be focusing on developing those regional models, because again, these recommendations are just broad recommendations, but we hope for each region to develop their own uh, recommendations and uh, inputting these regional models. So I think that's where we're at right now, just kind of waiting, but ready to go right we got the thing loaded we've got like 112 pages or something at this point so it's it's a uh, it's it's pretty good so far and that is um that's about it that, that's all i have for you guys so thank you so much for being so attentive even after lunch and any additional comments or questions please email me joe slash johanna my alter ego musocron at coup.org that should be all of the emails are just at coup.org so easy to remember, just remember our first name, last name, at coup.org. So you can ask me, Angel Miracle, who you might have seen floating around here, and or Julia. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So we could take some, uh, uh, we have time to take up a couple of questions if you like. Um, I'm not sure if there's any in the Slido, um, <clears throat> but I did want to mention that when Patrick made his presentation this morning about the First Nations Lifelong Learning Table, he did mention that we were looking at expanding the, uh, the, the table out to include adult education and post-secondary education. So just so you know that part of the next steps here is to utilize that report once it is finalized and approved by the Chiefs and Assembly to build that relationship with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities within Ontario as well. So we are really counting on this report to really ramp up our activity on the post-secondary side of things. Okay, I'll look and see if there's any questions on Slido, but certainly if you have any questions, please do go to the mic. I'm just here to support Jo just because she's relatively new and I don't want anyone to stump her with any I'm very kind of green. <laughs> I inherited this report. It was actually completed by our great Dr. Natalie Snow, who is still around. She still, she still likes us, but she's just on to new cool academic things. So that's the only reason she's not the one here presenting her research, but I'm taking it over. So I'm pretty new to it. I don't, she knows more than I do, but I'm learning. Um, it was also worked on very extensively by um, Amanda, Amanda Bruce, Amanda Bruce, who was scooped up by the AFN. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's clapping from the AFN table over there. <laughs> yeah, so Amanda moved on to the bigger and better things at the AFN, and uh, Natalie did move on to academics. But we are carrying the, their torch forward with this, uh, with this, report yes uh, right microphone too awesome you did a great job joe by thank the way. you so much <laughs> um my question isn't actually anything to do with the report um i've been asked by our education manager to bring forward uh the struggles that we've been having with uh post-secondary just at institutions specifically two in ontario um that are not uh giving us invoices i've been hounding them for months 
I've had to go through a whole bunch of different um, venues. I've tracked my 20 some odd email phone call, whatever, with one particular institution. And she said, could we have some support? Could, is there something that, you know, who could do to support with I, I, something put out there to post-secondary institutions about like timely manners? Because then we're getting, uh, I had students, uh, one whose OSAP loan is on hold because we haven't paid an invoice but we haven't paid an invoice because we haven't received an invoice even though I've been reaching out to them since October, right? Like the, these, are, these are the issues. And then I have post-secondary students who have families who are waiting for access to their money. So I don't know if there's anything, and this is not for you, don't worry. I know you said you're green, it's, so, it's okay. No, I got this one. <laughs> oh, good, if there's, some, if there's something we could do collabor collaboratively or collectively to you know, get some momentum here so that our students then don't have all these late payments and access to the money that they need. Yeah, so your question I think even addresses kind of two of the main points that we raise in our recommendations. Uh, and just broadly, um, because I can't give you all of the recommendations right this second, but they will be available to everyone. There's, there's many for each category. But in general, um, the hope is to have a much more comprehensive relationship with the post-secondary institutes. So either forging um, stronger relationships with like existing staff or like taking additional measures to get post-secondary institutes with their indigenous services up to, up to snuff because most post-secondary institutions do have indigenous services, but we need to get them interacting with the First Nations communities of the students who come there to use them. So I think it'll just be helpful if we can get more communication between the two, uh, especially indigenous services of post-secondary in, uh, institutions. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. And we got another one at number two. Hit me. <laughs> me <good. laughs> um, so I'm talking about funding for students. Um, and of course, you know, I'm from Treaty 3 in Northwestern Ontario, and I, I'm friends with a lot of people from the Northern uh, Reserves, remote reserves. And I have not made it to post-secondary yet, um, but I have a lot of friends that have, and a lot of friends that have lost funding due to the grade standards, and they're not meeting the standards that have been set for access to funding. And it, the reason behind the, um, the lower grades is being so far from home, being in the city away from their own people and struggling to find their community out there in the schools. And a lot of post-secondary education institutions also end up only uh, taking in First Nation students from urban centers. Um, for that reason, because they also have higher grades than we do up north because we have the lack of access and a lack of um, education um, up there. And so my question is like, is there gonna be like support for those students that have lost the funding? Um, and uh, another one, I forget what it was, but yes. Uh, so many of my friends have lost funding and have had to have their either parents, grandparents, or drop out of school because of that reason. And like they struggle as it is being so far and um, losing themselves in the city mm -hmm. and meeting the wrong crowds or something like that. Like it's so unsafe for us to be down there and have to meet this grade expectation. So. Pardon me, what was your name again? Kieran Davis. Thank you so much for the question, Kieran, because you're hitting on so many recommendations that we address. Um, this is why we investigated uh, when I was talking about the cool background uh, academic literature and the government stuff that we were examining. Um, we were examining specifically the post-secondary student support program, which is the government that passes from the federal, or sorry, the, the funding that passes through the federal government to our First Nations. And yeah, sometimes these funds, because they're already insufficient and they are not well structured, it, it's, it comes down to an issue at the community level and at the band level on how our bands are distributing these funds because there's already not enough and it's already not well structured. So 
this is something that the report will address specifically and the recommendations uh, we hope to build out from there that each First Nation will have recommendations um, and how they want to handle these things better at the community level because yeah the, as it exists right, right now there are lots of um, funding models in First Nations that are controlled and decided by the First Nation itself that are kind of punitive and it's 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 a deterrent to learning uh when you know that if you have a bad semester you might not get funding again and that is uh, explicitly addressed in the report so i thank you for your question and i'm glad i got to flex that yeah one other one other thing that i would add there kieran is that um you'll notice that one of the recommendations that joe talked about was to really advocating to get more programming in first nation communities so you don't have to go out to those um to those urban centers connectivity that's what i meant by connectivity yeah mm -hmm. so resources um and even that's that's a responsibility also of the institution itself of the university or of the college that they need to keep their online learning options available so First Nations can learn in their own communities. But then there's also the responsibility on the provincial and federal governments to make sure that that can happen with the infrastructure, to put the infrastructure in place to allow that connectivity. Because as it exists right now, we have a um, pretty flawed internet and um, it's not a great system to work from home and stay in community as it exists right now. So it is the responsibility of the institutes to accommodate for that. It's the responsibility of the Canadian and Ontarian governments to build up that infrastructure so that more First Nations learners can stay in their own community and do some learning online. I think we're good, yes. <laughs> I'm not done yet. Just kidding. Oh, oh I'm, I'm okay. kidding. Joe wants more questions. No, I'm, I'm super done. <laughs> super done. And I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, I had a really good feedback. He challenged me. I love it. Thank you so much for your listening ears. And oh, that's the teacher in me. <laughs> All right. Let's give a round of applause. Good presentation. We much for the information. Uh, great questions as well uh, from the audience. So, uh, really important work and lots to consider. Uh, you know, for our for our young people. For um, are people who are looking to pursue post-secondary education. I'm a big advocate for post-secondary education myself, um, so it's really important that we are always uh, keep an eye on it and uh, making sure we're staying on top of things to find ways to best support our students, you know, from our communities. Good stuff. Okay, so we are going to move on to our breakout sessions, but what's going to happen is it is uh, roughly uh, 2 p.m., so our breakout sessions will run till 3 p.m., so when we're done at 3 p.m., we're going to have a 15-minute wellness break. So after our sessions are done, 15 minutes, we'll come back in here for our final keynote, our final keynote speaker at 3.15. Okay, so, um, and that will be our final keynote. But uh, I'm now going to introduce the breakout sessions and let everybody know where our breakout sessions are. Um, so um, in the REN breakout room, we have uh, Joseph Phillips, uh, who's going to be doing a presentation on policy development and so this presentation looks at how to determine a need for policy and or policy change and how to begin the development of a policy specific to your school or your organization's uh, administration so the presentation will also provide information on the process of developing a policy with a central input and criteria as well as how to begin implementing the policy and follow up on its use and effectiveness so once again uh, that is with joseph phillips and that will be um, in the Wren breakout room. Um, here in this room right here, um, Mount uh, Baton, Baton, I'm not even too sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But in this room here, the main room, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Pamela Rose Toulouse. Um, and uh, Pamela's presentation uh, will be on strategic planning. Strategic planning, why taking the time to plan is more meaningful. So this is a highly engaging workshop focusing uh, on strategic planning as a process where staff and community uh, need to be included always. So the facilitator will share a level of phrases uh, for a meaningful plan uh, and ways for it to be developed and implemented in a, in a good way. So participants will leave this presentation um, with a session here with a renewed sense of how and the how and utilizing uh, an inclusive approach in terms of strategic planning. So again, that's with uh, Dr. Pamela Toulouse and that will be um, in uh, this room here. 
Um, in the Scott breakout room, so the Scott breakout room, we have Dr. Kathy Martin. So Dr. Kathy Martin um, will be doing a presentation on developing work plans and budgets. So this presentation will outline the elements of a good work plan and how to deter, uh, develop a, a custom work plan for your school and or organization uh, based uh, on their priorities, responsibilities, and direction from stakeholders. Um, the presentation will also illustrate how to develop your work plan uh, with an accompanying budget for planning and reporting purposes. So again, that's uh, Dr. Kathy Martin, and that will be in the Scott breakout room. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, in the Carlisle breakout room. So there will be a presentation on the review and analysis of systemic gaps in K-12 education. This presentation uh, will be delivered uh, with uh, by Kelly Gallagher McKay, Maria uh, Y.M. Yo, as well as Neil DeBossigay. Um, so this session will provide a comprehensive overview of the research underway to develop evidence-based framework for monitoring educational uh, inequities uh, facing First Nations learners in both provincially funded schools and on reserve educational settings. So the objective is to identify and or collect data, uh, key data that's required for establishing baseline and important educational inequities and to make recommendations on mitigation. So once again, uh, review and analysis of systemic gaps in K-12 education, um, that will be in the Carlisle breakout room. All right, everybody, so we're going to ask everybody to make their way over to the breakout rooms of your choice. Uh, we hope everybody enjoys their session. And once again, a reminder at 3 p.m. after these sessions are done, we'll have a break for 15 minutes. And then we will see everybody back here at 3.15 for our final keynote presentation. Okay, enjoy your uh, breakout sessions, everybody. Miigwech. you know will know me as like you know as uh, as Pamela Rose Toulouse and I'm from Zgamuk that's the place that is my home community the community that will say that yes that you belong to us and not only that my friends that I'm a proud Anishinaabekwe from there so we're going to be again talking about strategic planning but my friends strategic planning starts with this okay so what I want you to do is I want you to see there's someone around you or beside you, okay? So I want you to look at that good looking and gorgeous person right now. Take a look at them, don't you be scared, okay? Look at them right now. I want you to look at them right now. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at them and say these words, opche, nishin. I want you to say opche nishin which is like you're doing really well. Now, the other thing I want you to do before we start, my friends, is this. I want you to share, okay, what your vision is, all right, for education for your community. We're only gonna take one minute, all right, but what do you think your vision is for the community? You might be thinking, oh, geez, what does this have to do with strategic planning? Believe me, the vision is where we begin. So let them know, what's your vision? About one minute to two minutes. Go ahead and start now. Go move and meet a new friend. Don't be scared. You know you can do it, okay? You quit acting shy, Nishnabek. We know that you can get out there. All right, so share now. One, one to two minutes. What is your vision for education? <laughs> Another minute, another minute, another minute, another minute. Good. 
about 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Wrapping it up, wrapping it up. All right. All right. All right. Beautiful Nietzsche. So if you had the opportunity to share your brilliance or hear some brilliance, what I would like you to do, my friends, is I would like you to take your fist. Take your fist. Go like this. Don't be scared, okay? Don't, don't go zag. Yes, don't be scared. Go like this, okay? Now, I want you to do this. So if you got to tell some brilliance or hear it, I want you to take your fist and go like this. And I want you to say these words, okay? We are brilliant. I want you to do it again. We're going to go, we are brilliant. Oh my goodness, you said that with some kind of attitude and I am glad. We should always be saying those words, my friends. So when we talk about strategic planning, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my gorgeous friend at the back there, all right? So I want my gorgeous friend, I want you to wave at everybody. We got a couple there, okay? A couple gorgeous people. Me, Gwetch. So, <laughs> <laughs> what I want you to know, my friends, is that we're just going to, you're going to take a look very quickly. It's going to be at a document. And what it is, is that I, I've been doing strategic planning for about 30 years, okay? And I'm going to tell you something about the secret, the secret to strategic planning. And oh, it's a big secret. And the secret is this, my friends, there is no one way, okay? There is no one way, but what I'm going to share with you is some wise practices of things that I have been doing. So let's just, again, you know, just slowly go through the Chiefs of Ontario strategic plan. So what we're going to do, it's like it's slow-mo. So everybody enjoy, because we're going to be going through it, and I will let our beautiful friend know when to stop. But this strategic plan is a process that I was really gifted and honored to be able to do with the Chiefs of Ontario office. So again, working with this wonderful staff and being able, again, to really talk about what their vision is and how to move forward in a good way with the work they were already doing and things, again, that they were envisioning with the community guidance and direction. So let's just do a scan. I just want you to scroll. Okay, just scroll. Yeah, you got it? Now, you can just keep on scrolling. Okay, we'll go to the next page. Go to the next page. Go to the next page. Okay. Now, I want you to take a look at this. So, I really want to share, okay, because this is like a really large document. It's like 53 pages, right, of like, you know, of content that is not only with like strategic goals, my friends, all right, but it also goes beyond that. The one thing about strategic planning that's really, really critical is that everybody needs to see themselves in it. So in an organization or else in a community, we need to be able to see our ideas, our words, our vision, our people represented in it. It's like, you know, that, that proud moment, right? It's like that proud moment where we go, geez, did you see that? That's my idea in that strat plan. That's the type of enthusiasm and an excitement that whenever strategic plans, you know, are informed by staff and community that really is meaningful. Because I'm going to tell you, the strategic plan doesn't belong to the consultant. It does not. 
the strategic plan belongs to the organization and the community. And it is a lot of time and a lot of work. So let's just go to the next slide. Okay, don't worry, you're, you're going to get copies of this. It's going to be on like Ku's web page, all good. All right. And then we'll take a look. So go to the next page. We're just going to keep on going. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is just zip, zip, zip right to the end, real fast, real fast. We're going to make everybody dizzy. Okay. Do it. Do it. Yeah. All right. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. All right. Keep on going. You know, you got those fingers going. You got that mouse going. That's going to be some mouse magic action today. All right. Just keep on going. All right. So let's go back again, okay? And what I want to share with you, my beautiful friends, okay, is a couple of things. I have a couple of tools that I'm going to be sharing with you as well, all right? But this, again, 53-page document, right, has really clear and really clear outcomes and deliverables. Not only that, what does it have? It has who is responsible and in what time frame. But what we do is that we need to start, of course, with always with vision, right? So again, those, you know, people's visions for your organizations, you know, what we want those to do is we want them to actually live and breathe life. But not only that, for a community and staff to say, yes, that's a vision I believe in, and I know how I'm going to get there through our strategic plan. So let's go to the PowerPoint. I'm going to get my gorgeous friend to go to the PowerPoint. So let's get out of this document. Okay. Now, as they're making that wonderful transition, what I would like you to do is I want you to give me one of these signs. Okay. You can give me one of these signs. You can give me a peace sign or you can give me a taken care of business sign. All right. Taken care of business or a peace sign. So my beautiful friends, if you think it's important for your voice, to be in a plan no matter what, give me a peace sign or else taking care of business. So think about any type of strategic plans or work plans or any visioning for your community or your organization, right? So let me know, do you think that your voice is important to be included in it? Peace sign or TCB, okay? Let's see, let's see some TCBers here, all right? Oh yes, now we get to see what generation people are in. Thank you very much. <laughs> we got some 60s babies there. All right, so we're gonna go to the next slide. I wanna document this process, okay? And the reason being, my friends, all right? So we're gonna go to the next slide, all right? Hello, hello, I don't sing as good as Adele, but you know what, I will try anyway. All right, so again, we'll go to the next slide, please. Now, strategic planning, right? So we'll go to the next one for the, the actual phases. There are seven phases, again, to a strategic planning process that I'm involved in. And again, use this template, but not only that, Use the materials I'm providing, you know, to actually to guide your own path. Take what you need and leave the rest. So um, the very first thing, right, for anybody that is engaged in strategic planning, you definitely need someone that is going to be the point facilitator, always. You don't want a strategic plan to bounce between facilitators and writers. Because what happens is, is that if you have that inconsistency, you're going to lose maybe a lot of those nuances and recommendations that come from, again, community. So that's why it's so critical, you know, have that point person, that facilitator. And if you're doing any RFPs, okay, any requests for proposals, or else again, ITQs, invitations to quote, Again, you know, include, again, those phases in a good way and also, again, a clear, again, like, you know, description of those deliverables. So, again, phase one, right? I was entrusted, you know, and again, with Julia Candlish and this wonderful group here at KU, you know, to be a part, and of course, Carly Palmer, as if, Carly, I didn't see you back there. Don't you try to hide back there, sister. Now, beautiful friends. So, the other thing is, right, is that phase one is really about your facilitator, you know, immersing themselves in, again, your organization. You know, again, taking a look at documents, but really knowing, right, the organization and the people. 
Because what happens is that whenever you, if you have someone that just comes in to do it and then leaves after a week, right? There's so much inconsistency with the implementation of it. So actually carrying out that strat plan. So again, have a point person always, right? Not only that, you also want to have, you know, again, uh, what I would call like, you know, an actually a circle, a circle, you know, of knowledge keepers, a circle of knowledge keepers that works with that facilitator. And that circle of knowledge keepers has to be definitely, you know, informed by the elders, you know, of our communities, the elders in your organizations, and those that hold, again, those wonderful gifts and responsibilities. And we've got a couple of them here today. Oh, I see Donna DeBosque and her crew over here. And I got to tell you, you know, this beautiful elder, you know, is on many, many committees. And I'm just really honored to have you here today, Donna. Yeah, so me, Gwetch, and to the other elders there. You've got to have elders that are fun too, okay? Not only knowledgeable, okay? They got to have some fun. And our elders are fun. And I'm going to tell you how fun these elders are, okay? Now they're getting all red, okay? So you got to have elders that are fun, not only that have the knowledge, culture, and language, but your, again, your circle of knowledge keepers, right, has to be fun. I've, I've you know, uh, met up with Donna and uh, her, her beautiful crew. I'd like to say it's her posse last night. Yeah, I come in late there, oh, I'm tired after my flight and had to work all day. And then what do I get? Yeah, I get, you know, I go to the bar and I say, oh, geez, I'm gonna go get myself a good munch and, you know, a drink to calm my nerves, you know, after my flight and everything. And who's the first people I see in the bar? Oh, yes, there are beautiful elders sitting there laughing away. Chub up, eh. Yeah, and they were laughing. But the thing is, is that, you know, when I think about our circle of elders, right, they again are knowledgeable, but they're also fun. And that is one of the greatest gifts, you know, that we have. So again, phase one is always about that point person and your circle of knowledge keepers, right? And what, you know, they, what the facilitator, the point person does is review all the materials. They should know the institution you know, and the culture of the organization and also the staff, right? Staff so well that moving ahead that they can actually talk about the organization and the outcomes in a good way and staff in a way that's informed. So that's phase one, right? So again, Ku's like, listen, here's the documents you need to know, all right? And it's gonna take you some time, all right? The strategic plan is 53 pages, my friends. You can imagine what I had to read, all right? so. And again, it's about that familiarity. So we're gonna to go to the next slide, phase two. The next phase is this. So we ended up because of COVID and I really, you know, I'm starting to feel like I'm post COVID now, okay? I am post, I am done. Yeah, yeah, and it's time for us to be together and uh, to be together in a good way. The second phase of this planning process, right? Is you need to bring everybody together. All right, you know, so starting with your staff first, you need to have everybody together. And you know, and again, I know it's hard to schedule that, right? You're thinking, well, geez, well, I got a hundred people at my organization. Well, you know what? We need to find ways so that everybody's voice is there. Because when somebody can see their idea or else their input, they own it, right? And that's why strategic plans, when people don't own it, that they fail. Right, because again, there's an ownership. The phase two of this, right? We had a day all online, right? All online. And that's what we did. We're in a time. We're used to Zoom and Google Meet and Teams and everything else, you know, that comes in between. But phase two was a full day online with again Ku staff, right? And we had this amazing opportunity, you know, to start off this way. It's almost like you're doing a SWOT analysis, right? Strengths, they say weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But what happened during that day is we did these things, and I'm going to lead you in an activity that is related to it, is that we wanted to start by sharing, well, what are the successes and strengths of each priority area? What was the strengths of administration? 
what were the strengths, you know, again, of, again, of special education? So those seven priority areas. So again, what were you excited about? What are the successes and strengths? So we needed to know where we were starting as a group. And we did a lot of things. We didn't just talk, sit around and read. We actually drew. So when people are doing strategic planning and we're gonna do an activity together, is that strategic planning typically involves just a lot of reading and writing. But listen, our people are gifted. We're visual people. So listen, if we're gonna be talking about vision or else priorities, we need to draw it, which is why you are going to draw now. I want you to get out a piece of paper. Okay, get out a piece of paper. You're like, oh my goodness, shut the I didn't know that I was gonna have to do this. Get out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, except for our elders, okay? Because I believe you all have superpowers, okay? So you can just keep it up here, yeah. <laughs> all right, me watch, me watch their no suck, our little grandmas. All right, so you've got your piece of paper, my friends, okay? And what I would like you to do right now, all right, is I want you to think about it. So I'm gonna take you to a different place. So I really want you to think about that question, right? About, you know, your vision, okay? Your vision, you talked about it, but now I would like you to actually draw it. What is your vision, right? Your vision of education for your community or your organization look like? Is it a circle? Is it a tree? Is it water? Is it a place? Is it a person? Right? So draw it. We'll take about two minutes. So what does it look like? Is it the two row wampum? Is it ensuring that your great law of peace comes to life? that the 13 moons in Meshkegawak territory are honored? What is it? So draw it. As people are drawing, I'll just tell you a little story. You'd never believe it. You'll never believe it by the way that I'm moving around, but I actually have a broken toe, if you can believe it. I'm one of these people that like, you know, no matter what, my commitments, I thought, I'm not staying at home. Who cares? Like I got a broken toe, I'm just taping it up on my own and away I go and that's exactly what I do. Yeah, so I'm about three weeks away from being healed, which is why I can't wear my, my fancy boots, but thank goodness, you know, I got my mukluks on. All right. So wherever you are in the drawing process, okay? No worries, okay? No worries. But here's what I'm going to have you do, and I'm gonna model it. I'm gonna model it, all right? So I'm going to say squizzin, which means to wake up. Yeah, we're going to wake up in a good way. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab that paper, okay, wherever you put your model. And if you're like, well, I didn't draw anything. You know what? You know what we're going to do? We're going to be like, we'll let people know this is what I drew, okay? I'm going to get you to just stand up behind your chair. But we'll have our elders. You stay where you are, okay? You stay where you are because we're going to come to you. Unless you're like, oh, I want to get up too, and I want to be again moving around. Okay, so just grab your model and stand up behind your chair. Okay, that's all. Yeah, so again, but our elders, you stay where you are. And again, those individuals, you know, of course, if you have, again, particular, again, needs, please stay where you are. Okay, we'll let the people come to you. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do, my wonderful friends, is we're going to take that model, okay? We're going to take that model. And I want you to hold that model to the air. Ishpaming, okay? Hold it up high, right? 
Yeah, let's give it the respect that that vision deserves and let's hold it out for creation to see, okay? Not only that, let's take it down to our earth beings, right? Okay? Let's take it, you know, out to our air beings. Let's take it out to those fire beings. Now, what I'm going to have you do, this is an activity that's called red light, yellow light, green light. And yellow light is this. Yellow light is like this. You go like this. You're going to walk like this, but real slow like, okay? You're going to go like this. And then when I say green light, you're going to miptoe a bit there, miptoe, but not too hard because you just ate, all right? All right. And then when I say red light, you're going to stop. So yellow light, start moving slowly. Oh, yes. Verna, I see you. You just ate your cookie. I know it. And again, we'll go to our elders and those that choose to sit, you know, because that's their place. Red light. Now, with two or three people around you, Shelly, Shelly not fights like, Fife is like, what? Red light? She already started miptoing. She goes, I'm so anxious to tell my ideas here. So what you're going to do, my friends, is just with one other person or two other people, you're going to take about 30 seconds each to share that vision. And then you're going to return to your seats, Mudabik. And then I'm going to finish with those phases. So again, share your picture, okay, with one to three people, and then Mudabik. Okay. Go ahead. see let's come over here yeah I'm back I'm back yeah yeah so we'll share here then yeah 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 so go ahead yeah okay uh, vision um, I just had uh, just popped into my head um, it's our it's our emblem yeah it's our, uh, butter seed. yes it's a great tree of peace and with the eagle on top the reason why that came to my to my to my vision or my what I've seen because I think the elders should be able to see the great distances and the, the trouble that yes. will come to be able to see into the future. Uh, the tail should be the direction that the eagle flies that's represented by the children and the youth. Yes. And the, the two wings should be the men and women working together to make that eagle fly. And it sits on top of our three principles of peace, Carmen, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I drew it and it's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> my drawing. Oh. <laughs> you have a tree of life too. I do, oh. yeah. We have oh. a When you finish sharing, return to your seats. When you finish sharing, might have been. <laughs> Let me take a look. Yeah. Yeah. And oral language is the key, speaking. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, miigwech. All right. Start making your way back, my friends. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, Mudabik. 
Kenna Marabek. All right. So again, my wonderful friends, right? So again, the vision is where we start. But I also want to give, again, a science behind, again, um, a strategic planning. So you might be asking, well, why is it that we're getting up to do stuff? So here's a bit of the science. So even when you're in a Zoom room or anything like that, because strategic planning really does, again, require, right? Require a lot of critical thinking and creativity. And what happens is that if we're always like this, you know, and we're working like this while we're planning and we're sitting and sitting and there's no movement, right? Is that what happens is that, you know, we don't have, again, both sides of our brain active. When you start moving around, and this is just a bit of learning theory, those synapses are going, and in group work and problem solving, that what happens is that it really does, again, enhance the work that is being created by the people together. You start with your ideas, and you share, you draw, you write together. So you might be thinking, my goodness, that's really a part of strategic planning? And yes, it is because you need to have the times to again sit and write, but there has to be times to be actively engaged. So my good friends, phase two. So we did, we really looked at, you know, with, uh, with coup, <laughs> the strengths and the challenges, of course, and the successes. People came forward with, with things like, this is what I am so proud of that I have been able to do in service to the communities. So again, starting from a place of positivity. So that's where, where we started, because you know what? It's easy to get bogged in the challenges and the threats, right? That's very easy to go, oh yes, oh colonialism, oh, all of it. Yeah, it's easy to get stuck there. And the reason why we wanna start off with positivity, um, you know, we know what the challenges and threats are. We hear them all the time, right? But we want to start from a place of positivity when we're strategic planning, because that is the vision of an organization or a community. You know, we know those threats are there and challenges. Not only that, you want to have a living vision for your, for your again, for your group. So that living vision is not something that is stagnant. So when you have a vision or strategic plan, folks, you need to know that it is not fixed, that it is something that can change. So again, the vision is living. Not only that, when it comes to overarching collective goals, and I'll show you coups as well on my template that you can use, okay? But when it comes to, again, collective goals, strategic planning is this, okay? So many of you, you know, wherever you're working, you might have a lot of activities. Oh, we got this program, we got this event, we got this service. What a strategic plan does is it helps to organize and streamline the work that you do. Not only that, it helps you to envision the possibilities. So we also, again, and I'll, we'll show you in the document that also, again, each priority area also wrote their own sub goals. So again, I will show you my template um, in about eight minutes. We'll go to phase three. Okay, so next slide. Now, this is another really important part, and this is also really, um, again, about collective work. When you have, again, a big organization, you're, you're again, you know, having conversations with community, you need a place to house everything. And you know, you know what, our, what we tend to do? We tend to email each other a lot, eh? Oh, geez, did you get that memo? Did you get it? I thought you were CC'd in it. Yeah, weren't you blind copied? So what we need when we're strategic planning is you need to have just one drive. So this is a practical idea, a secured shared drive for everybody. And we also, again, have to encourage, right? We have to encourage each other. If you're having technological issues accessing stuff, it's okay to say, Munchidik, I don't know, right? Okay, that's okay to see, say that. And then we can, you know, be of assistance. But you need to have, again, that, again, definitely that secured shared drive. 
And what happens is that any facilitators you hire or consultants, they need to be doing this. And I got to come here and sit with Cher now. They got to do this shoulder to shoulder work. Yeah, shoulder to shoulder. Jeez, yeah, you smell good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you do, it's about the shoulder to shoulder work. So again, ensuring that each priority area or department, whether it's education, whether it's post-secondary, whether it's language and culture, that again, everybody's on the same shared drive and has access to it. So what that means is that the person in early learning can access administrations, that they too can take a look to see, well, listen, that is an amazing idea. I can build upon that or else what I can do is I can also, again, borrow some of those ideas also for, for our particular, again, priority area. So that shoulder to shoulder work, right, is done. And I'll tell you because again, because of the, the size of a lot of our places and staff, that stuff can all be done online. That shoulder to shoulder work. And what it means by the shoulder to shoulder is that whoever is leading it, the point person, will sit with everybody and their team members, my friends, and again, like, you know, work through those sub goals again with the individuals. So again, that's important to be able to do. But not only that, my friends, is that you wanna make sure that you don't have like about 15 strategic priority areas. And for coup, there is exactly three, all right? So I'll show you again the document that we did the big run through at. So you want to have things that are manageable because a lot of our work, you know, you'll find they really seem to align with our sacred numbers for some reason, threes and fours and sevens, but you want things that are manageable. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, phase four, my beautiful friends, is this individual interviews now you might be thinking holy geez that's a lot of work what do you mean now you've already like had a big session with us and now you know you, you met with our priority areas you know post-secondary or early learning or spec ed now like now you want to meet us individually and have interviews so that is like you know a really critical stage is the phase four because what you do my friends is that you really do these things right is that you sit with the team, you sit with those members, and is there anything that is missing? Can we fill in the gaps? Or what have you learned from someone else that we can also fill in these gaps with? So again, phase four is really about these things. The goal of phase four is really about discussing and further developing, again, the three to five strategic actions and outcomes. Not only that, to identify the sub goals, and I'll show you how those sub goals work. But not only that, it's also about what is the next step. So you're thinking, holy geez, you mean there's actually a next step after these four phases? I thought we were done. But again, taking the time is really what's going to have impact. So we'll go to phase five. All right, miigwech. So phase five is your facilitator, the point person. And it really is about taking everything that was said and sitting with it, right? So, um, and again, a practical piece of advice, if you use Zoom or else Teams or anything else, request the transcript function, okay? Request it, okay? Because the one thing that I wanted to make sure, because I did not want to miss out on any areas, is this, is that I took every Zoom transcript from the big group session, the priority session and the individual sessions, and I sat with them. I reviewed them, I highlighted, I circled, I did all of these things to make sure that, you know, that I was again doing my due diligence and making sure there wasn't any gaps. So again, individual interviews, so critical. And it really is about, you know, ensuring that there is an alignment, right? There's an alignment with the collective goals and the sub goals. And it also gives the, um, the, again, an opportunity to say, okay, you know, if there is a gap, what do I need to do, right? To address that gap. So you gotta remember, this is a five-year plan for coup, 
all right, five-year plan. And it was, it was about, about a five to six month process, right? Five to six months. And again, your point person has to sit with those interviews, look at the transcripts, go over and over again if you have to, to make sure you haven't missed anything. All right, we're gonna go to phase six. So phase six is really the draft, folks, all right? So again, you wanna make sure that that phase six is a draft document. And that draft document goes back again to the people that have contributed. Because again, that draft document doesn't belong, you know, to the consultants or to the facilitators. It belongs to the, the organization and the community. So this is why it's really, again, important because that's the opportunity in the draft when people get to see the collective vision, you know, and see those strategic priorities that, you know, that that draft really provides an opportunity to revisit and to amend, right? So that's really what it does. You're amending and you're revisiting. And again, that takes a lot of time too. And I'm gonna show you, in, and after phase seven, we're gonna pull up a Word document because I'm gonna show you the templates that I always use and that you're more than willing to take with you as well. And then we'll pull up the actual strategic plan again in about five minutes. So the, again, you wanna make sure that any time that you're doing your strategic plan, that you also have a space, right? You need to have a space. How does that, again, that particular priority, you know, does it align with, again, a ban council resolution? Does it align with, you know, an education committee, again, the recommendation, right? So you want to be able to have, you know, again, the backing, okay? Or else, again, you know, uh, the reasons why this is moving forward. So again, this is why it's really important, but not only that, it's also a chance to say, well, listen, this strategic outcome would also benefit from having, you know, this other party responsible for it as well in a good way. Okay, so some collaborative planning. And we'll go to the, the final uh, phase, my friends. So again, after, you know, uh, quite a long time, a couple months, you know, that final plan for coup was done. And it was informed, we went back and forth, you know, there was team, team meetings, but also individuals as well. So I mean, that's about going back and it's a lot, you know, a lot of like uh, conversations and also again, revisioning. So I'm actually going to have you go to the Word document. But before we do that. All right. All right, there, my saucy folks on a stormy day. Now. We've got the number seven there, all right? We got the number seven there. So again, it always seems, you know, that a lot of things, you know, that are important always seem to align with our sacred numbers. So we've got the number seven. So we're going to do an activity that relates to number seven, all right? And it's easy. So I want you, again, my friends, just to take the hand you write with, okay? Take the hands you write with. Okay, let's see it, all right? Now, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna take that beautiful hand that you write with, and I want you to draw into the air the number seven. What does it look like? Either numerically or else in words. Now, we're gonna open up the other side of your beautiful brains. I want you to take the other hand, all right, and write the word, I mean, write the letter, the um, numerical seven, okay? The number seven with the other hand. Now. We're gonna make sure that you really got your problem solving thinking cap on. So what I want you to do is to take both hands and follow me. We're gonna draw the number seven with both hands. You can do it like this, or else my beautiful friends, you can go like this in any way that you want. So again, use both hands. Let's see the number seven, our sacred number. Love it. Now, some of you look like you're dancing from the 70s, but that's okay, my friends, that's okay. All right, so we're going to pull up that Word document. And as that's getting pulled up, so again, these will be on the Coup website. So these are templates for you just to take and use, okay? So take and use them. 
So we have the, the document, and this is like, again, the parts. So if you can imagine, every phase has a lot of different type of work that goes with it, right? So when it comes to, again, like, you know, organizing it, this is how we started, right? So we had our part A. And that vision, which is a working vision for KU in education, came from us drawing, talking, you know, having some good laughs too there, Carly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But what it does is that we start with that. So the vision grounds us. Then you take a look. You need to have your priority areas or your departments right after that, right? So again, it's like, well, who is this about? Who is this, you know, strategic plan really about? And so, you know, we're looking, okay, well, these priority areas carry out the work that the First Nations, right, are asking, again, KU to do. So we did that. That was like, you know, the big thing. That was the big thing, the vision. Then we went to the part B. So again, we'll just scroll down. And then we're like, okay, we got all seven priority areas here. I want you to think about the work that you do, right? Think about it. And what would you say is a collective goal? Or what are those things that everybody does together, right? Do you all work on policy? Do you all work on community relationships? And that's why it's important, you know, to have three to four, again, again, very focused collective goals, right? And then not only that, is that what happens is that, you know, each, each priority area department then says, okay, well, we have our collective goal that we do policy and advocacy, but now we're gonna come up with, again, three sub goals that really, again, aligns with us. So that's you know, what happens next. And what I loved about that is that each, each priority area could say, well, this is how, you know, in administration, policy work, you know, applies to us. Spec Ed could say, this is how policy, er policy applies to us, and here's our goals for policy. Special Ed was able to say, this is how, again, policy, you know, relates to us and cultivate the goals. So that is, again, you know, the part C, and we'll just scroll all the way down, my friends. And you'll see right there, the action or the outcome. So once I had the goals, right, it's like, okay, what does that actually look like, right? What does it look like? But not only that, right, who's responsible for doing it? Is it the lead? Is it an education counselor? Is it a principal? Is it a manager or director? You know, is it the executive assistant? Is it chief and counsel? And instead of mandate resolution, is it a committee directive? Is it a, again, band council resolution? You need to be able to link, right? Any of the work you do in a good way with, again, you know, again, how it's being informed by community, right? You need to have that. So we're gonna pull up the actual coup document as the last before I will, again, take some questions. So we're gonna pull up the coup strategic plan. All right, we'll go right to the beginning of that plan. So we'll head right on up. Okay, so we'll scroll all the way up to, I think it's page seven. There we go. Right to the beginning. Keep on going, okay, down a bit more. Keep on going, keep on going. Right there, five. So those seven phases, my friends, you know, led to this, right? So each priority area has these collective goals in common. Collective goal one, that every single depart, like every single priority area, right, deals with policy and relationships. Their second collective goal that everybody shares amongst priority areas is coordination and support. The third one is research and data. Now this is just administration, 
right? And built right into that, you know, we have our sub goals, but let's go to the next page so that people can see the meat of it. So this is just my friends, again, you know, from April 1st, 2022, um, again, to the end of March. So we move like, again, we move again into the real meat of the strat plan. And that is, again, you know, you might be thinking, well, a strategic plan, it kind of looks like a work plan. But what you need to know is remember, there is no one, one way to do a strat plan. But what you need to do is ensure that everybody has their, again, their voice represented. So if you take a look, you know, something like this, an action or an outcome for administration was like, yes, like, you know, under policy and relationships, we need to ensure, right? We need to ensure that we do, because, you know, admins taking a lot of minutes. They're like, you know, doing a lot of work with community, with elders, with chief and council. So even something like, you know, we need to have the transcript function for Zoom made it as a strategic, again, like as a goal. And not only that, because it came from a need. It's like, listen, we really do need to improve our relationships with community. So this, again, you know, came from admin. We know who's responsible. You know, they identified this is who's responsible. But not only that, they're like, we don't need a mandate resolution to get the transcript function. So that is just an example, my friends. And if we can go to the next priority area, and then I'm going to wrap this up so we can have some questions. So we'll go beyond administration, go to about, let's see, keep going, keep going. All right. So again, same thing, you'll see the federal bilateral process that a lot of you may be involved in. So the living vision is always there. It's a reminder that this is what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to work towards. And you'll see the same collective goals, right? And now this is federal bilateral and the previous one was admin. And then we have, again, policy and relationships is what they do, coordination and support, and research and data. They identified their own sub goals, okay, which is the strategic direction. And we'll go to the next one that has the meat of it. And then it was like, okay, under policy and relationships, it's like, listen, this is what we plan to do. We're going to support the work, you know, of, again, the First Nations Education Coordinate, co Coordination Unit. And it's like, well, who's responsible? And then it's really clear about who's responsible and if there was a resolution um, tied to it. So what does that plan actually do? It was informed by everyone through a lot of means over the course of about six months. And what it does is that it's a very clear path how to move forward in the next five years. And that really is what strategic planning, you know, is about. It's about moving forward in a good way but also ensuring that everybody can say, hey, that was my idea, or else, hey, that's me right in there. And the more people that you have within staff and community that can say, hey, that's my idea, will make a world of difference because they're invested in it, okay? So final activity before questions and before, you know, I get the boot out of here, okay? And that's okay too, because we're gonna, we got a health break coming up. So last thing, the last part of strategic planning, and I'm going to show you, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to take both hands, go like this. Go like this. You can do it real hardcore. Like you're like, you know, you're, you're real mad or something. Even give people a look. Give them a look. Now, you're going to look at your group and you're going to go like this. And you're gonna say these words, me gwetch. You're gonna look at another table and you're gonna say these words. Again, shaking your hands like you mean it. Shake it to another group. And I want you to say these words, Marcy, which is Meti, my chief, for thank you. I want you to shake it like you never shook it before. Shake it. And I want you to say Nakermeek, which is Inuit for thank you. And the last, again, shake it, you know, beyond making it is for yourself, okay? And let us say Nyaw. So beautiful friends, right? Beautiful friends. So, and again, please feel free to say thank you in your own languages. 
But again, all of these documents, you know, that final plan, the Word document, the template, and the PowerPoint with the seven phases is available, will be available on the website. So with that, I say to you, you beautiful gange gans, you kittens on a beautiful day. I say miigwech to you, and I'll take a couple of questions before we switch over to our health break. And I think I got like about two minutes. Yeah, about two minutes. Yeah. So a question, comment, you know where the stuff is. It's going to be on the website. Take it. It's yours. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So me, Gwetch folks. Yeah. And that's it, I believe. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Beautiful friends. So no comments. Well, I will say to you, gorgeous folks, ma, ma, pee. Go on. Go and get your tea, your nibi shabo, your makarea bo, whatever it is you got going on, miigwech. <laughs> miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. We actually have a present here for you for your beautiful presentation today. So we thank you very much for your dynamic words. You got everyone up and moving and it was gorgeous. And I would love to hand to you this envelope as a thank you for your presence and your work. Thank you so much. One more time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so that brings us to our break. So now we have a wellness break, everybody, till uh, quarter after 3. 3.15 is when we will resume for our final keynote. Uh, with Dr. Pam Toulouse. So once again, we have about 15 minutes. But I have a notice about the door prize draw because uh, we have uh, many people are beginning to travel home. So there's a lot of tickets in there. I don't want to be reading a whole bunch of numbers like last night. So uh, what we're going to do is for the new way that we're going to draw names is if everybody has their registration, this little name tag here inside your thing. So we're going to fold that up. Um, there will be a staff member either at the registration desk or somewhere uh, they will have a box that we're going to put these in. So in order to be eligible, well, there's now four door prizes uh, instead of two. So we'll have four door prizes. In order to be eligible, you grab your piece of paper um, and then you uh, will fold that up and put that into uh, a box. So I'm just looking to the Chiefs of Ontario staff. Is there a box anywhere that we're doing that? Right. Getting everybody's attention. Okay. Uh, good to see everybody back. Hope everybody had a good wellness break. So once again, uh, just making an update and an announcement about our new ways that we are going to be drawing these door prizes. There are two more additional door prizes uh, that brings our total to four. So there's four door prizes. Um, we're not going to be drawing the names of the tickets that you got at registration uh, when you registered. Uh, we're going to, Angel is going around with the box, the Chiefs of Ontario staff, and we're going to be asking everybody to write their name on a piece of paper and submit it in uh, the box in order to be eligible for the draw. So Chiefs of Ontario staff will be letting everybody know that's how you get into the draw. So I uh, hope everybody enjoyed their sessions as well as enjoyed their wellness break. Uh, we're going to be getting started in our last keynote presentation of our language and education forum for the Chiefs of Ontario and uh, that brings us to our last keynote. So I have the pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Dr. Pamela Rose Toulouse um, who is a visiting scholar with the Faculty of Education at York University. She is a proud Anishinaabekwe and member of Sagamok First Nation in Northern Ontario. So Dr. Pam who is um, as she is fondly, more formally known as Dr. Pam is the uh, recipient of the Ontario Undergraduate Student uh, Alliance Teaching Excellence Award, and that was in 2021. Amongst the numerous awards that she has for all the good work that she has done, uh, she has, um, is also an author, a researcher, and a developer of over 50 resources in Indigenous education. So uh, Dr. Pam has over 29 years plus of experience across the education continuum from K to 12 post-secondary and within administration of education. So um, Pam, Dr. Pam's um, presentation is going to be on the two-eyed seeing uh, and the gifts of our people. So this is the highly engaging keynote which will celebrate the gifts of our people and the importance of adopting two-eyed seeing approach in education. Concepts of holism, humor, land, critical reflection will be explored in a respectful way. Participants will leave with an enhanced understanding of why culture, language are foundational within First Nations education. So I've got everybody's attention. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Pam. Thank you. 
All right. All right there, my Nietzschekas. We're just about ready. I hope that you went and used the bathroom. You got your knee shabo, your beesh, whatever it needs, whatever you need to move on. Now, we know, okay, my friends, you know, there's some people they had to leave because of travel reasons and safety, and that I completely understand. But let me tell you, we're gonna have a little bit of a party here before we leave, and I can guarantee that. <laughs> All right, so, Ani, my gorgeous Nichkes, Ani on this beautiful, beautiful day. Not only that, for many of, again, our beautiful language speakers here, right now we are in the time of Makwagizis, that beautiful bear moon. So again, we celebrate that in a good way, but here's how we're gonna do it. Now, don't you be scared. Don't you be scared. But here's what we're gonna do. I want you to take your hands and go like this. I want you to look at somebody and give them your best makwa bear ever. Look at somebody, give it to them. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. I said makwa, not sasquatch. <laughs> All right. So my beautiful friends, uh, I'll start off by introducing myself and, uh, and, uh, and uh, make some, some, hopefully some good announcements too. But uh, so, Ani Bojo Wasa Ekawabikwen Adijnakas, Gno Jedodam Seg Maknishna Bek Donjaba. Most people know me, you know, as, uh, as Dr. Pam, and, um, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm proud of it. I'm proud of, you know, all of my accomplishments because it's because of my community and all of my mentors. And I also want to share this before I start in my presentation. So I do have 29 years plus, all right? Now I know you're looking at me and you're saying, oh, shkini gish or shkini kwe. How did this happen? <laughs> but what I want to tell you is that you know it's actually been about 30 years that i've been in education and there's something that i also want to say to everybody that you know might also you know come as a bit of a shock too but uh i am a visiting scholar in the faculty of education at york university but i also again uh, you know have recently um been called home and this is my first message to like our communities here don't be afraid to call people home because I was actually retired, semi-retired there. I thought, oh yes, I'm going to be on a beach somewhere sunning it up. And what ended up happening was uh, creation had a different plan for me. So what happened was, you know, the leadership in my community, you know, chief and council, they were like, you know what, we've got a gap right now. And I really want to do a big shout out to Anna Marie Abatong, who again uh, was the director of education for Sagmuk First Nation for 40 plus years. Okay, we're talking 40 plus years. Yeah. Anna Marie Abatong uh, is uh, definitely one of my mentors. And it's because of people like Anna Marie Abatong, who's now retired as of December. And because of people that came before her and the staff and the people that came before those staff and also chief and council present and past why education is where it is today in Zgamuk. That's the community, you know, is the reason why we have what we have. So I've been like, you know, busy. Oh, yes, I've been around Turtle Island and then some busy working, you know, in all kinds of places. But my community uh, in November said, you know, we're gonna have a big change and we want you to be a part of it. And what they did is they asked me to come home to be the interim education director. And I said, yes. And I'm gonna tell you why I said yes. You know, it's, you know, you might think, oh, she must have lots of time. She's semi-retired, she's a visiting professor, but actually I'm quite busy. But, you know, I think that when we are called home 
and call your own people home too, no matter where they are. Say, listen, we need help. We want you home. So for a year, I have the gift, the privilege and the honor of being back in my home community as an education director for one year. And in that one year, you know, I get to like, you know, be a part of, you know, things in a good way. And I'm gonna tell you why it is such a gift. I've only been at it, you know, for six weeks. And many of you education directors are out there probably saying, or managers, oh, geez, just six weeks, wait till a year. Now, but I'll tell you, what keeps me grounded all the time before I get to my presentation, we'll be doing some activities, is the kids. So I go every time I'm in Zgamuk, I make sure that I go to every classroom. I go to the daycare. And even though it's really busy, right? And I've got like lots of meetings, appointments, people to see, so many things. I always make sure that I go there. And I go see those kids as that reminder of why I'm there. And what it reminds me is, is that, you know what? They deserve the best of everything and they're worth it. And sometimes they don't know that they're worth it. And that for me is one of the greatest injustices that still that our children believe that. So I feel lucky to be from Zgamuk and to work with people that are like just as brilliant as everyone here and to work with those brilliant kids in the community from again, from K to 12 and, pace, and uh, post sec. But I tell you folks, it is an honor and I am humbled to be back home. So my first call out to you folks, don't be afraid to say, hey, you over there, you've been gone a while, come back home. <laughs> you know, that's all you gotta say, you know? And when we're called home, we need to respect that call, yeah. So I'm gonna get started here because this is about two-eyed seeing and we're gonna do some exercises. Oh yes, we're gonna flex it. All right, my beautiful friends, Nichkes. So this is all about two-eyed seeing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about two-eyed seeing because we're gonna do some activities related to this, right? So this is all about our gifts. And every single person here has gifts. You know, one of my gifts, my friends, is that I am a very much ADHD. And I learned a long time ago um, how to harness that gift. Started off in elementary, every report card, oh, you know, she's daydreaming again. And every report card always had something like that. And then, you know, it was the other thing was, you know, then all of a sudden, as I got older, you know, how's the, it ha isn't able to sit still, isn't able to pay attention, right? All of these things, or else this person is absent or late. And for me, you know, part of my issue is that I am, I'm very hyperactive. Now you're probably thinking, well, listen, why aren't you a lot skinnier then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I'll tell you why, because I, I'm an older, an older woman here, you know, so I like to have a little bit of padding, you know, to take care of myself, you know, yeah, lots of love right here. Yeah, so we'll go to the presentation, but two wide seeing, so I'm going to take you through an activity. All right, take you through an activity. So our Mi'kmaq relations, you know, coin this term. And again, our Mi'kmaq uh, elder, Albert Marshall, introduced this concept of two-eyed seeing. But every nation, okay, Nishnabek, Meshkigawik, Haudenosaunee, Metis, Inuit, right? Again, all of our people, we have two-eyed seeing. So this is gonna be your first lesson, all right? Now, don't you start thinking it's gonna be a freaky deaky exercise here, all right? But we'll try it together. I want you to take your right hand, take your right hand. And if you're wondering right, what right it is, okay, don't worry about it. I want you to take your right hand and I want you to go like this. It's almost like you're patting a gosh, gas, a cat. Go like this. Yes. Oh, so beautiful, beautiful. That left, so the left, right? So we start there. I want you to take your left hand and I want you to go to the right side of your, your, your beautiful hair and go down your arm. 
Beautiful. All right. So why would I have you do that? Because we all live right now in, again, a world, you know, that we're all like, you know, infused with social media, you know, and we have, we have been colonized and we're all working towards being decolonized. Oh, geez, I got to check myself every day. Oh, geez, why'd you say that? Is it because of colonialism? Why did you do that? Ah, must be because of colonialism too. <laughs> but my beautiful friends, two-eyed seeing is so beautiful because what it does is this. We go to that left arm, that left eye, right? The left, where our heart is, right? That heart. And we say the two-eyed seeing because any of our educational programs, systems, schools, no matter what it is, you know, again, benefits from adopting a two-eyed seeing approach. And this is what it is. The heart side is all about language and culture. You see these beautiful quail here? Yeah, this is what it's about, language and culture. So it starts with that. It starts with our own knowledges. So any education has to have that, that balance. But then on that other side, the right side, right? That right eye. What we do is that we look out, we look at other schools, we look at curriculum, we go and look at our Maori relations in other countries, we go and look at the Sami in the Netherlands, which are again, Nishnabek people too, that are native people. And we say, okay, what are the things from that Western world and from other nations that we will take moving forward, right? We only pick the best things and we leave the rest. So again, two-eyed seeing, Language and culture is the foundation in the heart. And then we only pick those things from Western society that benefit us and we leave the rest behind. So I adopted that, that, and you know, I was doing it, you know, and I thought, geez, I don't even know how to say, you know, the, the approach that I take. And then when I saw this by Albert Marshall, I thought, now I know that that is an approach that I have been living with. So again, two wide seeing is really about embracing, you know, the things in the Western world that work for our communities and language and culture, always the foundation from here and here and here. So my beautiful friends, we're actually going to do an, an activity in two eyed seeing. Okay. Now, if you're like, listen, you know, whatever it is, you're like, Oh, I don't have my vision on today. Listen, folks, I can barely see you. I don't have glasses on right now. Okay. And I don't want to fall off this stage, but we're going to do an exercise in two eyed seeing. Okay. In a good way. Okay. So follow me. Okay, so we're going to look at each other using our eyes first. Okay, I want you to take those same beautiful circles, right? These, those beautiful circles. But this time, what I would like you to do with your two-eyed seeing, okay, is I want you to take those beautiful circles, and I want you just to make an entire circle. The other way. Now, put them back in front of yourself. I want you to look at a friend, okay? I want you to look at a friend. All right. Okay. You can put your hands down. Here's what we're going to do. As a two-wide seeing activity, right? As a two-eyed seeing activity. So, you know, again, you know, even for like, you know, our beautiful, again, you know, we got all of our good people here and for our allies, accomplices and co-conspirators as you're here, what we're going to do is just with one person, one person that's sitting at our table right now. And if you're alone, don't you worry, you won't be alone for long. What we're going to do is we're actually just going to, we're going to share with that person. We're going to go in this way because we're going to take, again, that two-eyed seeing approach. And we've got to look at them through two different eyes. The left is with who we are, the heart of who we are, the spirit. 
And the other side is with the language that we speak. So you can either use your indigenous language, but we're going to take a look at a person and we're gonna let them know, okay? A good thing about them, a positive thing. You can do it in the language. And you're like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I don't want nobody saying anything to me. Yes, you. Somebody's gonna say something nice to you. So I'm gonna start with my gorgeous friend here. Is it Avatni? Yeah, so Avatni. I look at you with my left eye, which is again from who I am as an Ishnabe, and I look at you with my right eye, only taking those good things from the Western world, you know, those things that are good. And I want to say today to you that I think that your spirit is beautiful, and I can see it. So I want you, <laughs> I want you to take a look at somebody, and you let them know. Yeah, what do you appreciate about them? And even if you don't know that person, oh, sister, I like your shirt. But I know this person. Yeah, by the way, I tried to call you the other day. Yeah, <laughs> now I know where you were. All right, so again, take about a minute. Look at them through your left eye, the right eye. What's beautiful about them? All right. What's that? Me what? Knacker me. Marcy. All right. Now. Okay there. I said one thing only. You didn't have to do a top 10 list of everybody. Goodness. <laughs> All right. So now the next one is really about holism. And you'll notice I move around a lot, friends, and that, that's okay. That's just, uh, it's how I function in a good way. So holism. So again, like, you know, this is really, you know, again, this whole idea of holism, it's like, well, what does it look like? What does it actually mean? So when I think about schools, right, when I think about schools, and I think about, again, you know, the work that we do with our kids, I always think that holism has to embody these things. It has to be something that is definitely, that addresses the physical needs, right, of our people, the emotional, or else the well-being, the intellectual, which really represents, you know, again, that academic success and the things we're going to pull from, you know, Western societies. We're going to take the, only the best and leave the rest behind. That's what I say. Take the best and leave the rest behind. All right. Now, the other thing is the spiritual. And what is the spiritual? The spiritual is right here, right here in Sagamuk. We have in our school in elders in the program, like elders in the classroom program in Sagamuk. And we've had our trials, you know, we've had our trials. And, but I tell you, no matter what the trials, what I love about our beautiful elders in the classroom is that it's a range of elders that are in there from various families in the community. So it's like every family has a member, like, you know, of their, the person that they've selected that represents them that's in the school and what i love about that is that you know you get to see this like see these elders you know sitting there and sometimes they take on an ea role you know they may decide like oh that's it i'm gonna sit here with this skinny gish or banojis and we're gonna get to work here and that's okay you know if grandma tells me to do something i'm doing it yeah <laughs> Nokmas said, yeah, Nokmas Dikit, <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, I'll do whatever she says. So our, again, elders in the classroom is really that spiritual. 
but also it's about ensuring that our elders are treated well when they're in the schools as well. That their roles, you know, that they know the roles, but also again, that the kids also know that these beautiful elders are coming in to share language and culture and teachings. The spiritual is also our places, our geography, right? Where we live. So the spiritual is about all of those sacred places. And a lot of folks are, well, what do you mean sacred places? You know, I'm not taking nobody to an area where the shaking tent ceremony is. No, I'm not talking about that. Jeez, my goodness. I'm talking about land, right? The spiritual is just walking out the door. It's like everywhere we go, even here, you know, in the big smoke here in Toronto, you know, all you gotta do is walk outside. We got rain, we got snow, we got ice pellets. Oh, Mother Earth is letting us know who's boss. But it's really, you know, fascinating because that's all we need to do. Whenever I, you know, would work with schools, especially in urban centers, they would say, oh, we got to do a field trip, take a bus. We got to go three hours into the bush, you know. But it's like, you don't need to go three hours into the bush. Walk out the door, look out the window, you know. That is an example of the spiritual. The other part of the spiritual, my friends, is resources that are created by our people. Indigenous, authentic, or authenticated by our people. So it has been vetted. All right. So we're going to do an activity with holism. You're probably thinking, oh, no, what's she going to have us do now? So. Holism is this, right? We're going to do an activity that is about two-eyed seeing, but it's going to be in a good way. So what I would like you to do, my good friends, is this, okay? You're going to grab a pen or a pencil. doesn't matter. Eyeliner, lipstick. <laughs> All right. Now that you got it, I want you to take that pen. All right? Take that pen. And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that that pen is like a laser, okay? Now, it leaves, it's going to leave a permanent beautiful color in the air. Then it'll dissipate. So I want you to take that pen and I want you to write your first name. Write your first name. Okay. Oh, yes, look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now... I want you to take that same pen, okay? Take that same pen. And now what I would like you to do is to write your last name into the air. Let's honor that name. Now, some of you have been divorced a couple times like me. <laughs> you better hope that you only took one name. All right. Now, you all put your beautiful names, again, into the air, right? So your beautiful names. So here's what we're going to do with those beautiful names, right? Because we're going to honor your name in a good way. So what you're going to do to honor that name in a good way is just at your table alone, okay? Or else I will come over, all right? I'll come over. You're going to, again, let folks know what does that name mean to you? Okay, so if you're like, well, you know, I got my English name, my English name is Pamela Toulouse, you know, what does that name mean to me? You know, Pamela Toulouse, you know, is who I am, but I'm also Wasa Ekawabikwe too, you know, she that looks ahead. So again, I want you to share with somebody, what does that name mean to you? What gift do you bring to that name? And if you're like, oh, I bring no gift to that name. Well, listen, yes, you do. I will come over and we will find a gift. But what gift do you bring to that name? Do you bring the gift of humor, humility? Do you bring the gift of being an amazing partner, friend, relation? What gift do you bring? So honor your name. What gift do you bring to that name? Go now, about two, three minutes. What gift do you bring to it? I 
was going to say awareness yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and humor because you've got like your eyes yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, you bring a good gift, Stephanie. <laughs> I'm always good. Life is always good. Yeah, I'm just, you know, life is always good. Yeah, yeah, I'm alive. <laughs> gift do you bring to your name? Both. You bring a lot of gifts to that name. Yeah, yeah. Miigwech. <laughs> Couple of minutes. <laughs> Couple of minutes. Wrapping it up, wrapping it up. Another minute, another minute. All right, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. All right. All right. When I say me, you say Gwetch. Me, me, me. Oh, yes, I felt the power of those words right from the heart. So, my beautiful friends, um, the power of the name, right? So, we do that activity. And that is actually a two-eyed seeing activity. We honor our names. If you have your spirit name, you have your story that goes with that. But not only that, whatever name or how you self-identify, we honor that. So that's why we do that. That's an example of two-eyed seeing, where we take only the best from the Western world of strategies and approaches and science. And then we take the teachings of our people in a good way, though, and we apply them. You know, a lot of our kids, right? You know, a lot of our kids need to know the power of their names. And not only that, in a world of billions and billions of people, our kids also need to know that there's no one else like them. I don't care if you're a twin or not. You're like, oh, yes, I got a twin, we're just the same. No, they're not. Um, but there's no one else like you. Out of this entire universe, right? If I could, you know, no matter where I go, if I could travel, you know, in time, you know, and all of a sudden, like, you know, be a part of the Star Wars galaxy, 
I'm never going to find anybody like you. Never. Even if you're a twin, my friend, okay? Even if you share the same genetic coding, I'm still not going to find anybody like you. In millions of people, there's only you. And how magical is that? There's only you, right? And creation put you here. Now, two-eyed seeing also involves humor. Holy jeez. We had our grandmothers at the bar last night laughing away. <laughs> They're never going to live this down. <laughs> But humor, right? So think about it, two-eyed seeing. A lot of our creation stories, right? A lot of our legends, which are not myths, they're true. They're true. But what they are, my beautiful friends, is this, right? We have stories about the gifts of humor. Chabop, eh, laughter. We have stories about how those gifts came to our people. Now, wouldn't that be amazing? To be able to say to our kids, hey, here's our story about how humor came to be. But I'm also going to give you the science behind it. That's two-eyed seeing. So every time we laugh, right, here are things that happen short term. You know, we think about our schools. And what do we do? We're like, oh, no laughter in schools. No smiling. <sighs> right? But humor does these things, right? Short term. It actually stimulates our organs, right? It does. Not only that, it relieves stress. The sec, like the third thing is short term, it soothes tension. When we laugh together, I tell you, I know exactly where my people are. I could be at Pearson Airport in Terminal 3. And I know in Terminal 1, there's Nishnabek, Meshkigawik, or Haudenosaunee there. <laughs> Metis and Inuit by the laughter, the laughter, or humor. But the, oh, I just lost that patin, that, uh, yeah. So what is long-term? Humor, chabop, eh. So I want you to stamp a foot, but not too hard, because I got a broken toe, for real. Um, yeah, for real, but I have a very high tolerance for cold, heat, and pain, so it doesn't really affect me. I just wrapped my own toe there. I'm like, oh, whatever, give me some tape there, and gone. Um, but, you know, we think about, like, you know, the, the whole thing, like, you know, about humor. So now we're going to find out. I'm going to do a human poll, and you're going to use your, your foot or else your feet. But if you have specific needs, then don't do the activity, okay? I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to stamp your foot. Do you know... Somebody, somebody, either living or in the spirit world, that is really funny. All right. Second question. Now, using your other foot, okay, do you think you're funny? People are looking under the table there. I'm going out to dinner with this person tonight. <laughs> All right. We'll go back to my slide. So we have our gifts of humor. We have our creation stories and our teachings and our legends about it, which is the truth. It's Deb Wayman. It's not a myth. And we shouldn't be teaching them as myths. You know, anytime we say, oh, that's a myth. You know, that's like saying it's a lie. So we don't do that. But long term, what does humor do, right? Our people have survived, you know, all of these atrocities, you know, because you know what? Why? Because inside of us, we have strength, resilience, and we have kindness. A lot of our communities are plagued with lateral violence, eh? Oh, yes. Oh, jeez. The eye rolling, this, that, lateral violence. But I'll be honest with you folks, you know, I think that, you know, right down to our spirits and our hearts and our minds, that we were also born with lateral kindness. That no matter where we've come from, it's in here. Lateral kindness is in here and in here and in here. 
Now, a lot of people, you know, might, you might wonder, or else maybe you don't. You're probably just thinking, oh, I don't know, man. I saw this lady there, and she was talking up a storm. And, but I really am quite a happy person. You know, and do I get sad and angry at times too? Yes, I worked in education. I had my times of being sad and happy. But let me tell you something that for me, you know, is that I get up every morning and I'm thankful, you know, and I don't smudge first thing in the morning all the time. And I know that's something I got to work on. But I get up happy because I always think, oh my goodness, I get another day. You know, I get another day. And I always think, you know, I think about all those that came before me. And I said, I don't have, I don't, not wasting my time on being sad or angry. I don't have time for that. I got work to do. I don't have time to be, do that. I could spend all day being sad and have a list of everything that has happened, you know, in my lifetime, you know, to myself. Because the story of our people that is negative, those things that happen to our people happen to me. But I get up every day knowing that really that everybody who came before me paid the price so that i could be here today and i know that i know it every day so long term right humor what does it do right so again the science behind it right of course improves our immune systems right that's right it does improves the immune systems it relieves pain and in fact in a lot of healthcare settings now they're using things like going for walks and laughter as a way to manage pain. It's like, holy geez, you should have checked in with us 150 years ago. We would have told you that. Jeez. But not only that, right? It also increases our feelings of personal satisfaction and it improves our moods. So laughter goes a long way and I've really learned how to embrace that. But there's also land. There are two things, right, that we learn in schools and two ways that are just as valuable. There is A, learning about the land through resources, through books, videos, through Twitter, right? Everybody go check out some notorious Cree James Jones, you know, or else like whoever beautiful folks we got on there. There's learning about land from resources that are indigenous authentic or indigenous authenticated, right? Books, kits, videos, music, everything. That's again, learning about the land. Then there's B, learning from the land, where we actually walk outside the door. We don't need a big field trip, you know, and a bunch of permission forms signed and running around to get them signed. All we need to do is look outside, right? Like right now, I remember, you know, Merlissant's Bidiba, you know, a number of years ago, you know, she shared this beautiful teaching and she would talk about fog and I was like really not quite there yet in my own learning. And I remember Merlissant's beady boss saying, talking about fog. And she would say, because like I'd get all annoyed. Chase, that's fog I can't even see when I'm getting to work, trying to drive there. And then she really stopped me, you know, and, and in a good way though, talked about fog and said, what a gift. You're actually getting to see the breath of Mother Earth. You're getting to see her breath. And it stopped me. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know? I thought, yeah, like, you know, what has happened, you know, to me in my own journey that I would forget that joy? And that's where I stopped. And I said, I have to really, again, reposition myself. Now, listen, I got to tell you, we got gifts. So this is about learning about the land, okay? So this is the A. These are gifts we've given to the world, the Schnabek. Anytime someone drinks Dr. Pepper, you should say, put that two bucks here. All right. The idea for, again, for Dr. Pepper came from Nishnabek. Haudenosaunee, you know what? When the U.S. Constitution actually works, okay, when it actually works, you know what? The U.S. Constitution, we know, is actually based upon the great law of peace because that is how brilliant that Haudenosaunee are and continue to be, right? The great law of peace, the three sisters, the science behind it, you know, knowing that that beautiful stalk of corn was going to be where all of the beautiful leaves, you know, all the beautiful leaves, you know, of the beans could climb up the stalk and prosper. 
that the squash would coat around the circle and make sure that the soil was suitable, right? Suitable so that everything could thrive. That's science and that's two-eyed seeing. We did it because we knew and continue to know our lands. Mushkegwix, you know, again, doing my own archival research, so many gifts you gave to the world. Look at that left one. That left column is really about learning about the land. But on the right column is again, that left eye. You know, when I was doing my research, it was like, you know what? You know, our Meshkigwik people, like in your own beautiful teachings and about, you know, walking out your children. When I learned about that, I nearly cried because I thought, how beautiful would that be? You know, to learn about that, then have our children walk out of their daycares, a celebration, you know, out of daycare where they walk out and, you know, the staff and parents are there to celebrate those first steps. Not only that, you know, I take a look at our Inuit and our Metis relations. If you were sporting some sunglasses yesterday, let's thank our Inuit relations because they were the first ones to actually create them. And again, this is again, two-eyed seeing, learning, okay, about the land and gifts from the land, but also learning from it, going to those spaces. Our Metis relations, the York boat and other things as well. You know, the York boat that could carry tons and float through anything, right? Learned with our people in a good way. So that again, the, all of these gifts that we have. So, you know, we've got our beautiful Turtle Island, our relations, we all have our own story, story about it. Maybe it's about that little muskrat that made that, you know, that sacrifice for Nishnabe. Maybe it's about, you know, Sky Woman and that beautiful story about, again, Turtle Island. But let me tell you, this is about learning about the land because these are some of the gifts that our people gave to the world. You know, we gave these things, you know, and people continue to benefit from today and don't even know they benefit from it. Our Arctic relations, Inuit, Yupak, Yupik, what they gave to the world was this, snowshoes, trousers, yeah. They gave pants to the world, but meanwhile, other societies and worlds will get credit for it. We look at our relations in California there, you know, and what did they give to the world? They gave hair conditioners. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. you should see this without, <laughs> without air conditioning. But we take a look like all the way through our people, right? So this is about learning about the land and the gifts, then being out on the land or else interacting with those objects is an example of learning from it, right? Two-eyed seeing. The other thing is, right, again, the other nations on Turtle Island, and this is by geographical area, gave so many gifts to the world. And now you're going to give a gift to the, again, to the Toronto Maple Leafs, a gift they never had. Oh, yes, you're going to do it. Now, jeez, oh, I'm going to just say that uh, that's because of my broken toe and not by the big lunch I had there. I just about fell over. Um, <laughs> So what you're going to do is, folks, I want you to imagine that you have a hockey stick, okay? Pretend you have a hockey stick. And if you've never played hockey before, you fake it like you know it, okay? Just sit there. You got your hockey stick. Let me see your hockey stick. Oh, look at these nokmises here. They're like, listen, you put me in as captain of the Leafs and we're going to the cup. <laughs> All right. So I want you to imagine you got your hockey stick here. Okay, let me see it. Oh, I know you got your hockey stick. I want you to get ready. I'm going to count it down. And we are now in the finals. We are in, again, we're fighting for the Stanley Cup. And you are, again, you're racing towards the goal line. Three, two, one, take your shot. I'm just going to bathe in all of the gloriousness. Because if you can imagine, right, folks, you know, if we had hired you, you know, of course, as the center or else, you know, as like an offense for the Toronto Maple Leafs, we would be in the finals right away. OK, so let me just tell you. But let me also just say that hockey, the sport of hockey comes from our people. I'm not talking lacrosse. I'm talking hockey. And it comes actually from Algonquin women. 
Yeah, the actual sport, like the winter sport, right? So we have the creators game lacrosse, but so many things came from our people. And still, you know, people get to benefit from all of the gifts that we harnessed from land and with her, right? So many of those things. And I take a look at that right now, my friends, and there's many things that I could not live without except for these things, okay? Now, I love our relations in the plateau, okay? I really do, all right? But I'm a girl from the 80s, and everything that I wore was fringed clothing, all right? I had fringe going out to here. I had hair that was out to here. I even remember the name of my hairspray, Joyco Ice. <laughs> you that are laughing out there, you know it because you used it too. <laughs> but the thing is, right, is that we, the, all of these gifts, everybody benefits. All Canadian citizens benefit, right? All all uh, turtle island benefits because of our understanding of land and we have to figure out how did we you know how do we disconnect from that but let's bring it back let's not stay in the space of oh oh i can't yeah oh geez not today oh that colonialism oh geez it's hurting me today yeah because we know it hurts i'm right here folks don't worry i'm okay <laughs> yeah just having trouble getting up. <laughs> but, you know, it's so simple sometimes just to like honor our name and to really honor the gifts that we bring because this is all about gifts. The gifts of our people, the gifts of your people. You know, we do it in the spirit of humor and in the spirit of kindness. We do it from a space that is about these things. It's about language and culture on that left side. And it's about picking only those things, only those things from the Western world that are gonna benefit our people. Yeah, only those things. Everything else we can leave behind. Yep, that we can leave behind. So my friends, I am actually going to um, wrap this up, but we're gonna do it in a good way, okay? We're gonna do it in a good way. So what I want you to do, all right, my friends, is this. You're going to take two hands, all right? Two arms, two hands, but only, okay? But only if you're able to. So if you're like, listen, I'm sore today, okay? Or else I was at the bingo last night. And then that's okay. But I want you to take both hands and I want you to make two fists. All right. Go like that. Okay, we're going to go like that. We're going to go real hard like we're part of a club. All right. Now, here are the words that go with that. So keep doing that, okay? Here are the words that go with that. And you've heard them before. I want you to shake it. And I want you to say, Op je nishin. Op je nishin. Now put your hands down because what you said nishin, is really like, you know what? Yeah, that's really good. It's really good, right? It's really good. So my beautiful friends, I just want to thank you. And I want to thank those grandmothers that are here and those, you know, that identify as they, those that come from our two spirited communities that we really do need to really start, you know, doing a lot of work in that area. We need to really start looking at our own biases because our kids in school, right? You know, they self-identify in many ways, right? Self-identify, we gotta support them in their journey. And all I know folks is that I'm really thankful because for this next year, I have this opportunity to be back in my community, to be back in Zgamuk, right? To be called home. And I'm gonna encourage you, call other people home. Don't be afraid to do that. So, the last thing, folks, I'm going to have you do, two fists in the air, two fists in the air. And you're going to say these words, okay? You're going to look around. First of all, you're going to say, I rock. You're going to look at another table, two fists in the air. You rock. Now, you're going to take your hands, you're going to put them up to the sky, both of them, and you're going to say, our children rock. 
And with that, I say to you, gorgeous folks, miigwech. Um, that was such an amazing, energetic uh, presentation. A lot of really good information. Really got us going, so let's get another round of applause. So uh, there is uh, a little bit of time for some questions. So if there are just a few questions from the floor, we are. she said we have a little bit more time. So I'm uh, just checking in. We've got six minutes. So if there's any questions, you can make your way up to one of the four uh, microphones. Yep. And if anybody doesn't know, that wonderful, again, Kwe there, Gail Payette, is the principal over at Lakeview School in Chiging, where I started. <laughs> where I started teaching 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to say miigwech. Yeah, miigwech, Gail. Yeah, yeah, miigwech. <laughs> and that, that's my cousin over there. He's a Debosque. But for real. He's for real, my cousin. Okay? I just want you to know that. Yeah. <laughs> It's not just old oh, cousin. He's, he's my real cousin. Yeah. All right, folks. So I will. I'm I'm open to taking a couple questions, but I also know it's the end of the day. Everybody wants to figure out if their flight's leaving or not. I got some news for you. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'll take a couple questions, and if not, that's okay too. We got draws, and it's the end of the day. Me Gwetch. All right, let's have another round of applause. Timmy Gwetch from uh, Chiefs of Ontario Education Sector. Uh, great job, Tim. It's really great to see you. Ooh, I also have this gift for you. Where are you going? Ah, yeah, yeah. Timmy Gwetch. All right, so Timmy Gwetch. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Thanks. Uh, such inspiration. It's really good to see you. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Such a good reminder, too. When you get called home, you, you know what I mean? Uh, come home, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's about bringing what we know and our experiences and our knowledge back to support our community. So really good. Um, awesome, everybody. So that brings us to the end of our gathering. Let's have a round of applause for everybody. Uh, we made it through. Um, and uh, just really thinking about everybody who's traveling here, thinking about everybody who will be traveling shortly. Uh, we had such an amazing presentations all throughout the whole gathering. I'm going to try and summarize some of the stuff that we did go through. So um, but one of the things I really like to acknowledge is the accessibility that was provided for um, Marsha Ireland. So who was able to do our Oneida Sign Language? So that was really great. So we were able to take some of this. And I remember a couple of things too. So, uh, you know, I remember that, like the we're clan and stuff like that. Yeah. So really great. I think that's really important. I really liked highlighting that. So other presentations um, included the uh, Evolution of Indigenous Languages Act, uh, there is a presentation on First Nations uh, language rights and education. There is presentations from the Chiefs of Ontario staff about the language committee, um, the leadership committee on languages. Uh, so we had like different panels as well as the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples implementation panel. So there was a lot of really great stuff. The breakout sessions, like all of our keynotes, I got to really acknowledge our keynotes. So we had Dr. Lorena Fontaine who talked about um, language rights, and she said uh, something along the lines of those language rights um, exist within our own laws, right? This language act, we do not draw our rights from this language act. They just affirm the existing rights that we have within our own laws. And I think that was really important. We had our other keynote doctor, uh, I mean, um, so yeah, that was Dr. Lorena Fontaine. Other keynote we had was uh, Patricia uh, Niguance, who she talked about different methodologies of teaching, and she also said language is sacred. Teaching language is sacred. Learning language is sacred. And that's such a really important reminder. So I really appreciated that. One of my mentors and teachers um, for coming. Um, also my cousin, Jesse Wente. I would like to say that that's my cousin. <laughs> um, he came and you know what? He had a real, lots of really interesting stuff to share. Narrative sovereignty. Talking about we are the authors of our own story. And it's about time that we take up the space to tell our own stories. I thought that was very important. And he's also looking to everybody here. You are the Jedis, right? So that's really cool because you are the educators. You are carving out these spaces in these colonial spaces to ensure that, you know, our, our students, our young people, our future generation um, has everything that they need to succeed. So uh, really great work from Jesse. And then th this morning we had Riley Yesno talking about uh, revolutionizing Canadian education. 
And then uh, recently we just had Dr. Um, Pamela Toulouse talking about two-eyed seeing, a really great uh, presentation. So we had, let's have a round of applause for our keynote speakers. They did a great job. Um, and also a reminder too, that all of these presentations, you can be found online. All right, so if anybody doesn't know, um, Angel is in the middle, she's going around. Uh, there's a new method that we're gonna be doing for door prizes. So we, now we have four door prizes in total. Um, so if you haven't, you're gonna be resubmitting your name. All right, so you're gonna have to write your name down, put it into the box, and we will be drawing names from this new box of names. So if you haven't got your name in there, too bad. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, your la this is the last chance as I'm doing some closing remarks. Um, but what about Mason, that piano player, that young man? That was awesome, eh? Oh man, he did such a great job. Oh, it was so great to see. Um, you know, we had Stephanie Ponguish, uh, Don Burnstick, so we had some really great comedy. Um, made me laugh, that guy. Holy cow, <laughs> he's, he's real funny. Make me blush too, you know? Sitting in the back all shy, you know? I don't laugh like that, you know? It's just, why you call me out like that, you know? It's just, Good stuff, but also important messages to our men in our community. So that's really important, those positive messaging as well. I was really great. Um, yeah, so we also had some, uh, and I think the, the intent of the gathering was that the first day and a half was to be focused on language revitalization. And then the second day and a half would be focused on education. So in the past second day and a half, we had um, presentations uh, from the Chiefs of Ontario staff on education transformation. So again, that is OTIFA. Does any remember, anybody remember what that uh, acronym stands for? Ontario Technical Table um, of um, something formal agreement. Anybody approach? Interim funding approach. Yes. Yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> all right, he's like, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> all right, good stuff. So yeah, and there was a really great presentation as well about the federal education agreement. So the different approaches that um, some of our organizations are taking um, to assert our own jurisdiction around education. I think that's really important because as it was mentioned yesterday, that we never, never gave up the sovereignty to govern ourselves. You know, inherently that is our right. You know, I think we have to maintain that right, and it's something we always have to fight for. I think one of the presentations talked about is that there's not just one end goal. We don't just arrive at a destination and say our work is done. Our work is always constantly going to be happening. It's going to be people like you that are always going to be carving out those spaces and making sure those supports are there. Um, so yeah, we had our First Nations lifelong learning table, we had presentations on post secondary education, so it was really great. Um, and it was such an honor to be able to, um, to be here. Um, so just once again, uh, a big shout out to the Red Bear singers for opening us up shortly they're going to be closing us up as well so let's give them an acknowledgement. Uh, you sound very beautiful. Um, and uh, an acknowledgement to Chiefs of Ontario staff as well. So all of the organizers, good job for bringing us here, hosting this great forum. Um, so our IT team in the back, you know, really a great job. Uh, to all of our participants, that's yourself, all of our online participants as well. Um, to our vendors, you know, our cooks, because the food was really good. Um, but not, last but not least, I want to put an acknowledgement out there to all of our uh, Nishna Bemjik. So all of our speakers out there, um, I want to acknowledge you and honor you and, and have this moment for you to be recognized, all of our learners as well. So let's give them all a round of applause. Um, Chimmy Gwetch for the work, your kindness, uh, your patience, your support, and all the work that you do for, your, for, your, uh, for our communities. Um, so, and another thing that I wanted to say for uh, all of our learners out there as well, um, there is something that I heard that um, Ontario Regional Chief said. Gego Wika, um, I think it was Anishitan um, and so that is never give up, right? So as a learner, never give up, right? So remember that. And don't forget, is a sema too, right? We always have that tobacco and we can always offer that tobacco when we need uh, for some support. Okay, so once again, those questions that were posted online, uh, we will be um, having answers to that and that will be found through this QR code. So you can check out all the presentations there as well. Um, but yeah, as we before we formally close, we're going to be going over to our youth and our elders. So I'm going to invite Donna up. So who's going to be our elder? Let's give Donna a round of applause as well. And then uh, I'm going to be calling up um, there. We're going to have a Zoom. Uh, one of our youth had to leave to catch a flight. 
that is winter dawn. Um, so she will be joining us. She's at the airport, you know, real dedicated, like, I'll get it. I'll get my reflection in. Whatever it takes, right? Awesome. So if we can have Dawn, um, Winter Dawn queued up um, for her to be able to give her reflection. And then we'll be moving over to Donna uh, to providing some uh, final reflections as well. And then we will close with uh, the Red Bear Singers. So uh, whenever you are ready, uh, looking back to the IT team, uh, we're going to be pulling up uh, Winter. Winter Dawn. Now how, so it looks like uh, we have Winter on the screen. So just a, uh, just a small introduction for Winter, for those who, Winter Dawn, for those who don't know. Uh, Winter Dawn is a proud member of uh, Wajishko Nigam in Treaty 3 territory, where she is an advocate for the inclusion of youth voices in her region. So after completing her degree in international relations and economics in 2019, uh, Winter Dawn returned home to her traditional territory to work in areas of policy development and governance. Um, Winter Dawn brings her professional and uh, life experiences as well as her passion, self-determined uh, and youth-driven future to all of her work. So everybody, let's give a, a, work, a welcome to Winter Dawn and uh, I will pass it over to you, Winter Dawn, uh, for your remarks. Hello, everybody. Bonjour. I apologize for the background noise, but I am at the airport now. To begin, I'd like to give a shout out to the Chiefs of Ontario Education Director, Julia Candlish, as well as colleague Alavik. Terry Pula and Angel Miracle for assisting us this week, as well as the invitation to the Youth Council because it's so important to have youth voices in these spaces. Uh, to start, I'd like to introduce myself in my name. Uh, so I'm from Wajishpunigan Nation in Treaty 3 territory, so I've got a bit of a journey back home. Um, but when I was first selected as a representative on Treaty 3's Youth Council, one of the top priorities for our youth council was to create opportunities for youth to be around the language and strengthen the connections to the communities and culture. And that's always been a priority because I grew up removed from each of these elements. My mom was adopted in the 60s group and raised in an English German household, which meant that the languages in my house or in my home were English and German. And that's what I grew up learning. Anishinaabemowin wasn't even a thought. And for my father, he's a residential school survivor who wasn't able to pass on the language. And my stepfather, a Métis man from Manitoba, but was only able to speak French and English due to the long-standing family shame that came from having the Cree ancestry. So I spoke three languages, but none of them were my own. And I remember being in grade five and having this realization that I could speak fluently in French and English but having so much sadness because there was a language that I knew was my own and that I was supposed to be able to speak, but couldn't even begin to understand. And I felt like I was a fraud because how could I possibly say that I'm an Anishinaabe person if I couldn't even speak my own language? And that's what I held on to. And that's the spark that led me to start learning the language. And so that year I transferred schools to take language courses instead of French. And I'm thankful that was a possibility but for how many youth is that not possible? How many youth don't have caregivers give them the option to switch schools to be able to take language? While, um, while we wait for her to get queued up, um, she was just getting into it too, real deadly and everything. Oh uh, yeah, Winter Dawn is a great person, does a lot of advocacy, a lot of work um, you know, with the Youth Council as well and with for her region. Hey, get Bips coffee, all right. So you, I'm back. You're back, all right. Where did on. I leave off? Um, where did so. we miss her? There you go, not able to transfer uh, for school. Okay, so yes. So how many youth don't have the option to be able to switch to their schools? Um, and being in a place where you have to make new friends and struggling with that. But language is who we are. 
And I never really understood that until I began to speak and think in the language. And I finally felt what it was to care about the land because I could see the connections between everything in the world. And I could feel how different elements in the world interacted with each other. And I remember when I was selected, the, the elder present said to speak from your heart. And up until then, I'd never really understood what it was to speak from the heart until I began to regain the knowledge and experience the shift in my worldview that came from being able to speak the language. And I'm in awe of the presentations that we've heard over the last few days and inspired to take the lessons that I've learned, the ideas, and go back to my territory and bring that knowledge to the youth and those that support us. Language is who we are and it's our connection to our ancestors and that's such a gift. There isn't one specific piece that I want to highlight and I think Quinn did a really good job going over the summary, but I feel as though there's so much that I've learned and been inspired by. So I leave everyone with this. Our strength as Indigenous peoples comes from our authenticity and who we are as peoples. Reconnection heals us and helps us to find our identity. Your community is behind you and your ancestors have guided you to where you are today. And we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and our ancestors. And we get to leap from their shoulders and go a little bit further than they could. And that bit that we move the mark, that's progress and that's healing. So miigwech everybody for listening and I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, to provide my reflection this afternoon. Uh, Chimmy Gwetch, uh, Winter Dawn, for those uh, really uh, thoughtful remarks. And it was really great to see you and hope you have a safe travels back home. Okay, um, so Chimmy Gwetch, uh, from our youth, that was our youth reflection. And then we will be moving on to Donna for our elders reflection and uh, part of our closing as well. Donna? And I always like to mention that, that I'm from Kaboni and I like, especially like it um, for this meeting because, you know, we have the group from Zomik Nang that presented today, uh, the other day and uh, just to be here at the same forum with them. And of course, our, our cousin over there, Henry, um, you know, that, that was good to have you here too. He's from Kaboni and, uh, you know, it's, there's something about, uh, you know, going back to your roots and then when you have people that uh, you grew up with, uh, Hazel, you know, Hazel and Marcel, Loretta, you know, we're all from Kaboni. It's, it's kind of neat to, to be here with all of you. So I just wanted to uh, make that re um, um, just to bring that to to uh, forward, but as, as personal reflection, I also um, have been around for for a while now, and um, you know it's so good to uh, see our people. You know, Quinn, uh, MC. You know, you can't uh, nobody better than uh, Quinn to do be our MC. You know, and our, our presenters that uh, you know, Kenan Nishnabek. You know, Patricia Nigwans. Uh, you know, Jane, Jane, Jesse Wente, and even our own, you know, Angel and uh, Johanna that uh, did the presentations, Julie Kanlish and uh, Loretta, you know, the presentations that were done by our staff. It's, you know, it's so good and it's, we're doing it, you know, we're doing it ourselves for ourselves. And it's, that's, um, there's, um, that's just uh, makes it so much uh, better for our kids, for, kids that are coming, you know, because, uh, you know, this is all for them. So I want to uh, just bring that to to us to reflect on as we um, head home. And, uh, you know, and I seen two ladies here, this is the way I just met, um, um, Alice and, uh, um, is it Rose? Rose, yes, Alice and Rose, and they're from Kaboni. <laughs> so it does. So it's, it's just been pretty interesting. <laughs> and they're, resi <laughs> they're residential school survivors. So, you know, it's, it's, it was so good, so good. So with that, I just, uh, I'll, I'll bring the meeting to a close and I'll take the time to uh, thank our creator and thank our um, ancestors, our grandmothers, our grandfathers for uh, coming to sit with us and to um, be a part of our three days that we were here in, uh, in Toronto to um to um talk about education Mr. how the bench gain can so can you go to the bench man what's the name of the bench man 
Köszönöm, Mananek, Kokmisanek, Énak, Quinn Mananek, mi Gizsitáink, Mindes Géna, Csinepszkabiát, Géna, Kabincsabát, Géna, Gizsitá, Géna, Gibinad, Magincsenda. Köszönöm, hogy nem vagyok, 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 Will send them Shkinovich, Nim Nadgoshin Gabin Chabot, Midash Migwach Chikidin. Migwach, 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 Migwach. Naha. Um, so at this time, Chimigwech uh, Donner for those words, um, for closing us up formally as well. And uh, the last little bit that we have to do here is we are going to be uh, calling upon our Red Bear singers as well. So, uh, Oh, yeah, the draw first or afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, got to get the draw in, you know. <laughs> All right, okay. Oh, it's not like we got tickets this time. Okay, yeah, yeah, put the new names. Okay, yeah, does everybody have one? Yeah. Too bad. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so we got a last one that we're going to be putting in there. So once again, everybody, I uh, really appreciate um, everybody for, uh, and to the Chiefs of Ontario, the ac uh, education sector, for asking me to be the MC. I really appreciate it. Um, it's good to be up here, uh, you know, being, uh, attending these things uh, as a youth representative once with the Open YPC, and now to be up here to help to host and share the space. I really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, it's really good. I, I really hope everybody has safe travels home to back to wherever they're traveling. And um, if you don't need to travel, um, if you can stay, you know, just be safe. You know, home gums sick. That's all I gotta say. So, okay, so we'll move over to the draw. So, do I'm picking it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> all right, all right, okay. So, we got four of them. I'm not too sure what they are, but uh, a couple of draws. Anybody wanna donate anything else? Yeah, just like a powwow. Any 20 bucks? Any donators? Hey. Okay, so the first name that we have here is Debbie Mayer. Debbie Mayer. All right. Kikanage. Yeah, yeah. All right. And so she will pick the next uh, name. So Debbie will also pick the next name. Big responsibility. Uh, all right. So. All right. Courtney Easton. Oh, Aja. Aja Giwet. Yeah. Aja Giwet. Giwet. Yeah. Audrey Fisher. Audrey Fisher all the way over in the back over there. All right. Woo. Okay. You gonna run over there and get her to get the pick a name? All right. Uh, Webton. 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 Uh, real fast. <laughs> All right, Audrey, pick the next name. You're going to shout it out back there? Miles Turner. Miles Turner. All right, over there in the back as well. All right, congratulations. Look at that. That's three of our four door prizes that we have here. So Miles is going to pick the last one. And what is the name? Connie Anderson. All right, Kikanage. Guy Wamasi, I don't see no. Oh yeah, she's back there. Okay, all right. Congratulations, Connie. Uh, great job. So uh, now at this time, we'll be calling upon the Red Bear Singers to close us off with a song. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Woman of the West. I'm also known as Lori Oki Mawenu. I'm from Atawapiskat First Nations. And I was an educator for over 15 years and now I currently work with Toronto Council Fire as a resolution health support um, wellness navigator. And so after working for a number of years with small children, and you know, really forcing the language, and I'm still learning myself. But now I currently work with residential school survivors and day school survivors and 60 scoop survivors. 
And there are many similarities in terms of revitalizing our language and them um, bringing out their inner child in a lot of the things that we do. So today I'm just gonna get everybody to introduce themselves and that's part of our learning. So don't push me off the stage here, everybody. <laughs> I'm getting close to the stairs. Um, but what I can say is through the work we've been doing together, we've been revitalizing our language, our culture, our traditional ways. We don't all come from the same areas, but we've learned to sing. And you, you should have heard of us when we first started. Woo, you would, we would never be here. And we would never be on this stage. For most of us, we'd be very shy. Some of us would be very shy to do this. So we've come a long way in the past five or six years together. And I think we're doing pretty well. So to introduce their, themselves, and it's like I said, most of these ladies here, except I have to say, our youth on the end, Danny Mikawans, she holds a lot of gifts and her gifts is song and ceremony. And we have her here for a purpose to teach us. <laughs> and we're so happy that we have her. Um, she teaches us a lot and she's a, definitely a gift to us. And we're keeping her, <laughs> we're keeping her. Her voice is loud. She brings the energy. And I think these ladies uh, bring out their inner child through her, her medicine. So we'll, we'll pass the mic on. Everybody can introduce themselves in the language or English, whatever they want. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Geraldine Bernice Hokimawalini. I'm from Moosney, Ontario. I'm a residential survivor from Fort George, Quebec. My name is uh, Christine Alice uh, Shawana Lewis or the Wadron River. I'm using Christine Shawana, my married name. I'm from Kabwani, residential school survivor. I'm Rose Anderson from Wekwemekong, and my ma married name is Anderson, and maiden name of Schwanemann, and a uh, school survivor from Spanish Ontario, Ojibwe, Miwich. Wajie, Susan Hunter, and Dishna Kasson, Fiwana Gokhndoshchin, Shagotsmaga, Toronto, and Dishikan. Um, I've only been with the Red Bear Singers for about a year and a half, and um, but I started out in karaoke. Be <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm um, Sigully, everyone. Um, I'm Patricia Schuyler. I'm from Oneida. I'm from the Bear Clan, and I am intergenerational and a school survivor myself. And I've been in Toronto since '97. And uh, so Council Fire has been a big part of my uh, reconnecting to culture as well. And I enjoy and really love singing with the ladies and I hope you guys enjoyed our singing as well. Honey, I'm from Soggy, but mostly from Cape Croker. <laughs> <laughs> I've been with the Red Bear Singers for about a year. And I really enjoy myself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clara, Clara Ludet. I am from Moose Factory, a survivor of two residential schools, Fort George, Quebec, and Fort Albany. I have 14 grandchildren and two great grandchildren. And thank you for having us here. Miigwech. Watch, everyone. My name is Anna Croxon. I'm an Afro-Indigenous woman from the East Coast. Um, I'm from the Mi'kmaq and Cherokee tribe. And um, I'm happy to be here. And I'm really glad that uh, I found Council Fire and uh, able to do a lot of my healing through this drum and singing with this uh, wonderful group of people. And thanks for having us. Uh, uh, good afternoon, my name is Winina Phipps Walker. I'm from um, Lac Sewell, tre uh, Treaty 3. Um, I got, uh, I was, a, I'm a 60 scoop survivor. I'm intergenerational, 
My mother was uh, at Pelican um, Residential School. Um, she had like 15 kids. Um, I'm a mother of four children and six grandchildren, and I'm just happy to be here. And I've been with the Bear, um, Red Bear Singers for about a year and a half, I think. And I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm still, I still have a lot to learn. Trust me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Ani makare makwakwe and Dishnikaz, Toronto, Wakwamakong, Chiging and Dojnaba, Megazeo do Demnishnabe Quaindao. Hi everyone, my given name is Danielle Meek Wants. My spirit name is Black Bear Woman Who Runs in the Sky. I live in Toronto. My family comes from Chiging and Wakwamakong on Manitoulin Islands. Um, I'm Eagle Clan. And yeah, I'm really grateful to sing with these ladies and having the opportunity. I work at Toronto Council Fire as the um, healing wellness worker and um, all the good work and the healing we do together and we meet once a week to sing and just watching everyone like you guys get better and better each time with every song we learn and you know it's really beautiful experience and i'm so grateful to have each and every one of you in my life so get you me